Welcome everybody. First public hearing, the Environment Committee, 2023, Monday, January 30th, 2023. Um, we will be on uh, in person and on uh, Zoom. It'll be a hybrid meeting. And uh, any comments from any members? Um, Representative? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but first of all, apologies over the weekend. Um, ITS had some um, server maintenance to do, so it might have been a little difficult on Saturday to get your electronic testimony in, but I'm I'm glad that you were at least doing it over the weekend so we can have a, an ability to read it before you came in. And that was what I was going to suggest is the earlier you get it in, the more likely uh, it'll get read before the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All righty. Uh, seeing no other comments, you're all good. Uh, first person I see in the room would be uh, I mean, uh, Representative Haynes. Welcome, and you know, not that you need to know, but just for everyone's purposes, I believe three minute testimony time held by the clerk and uh, proceed at your leisure. Good morning. Thank you um, to the chairs and vice chairs and ranking members of the Environment Committee and all the esteemed members that are here today. My name is Irene Haynes. I'm state representative from the 34th district, which is East Haddam, East Hampton, a little bit of Colchester. And I spend a lot of time on the water here in Connecticut. And these two gentlemen to my right and left are here to, um, if I you know, ask your permission to yield my time, but they are the original um, uh, people that came to me back in 2018 to talk to me about this balloon problem we have in the state of Connecticut. Um, helium filled balloons, lighter than air balloons are um, left to, you know, memorialize something or celebrate something, but unfortunately they come down and cause havoc down here on the on the shoreline for our birds, for our animals, and also for people and infrastructure. So I'd like to yield my time if that's okay with you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Mike Corcoran. I'm a uh, licensed captain with the Coast Guard. And um, I'm here to support this bill. Um, it's been on, it's been something that's been an issue with me for a long, long, long time. <clears throat> I do a lot of um, delivery work for uh, yachts up and down the coast. And I also spend a lot of time on Long Island Sound fishing, you know, recreationally. Um, and it's, it's a common occurrence to find balloons floating on the surface of the water up and down the coast. I've seen them hundreds of miles offshore and a lot in Long Island Sound. Last, well, two years ago, I uh, I picked up over 600 balloons in Long Island Sound alone. Obviously, when I'm on a yacht, I'm not going to stop to pick them up. But when I'm on my own boat, I do. Um, so it's it's an issue. Obviously, there's a lot of potential harm to wildlife. I'm not going to get into that because I'm sure other people will speak to that later on. But what I would like to see is this, first of all, this, this pass. But also, I'd like to see some language added to this bill that, um, well, to let you know, I mean, when I was here four years ago, I came in here with a front page article from the Hartford Current showing a, a massive balloon release for, it was a, a youngster that um, that died and it was a um, event to, you know, celebrate his life. And they released a whole bunch of balloons. And at that time, back four years ago, it was against the law to release 10 or more balloons in a 24 hour period. So obviously it was a law that was in place. Nothing was done then. And my point is that if we pass this law for no releases, the public needs to know about it somehow. And I think that if we put something marking on the balloon itself or attached to its ribbon somehow to let people know that it's, you know, if you let this thing go, you're you're potentially going to get a fine. So it might help reduce the fact that people let them go. People need to be aware. Also, um, there are some retailers in the state of Connecticut 
that when they sew balloons, they have a, a weight tied to the end of the um, string or ribbon, which, you know, should you accidentally let it, let the thing go, it won't float away. Because when they do go up, they come down. They don't go to heaven. They come back down to earth somewhere. So um, I think that should be mandatory that if you're going to sell balloons that, that can float away, they need to be weighted down. And if they remove that weight, then, you know, there's an infraction. Thank you. No problem. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Jeff Allison. Um, I am also trying to uh, strengthen uh, the bill that's already been here. Um, I will just read what uh, quickly through what I, I like to say. Today, Connecticut law prohibits knowingly releasing, organizing the release of, or intentionally causing the release of 10 or more helium or other lighter than air gas balloons into the air over a 24 hour period. The law applies to any person, nonprofit organization, firm or corporation in the state and its political subdivisions. A violation is an infraction subject to a $35 fine complying with other applicable uh, fees. The total penalty, penalty is only $75. The law passed during the 1990 legislative session and took effect October 1st that year. Public hearing testimony and chamber debates for HB 5226, which became law, focused primarily on the environmental effects of releasing balloons, particularly the threat to marine wildlife and birds from ingesting balloon material. We would like to strengthen this law that's here today by making Connecticut a no-release state with House Bill 6481. There's been a lot of environmental concerns over metal nylon balloons. Those uh, nylon balloons can conduct electricity on its surface, and these balloons, when released into the environment, can become entangled in power lines, causing power outages and fires. Mammals and marine life have also been known to ingest them, and the nylon strings that are attached to these balloons can create a serious entanglement hazard to wildlife. The release of latex balloons that descend on the land or sea can also cause serious problems, causing ingestion and or entanglement hazards to marine and land animals both. Both latex and metal balloons can travel hundreds of miles before they eventually land. They have a deadly effect on wildlife both on land and aquatic systems because animals confuse deflated balloons as food or nesting material or simply something to play with. For example, a bird will use a deflated balloon as a component for its nest. When the eggs hatch, the chicks can get tangled in the balloons and the strings attached to the balloon will lead to a slow and agonizing death. Marine animals also can become entangled or mistake them for food, ingesting them, and they too die a slow, painful death. This is happening on a wide scale every day. Every day we allow this to happen, countless amounts of wildlife die. The Balloon Council, TBC, is an organization of retailers, distributors, and manufacturers of balloons. On their website, on their website, they have what they call the Be Balloon Smart Pledge. This, and the pledge states, do not release any balloons into the air. They can become entangled in power lines. And they don't mention marine life, but they're worried about uh, the uh, metal balloons. Uh, could, could you please summarize? So, yes. Uh, uh, I'm often asked, how, how would you enforce this bill? Some states have attached the tag on a string of each balloon stating that it's illegal to intentionally release them. Another way would be to use our school systems where students in most grades have environmental classes where they are taught what can harm our environment. The dangers of the intentional release of lighter than air balloons into the atmosphere would most certainly become part of that curriculum. How can we teach our students to protect the environment when the state of Connecticut allows us to release up to 10 balloons, knowing that each balloon release can potentially kill our wildlife? Any organized event that knowingly has a balloon release will be subjected to arrest with a fine. HB 6481 is basically an anti-littering bill. People don't litter on our highways because they know it's against the law and will be fined. And through environmental education, they know the negative effects it has on our environment. Our current litter laws will not allow any litter to be thrown out of cars 
I'm, just... I'm sorry, sir. Your, your time, we're, we're well past it. All right, thank you. It's <laughs> quite all right. Any questions from, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming in. And thank you, Representative, for being with your constituents up here. It's honorable. Uh, Captain, if I, I have a quick question for you, if you don't mind. Uh, and I appreciate you taking notice of the situation. And uh, labeling the balloons uh, and telling the consumer that, that do not release these, that that's part of what you're saying, if I'm clear. That's correct. Okay. Are you proposing any alternative to Mylar or just? Well, an alternative to my, I mean, if it was up to me, I would, I would ban balloons altogether. But seeing that they're being sold, it seems like an insurmountable feat right now. I'm looking for at least step one okay. that we can, you know, people out there think that if you let a balloon go, it goes up to heaven. They don't, yeah. uh, you know, and if we can educate them in any way that it's potentially harmful, uh, okay. it's a plus. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking. What are those things called? Those lanterns? Uh, you know, people like yeah, it. the uh, Oriental. Are you talking about those too? Anything that's lighter than air, yes. Okay. Uh, good. Good. And and you being on the on the water so often, I'm sure you see this just about more than anybody. So I do appreciate you taking the time to be here in person today and and give us your point of view, okay. sir. Anything else to add uh, as well, sir? Uh, no, I I just think that uh, we can uh, stop this by educating the public. It's just uh, all right. I appreciate you uh, being here and representative. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Representative Palm. Good morning. Thank you both for being here. Um, just very quickly, is it is it your opinion, both of you, that that we should eliminate them altogether? Is that what you're saying? Would I would like to see that? Yes. I would personally. Okay. And um, I think this is a great bill, but I so this next question is not meant to be contentious, but what what would you say to those of us who try to balance the interests of environmentalism with business? Because we will get push, pushback from businesses who say, this is what I sell, this is my livelihood. Um, if we were to eliminate them and reduce that limit to zero or to five, uh, what and, and perhaps Rep Haynes might want to well, take that one, what, what do you think we should say? Being a big business advocate myself, I absolutely agree with you 100%. And I think one of the things that I have seen is there there's sticks that are about you know 20 inches long or 30 inches long that you can attach a balloon to, and it doesn't have to be helium filled. It can just be air filled. And they can still put their balloons together. They can still make all kinds of different creative things with it, but you're not using helium. Therefore, the potential release of these balloons into the air and the trash that goes with it. So there are alternatives. There's also, I've seen alternative balloons that they actually literally dissolve. Um, so there, there are alternatives out there as a business. You know, we can ask them to uh, be environmentally conscious and come up with new ways and be inventive, but um, we can certainly make sure that there's higher fines and also, um, you know, some kind of piece of little card that just says, this is not to be released in the state of Connecticut. Hawaii, Bandit, Nantucket, and um, Martha's Vineyard have all banned the releasing of balloons. So I think we should take their lead. May Great, I, thank you all very I much. Quickly. That's it, Mr. Chair. I've been told Representative Chafee's on Zoom, the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you both for providing testimony today and for the good representative for yielding to you. Um, I'm in agreement with one gentleman. I, I think that we need to go farther. I, I would be in favor of a full ban. Um, you know, the, the problem is going to be enforcement. I, I think it's ridiculous right now that the law is written that it actually allows you to release these balloons. As a boater and a fisherman myself, I have seen these far offshore. You can't even see land anymore, yet you still see balloons floating in the water. So it, it is a real problem. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned with the way this is written without some level of enforcement. And I'm not asking for the balloon police to go out. I, I just don't really know how effective this will be, but it is a step in the right direction. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Can I, may I follow up on that? Even the balloon council, like I said, they are against release of these balloons the very people that make their living manufacturing balloons are for non-release. 
Uh, I believe representatives, no, I'm looking at the wrong screen. Anyone left on Zoom? Yeah. Any, uh, Representative Baumgartner? Or, followed by Rick Dodinitsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and Representative Haynes. Thank you so much for uh, testifying in support of this bill and I believe submitting a bill on your own uh, earlier this session uh, doing just uh, this, uh, banning uh, the release of balloons. And I um, also want to thank your uh, great constituents for coming out. Um, uh, like you, uh, also represent uh, communities in Eastern Connecticut, Groton and Stonington. Um, obviously, um, you know, our uh, Long Island Sound home to uh, so many marine uh, critters. Um, for example, I, I believe there are four uh, known species of turtle, sea turtle in uh, the Long Island Sound, and many of them eat uh, these balloons thinking they're jellyfish. And uh, obviously, you know, um, district also home to Mystic Aquarium, and um, they've taken many of those sea turtles and um, on completing autopsies have found uh, those um, uh, balloons in their um, in their bodies. So um, this is, I think, a very reasonable um, ban, I, as was mentioned. Um, you know, we could always go a step further, but I think um, this um, uh, really uh, ought to get bipartisan consensus and I appreciate you and, and your constituents taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Dubitsky, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you for coming in. Um, Representative Haynes, you uh, mentioned something about balloons dissolving. Um, would you be able to expound on that a little? Um, the only thing I know about them is that I have seen them in the, you know, in the four years that I've been fighting this bill for this bill, um, that there's a group, and I want to say it might be the Balloons Blow group, that actually have it on their website about dissolving balloon, balloons that are made out of material that dissolves when they hit the water. So whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, it dissolves, meaning, you know, it, it obviously doesn't become necessarily something that depending on how small it dissolves, if it if it if um, it's something that wouldn't necessarily be eaten or get caught or, or, or choke something. Um, but still, I mean, obviously banning would be the ideal, but I'm not looking to ban. I'm just looking to let's stop releasing it. Let's stop throwing trash in the air. Plain and simple. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, does one of your um, colleagues there have uh, any insight into these dissolving balloons? Um, hey, I've been on the website. Uh, I I think um, it would. What they're saying is it takes time if they dissolve. If they dissolve at all. So in that time, the uh, uh, the animals will could eat that, and not only that, but you'd also get a nylon string attached to it. So that nylon string can do just as much, if not more, damage than the balloon. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No problem. <clears throat> yes, Representative Cooley, please. I uh, just wanted to ask a question. Uh, in the construction of the bill, are weather balloons going to be exempted from this? Yes. Thank you. And the other questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Yep. Oh, sorry, Mary. Go ahead. <laughs> Didn't see you over there. Uh, just got here from the train, Mr. S Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for running the bill again. It's been a long-term goal of mine to close that 10 limit to zero but I couldn't get zero out of this committee before. And I'm glad you're being persistent. But I, my question is, there's also Mylar being used for um, gift bags for alcohol around Christmas time. And uh, what would you think about adding that prohibition to this bill? I think that's something we'd have to discuss, right? Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, they're metallic, they're shiny, and they're made out of the same material as the balloons. Oh. oh. Would that be better served on the bill for the plastic bag? It could go in the other bill, too, yeah. yes. Yeah. If you want to keep this separate, uh, clean, and put it on the other, and we could try to put it on the other bill. Yeah, I would put it on the other one. Okay, you'd prefer it on the other bill. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. No problem. I, I I believe we're having a small technical issue with people on Zoom and the is it the waiting list? 
when we try to promote them? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, when I when I allow them on when they're on Zoom to promote them, they need to accept that promotion or to move to the main room where they can speak. And that's the next speakers coming up. That's correct. I promote the next few, like two or three. Uh, if you're 20 or 30 on the list, you won't be promoted for some time to be in the main room to speak, but the first few will be, so I'm trying to promote them. I think that they have just received the promotion. Okay, I'll try to read off. We, you know, we have uh, Mayor Bronin, Representative Denning, Representative Morin Bello, uh, any of them available? I do see that uh, Mayor Luke Bronin has accepted the promotion, is now in the room. Wonderful. Love to hear from him. Thank you, gentlemen. I believe we're all set. Uh, appreciate you coming out. And Thank you very much for your time. Again, Mr. Chair. We can hear you. Please proceed, Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, to the to the all the members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and I'm testifying testifying uh, largely in support uh, with some suggested changes uh, of House Bill six four eight six, an act concerning extended producer responsibility for tires. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to thank and applaud the committee for considering this bill uh, in Hartford, as in many communities. Tires uh, are uh, routinely dumped illegally throughout our city. It is a significant quality of life issue for our community uh, and obviously poses uh, an environmental hazard and imposes a cost on our community as well. So uh, strongly in support of extended producer responsibility for tires. And I also wanna emphasize that um, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities has, uh, has also made a passing extended uh, produce responsibility for tires, one of its legislative uh, priorities this year. Uh, so I'm uh, very much uh, in support of it. I do want to note two things. As drafted, this bill uh, would create a grant program for uh, companies that engage in recycling uh, the rubber from tires and also uh, a grant program for municipalities. Uh, while I appreciate the opportunity to uh, get some funds that can be utilized by cities for this purpose, I certainly appreciate incentivizing the growth of the recycling industry. I think to be effective, uh, extender producer responsibility on tires has to impose some obligation on manufacturers and retailers of tires to take responsibility for the collection and ultimate uh, dis uh, disposition of the tires that they sell. Uh, so I hope that the committee will consider some changes to impose that responsibility directly on manufacturers and retailers, but uh, I am very grateful that the committee is considering a bill to pass Senate uh, responsibility for tires. Thanks so much. I uh, appreciate the chance. No problem. Thank you very much for your commentary. Any questions? Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any representative Denning? Oh, they're next. He's next. Heath, you got on. Here you go. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, Chairman and committee members. I appreciate the time to address the committee. My name is Keith Denning and I represent the 42nd District of Connecticut. Privileged to serve the towns of Wilton, New Canaan and Ridgefield. Um, I'm, I'm zooming to support the House Bill 6485, an act concerning natural organic reduction in green burials. Uh, traditional burials in the United States require embalming with toxic chemicals, the use of wood or metal caskets, and a concrete vault to prevent theft and gravesite ground collapse. More people today are cremated and therefore reducing the amount of usable land dedicated to cemeteries, but still causing toxic chemical release and carbon release, an average of 564 pounds of carbon with each cremation. Now, I know most people don't like to talk about these kind of problems, but uh, natural, process, natural body composting also known as terramation, is an ancient process where bodies are washed, wrapped in a natural linen shroud and blanketed with wood chips, flowers, and other natural material. The body is then placed in a sealed chamber that is heated with continual airflow and decomposes naturally, including the bones, within 30 to 60 days. The result is approximately 250 pounds of forest floor quality mulch that can be spread in a memorial garden, taken home, 
or buried in a uh, green cemetery. Um, I would add to the bill that it would require the services of mortuary and funeral homes, and it offers them another opportunity for their clients, a different service as well as traditional memorial services. I support the passage of this bill to provide more ecological process for burial to the citizens of Connecticut, adding to the seven other states where it's currently legal. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Representative, uh, Representative Palm. Uh, good morning, Representative Denning. Are you still there? Yes, I am. Um, do you believe that organic reduction and the byproduct should be um, prohibited from being used in agricultural uses? I am. I do not believe that the chili should be used in agricultural uses. I believe that uh, once the body is decomposed, I think uh, other than to put it into a memorial uh, ground where you have a wildflower garden or reforesting a memorial woods, using it for that, I, I do not see it should be used for agriculture. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for the bill. Any further questions? Any questions online? Re Representative Dubitsky, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for coming in, Representative, and discussing this bill with us. Uh, I have a couple questions about um, what is actually left after a body is composted. Um, if I've got some horrible disease and have been taking some uh, all kinds of medications uh, and then I die, is when my body is composted, don't those medications then, um, aren't they part of that uh, lump of material that's left? That's a great question. Um, there, uh, For example, uh, people with artificial joints, the joint material can be removed from the compost and recycled. The um, people who are on radiation treatment or radium, radiation implants would have to have special consideration just as we do now for people who are cremated as well as people who have taken recent chemotherapy and may have uh, still toxic agents in them. However, most of these drugs break down naturally in uh, composting uh, because they only have a certain shelf life and the actual material of, or the actual process with the heat and the moisture breaks down a lot of these toxic chemicals. But I would leave that more to mortuary services. Uh, they have the knowledge to decide and, and know currently what they would do and I would allow them to, as we develop the rules for this, consult with them on what they would use best practice. Do you know if somebody is going to testify from that group? I believe they are, yes. I have been in touch with the Mortuary Association. I believe they will testify, and I believe they are supported. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Baumgartner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Representative, for testifying. Um, can you speak to what other states have done with respect to um, um, organic production? Um, Oregon and Washington State were the first states to develop uh, or get natural organic burial. And um, it, they have followed the regulations of most mortuary services. Uh, the, there's, there's YouTube videos online that demonstrate how these bodies are handled. It's always done with respect. There are memorial services that are involved. There's just no embalming, so the time, and, and there are legislations, for example, that you cannot, just as you cannot cremate within 48 hours, you cannot start terramation within 48 hours. And that's in case there was a legal aspect to, they wanted to do an autopsy or a criminal investigation. But uh, the process is, is uh, natural, requires minimal regulation, uh, minimal oversight, and uh, the Department of Health would have to be involved to make sure that they were all being done correctly. And the, and the process was eliminating the resulting um, compost in a respectful and memorial way. Uh, thank you, Representative. I will re remind our colleagues, especially the uh, the newer ones, um, 66 people still to speak. And uh, unless we want to get out of here at three in the morning, we should be a little quicker. Um, but any further questions? Seeing none. 
Uh, thank you very much, Representative. Uh, next thank person. You. Thank you. Next person I see on the list is uh, Representative Morton Bello. Good morning. Can you Good hear morning. me? We can. Please proceed. Great. Thank you. Um, I am Rep. Amy Morin Bello, and I'm speaking today in support of HB 6485, an act concerning natural organic reduction in green burials. Uh, I proposed a similar bill, HB 5246, and have co sponsored Rep. Denning's similar bill, HB 5010. Um, and I'm glad that this subject is being discussed to this session. Natural organic reduction is the contained accelerated conversion of human remains to soil, or in layman's terms, the composting of a body. And um, as Rep. Denning mentioned, three states, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington, allow this green form of burial. And then there are three other states are, that are in the process of allowing for it. Um, and many people are moving away from a traditional burial process, which requires the embalming chemicals, the burial, and a casket which takes up space, uses resources and chemicals. Since 2015, cremation has become the most popular disposal practice in our country, uh, according to data collected by the National Funeral Directors Association. And there's several reasons for this change and in including environmental impact. Um, but the big environmental concern with cremation is the amount of energy it requires and the amount of carbon dioxide emission it produces. So cremating a single body typically takes up to three hours of burning and it releases more than 500 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And for reference, a gallon of gas, you know, that you put in your car is about 20 pounds of carbon dioxide from uh, burning a gallon of gas. So as people consider end of life arrangements and the environmental impact those arrangements have on our planet, a green, more natural burial is of interest. So as Rep. Denning said, there are companies that currently perform this service, and it would be my hope that our existing funeral homes in Connecticut would embrace the idea um, and learn how to also offer this as an additional form um, of the disposition of a loved one to complement its existing services of a traditional burial and cremation. So I look forward to um, continuing this conversation with the Environment Committee, and I hope that the Department of Public Health will, um, you know, be be willing to listen to these conversations and help to create regulations and consider issues that we've heard here about the, how the practice can work with um, people that have had disease or have had treatments and also on um, creating regulations on where we can dispose of the composted material after uh, it's it's been processed. So thank you for your time today and I look forward to continued conversations. Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I believe next in the queue is uh, Senator Summers. Yes, good morning. Uh, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, and distinguished members of the Environment Committee. I am here to testify on two bills this morning. Uh, the first bill is 6480, an act establishing a working group for the restoration of eelgrass. I am very much in support of this positive local ecological bill that has significant bipartisan support and is significant to our environment. It's aimed at helping protect and develop eelgrass beds, which have declined worldwide by 30%. It is not very well known that every hour we lose eelgrass beds that cover two football fields. Eelgrass beds provide an important habitat for small species as fish, small invertebrates, crabs, sea, uh, sea turtles, etc. And we are losing this at an alarming rate. I remember growing up in Noank when the entire cove was covered in eelgrass. And I believe there's only one sustainable eelgrass bed in our part of the uh, shoreline here off the coast on a, off an island called Ram Island. Eelgrass needs to be maintained. It protects the coastline. It helps mitigate climate change and it is crucial for our oceans uh, and its sustainability. So I implore you to pass this bill. It's very important to, to all of us here in the state of Connecticut and worldwide. 
The second bill that I would like to testify against actually is bill number 896, which has to do with the removal of trees. This is a um, probably well-intended bill. However, it is really unobtainable that when five trees are removed from a state park or a campground, uh, all the notifications that are required here. I testified against this last year uh, for the reasons that I happen to represent the largest state forest in the state of Connecticut, Patchogue State Forest. Um, this would cause delays in campground closures. It impacts storm cleanup. Last year in the, in the uh, forest, we had a wildfire that burned for over four weeks because they have to um, try to remove as many trees as possible from the forest for the forest life. And this would significantly impede that ability. The state of Connecticut teams up with a group called the Friends of Patchogue State Forest who help maintain and trim trees based on the direction of the DEEP. This bill would prevent them from doing that. And it is not practical to require a tree to be planted when a tree is removed, especially in heavily wooded forested areas. So I ask that this bill not be supported going forward. Is it's, it would extremely impact certain areas of the state of Connecticut. I understand you know, how this bill was first established. And there are have been some regretful removal of trees. However, this goes too far um, with the way that is written. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Summers. Any questions for Senator Summers? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, I see Christine Hall, select woman from the town of New, New Fairfield. Good morning. Good. My statement Good morning. this morning is in, um, support of HR 5009 concerning the public safety capacity of state parks. I've been a resident of New Fairfield for a long time and a selectman for, I've had the pleasure of serving New Fairfield as a selectman for five years. I also have the pleasure of living within a few miles of one of Connecticut's most beautiful state parks, Squans Pond State Park. This park provides many benefits to local residents and visitors from other parts of Connecticut and neighboring states including hiking trails, picnic areas, fishing, and a swimming area. The park is especially heavily used in the summer and has for decades provided a beautiful venue for friends and family to gather for picnics and recreation. This seasonal heavy use can unfortunately pose a threat to public safety that the town of New Fairfield is having a hard time coping with. We appreciate the help of the state police in responding to traffic challenges we experience on hot summer weekends, but a more fundamental look at what is happening and why, and the threat to public safety is sorely needed. I think HR 5009 provides that. Starting in the early 2000s, a series of drownings at Squants Pond raised concerns. There were approximately 15 drownings in 15 years. The town and deep cooperated to address the issue by regrading the beach and putting some danger spots off limits and imposing a limit of 250 on the number of cars that could park at the park. The limit on cars was meant to be a proxy for limiting the number of people using the park and its beach. While there have been no recent drownings at Squants, the limitation on parking has created another kind of public safety hazard. On hot summer days, visitors eager to enjoy a day of picnicking and swimming fill our roads with cars after the permissible 250 is reached. Because there is no limit on walk-ins, people who may have traveled for two hours to reach the park try to find a space wherever they can along residential roads and state route 39. And they walk into the park. They sometimes park in the center of town and walk along the shoulder of the highway over four miles balancing coolers and even children, a clear public safety concern. Additionally, the roads get so clogged, emer emergency vehicles cannot get through if required. We are in genuine need of a more considered and rational approach to setting and enforcing capacity limits at Squans Park and other parks that have similar situation. It's been about 15 years since the limitation of 250 park cars was imposed. I do not believe that is an effective way to address the public safety limitations on the beach at the park. A number of vans carrying up to 10 people bring people to the park. 
Additionally, the large number of walk-ins arriving at the park um, go well beyond what was anticipated. Ms. Ms. Hall, your, your time is up. If you want to summarize quickly. I, I, I believe that um, HR 5009 provides a framework for, for getting to a more rational uh, way of regulating the safety capacity. It balances traffic considerations along with considerations of, of, um, uh, uh, of, of the capacity of the park. Thank you very much. Any questions? From, yes, Representative Callahan, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Hall, for taking the time to uh, testify today and for your service to my hometown. Uh, I appreciate you uh, coming in and, and stating uh, for, for the Environment Committee the issues you're having and the reason for this bill. Uh, the way I understand it, uh, having driven that road many times, there's no shoulder, no place for pedestrians to walk, correct? That's absolutely correct. And, and sometimes the sides are, uh, uh, are really steep uh, going downhill. So it's a very dangerous situation. And I've observed, uh, as you said, that sometimes there's families walking uh, long distances and everybody needs a place to go. But I've witnessed uh, children walking in the middle of Route 39, which is a 50 mile an hour state highway. Have you seen the same, uh, Ms. Hall? Uh, yes, I live about uh, a block and a half from Route 39. And uh, in the summertime, that's not an unusual occurrence. And uh, furthermore, uh, the town of New Fairfield has uh, sometimes has to provide public safety. Uh, for the situation that the parks uh, uh, created, meaning it's it's full by 8 a.m. and then you've got uh, droves of traffic coming in. Who bears the brunt of this cost? We, the town of New Fairfield uh, has to employ our officers over time. We are getting assistance, uh, especially in the last year or so from the uh, state police, but a lot of the overtime comes, uh, is, is a bill that the town of New Fairfield pays. So the, the town of Fairfield has to pick up the tab for, for what's going on at the state park. A lot of it, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hall. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, thank you for introducing the bill, uh, Representative Callahan, and also um, for the support of, of Senator Julie Kushner on it as well. And Senator Harding sitting next to me. <laughs> and Senator Harding, sorry. Speaking of, Senator Harding. <laughs> Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank you uh, for Selectman Hall for, for your testimony today. Um, I just just to quickly elaborate, I think you pretty much hit on all the points, but, um, you know, if this bill were to pass, you know, how, how would you see this impacting uh, New Fairfield specifically in, in a positive way? We what we're hoping to uh, accomplish is to make the park available to visitors up to the limits of the capacity of the park. Um, it's, uh, what needs to be done is for DEEP, possibly working with um, the state police to understand what the capacity is for uh, in terms of, of lifeguarding at the beach for the safety of people and allow no more visitors than that, but then to decide how best to regulate that number of visitors relying on the number of parked cars is not the right proxy to use for that. Thank you. And I appreciate your, your advocacy and your, your hard work on behalf of New Fairfield. And uh, ho hopefully uh, with your help and, and Representative Callahan and others on this committee, we can, can continue to push this forward. So thank you so much for, uh, for testifying today and for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Representative Muslinski. Thank you. Wow. Sorry. Um, wanted to ask the witness a question. Uh, in in Meriden, there's a town near me. There's a a bus that takes folks to uh, Hammonasset on a summer day, and Deep supplies the bus. It's free. It encourages people to leave their cars at home and to all ride on the bus instead. I understand the issue with enough lifeguards for the uh, crowd that attends the park. And that should be a factor in how many people are allowed in the park. However, if the uh, main issue is the traffic safety, you could fix that by having DEEP provide bus service from a parking lot, uh, maybe downtown, and then bringing people on the bus to the park. What, what would you think about that idea? That would certainly alleviate the traf uh, a good part of the traffic problem uh, and the problem of people walking along the edge of the road. 
we would have to find a place in the center of town. Uh, we're a very small town, 14,000 people. There, is no, there is no municipal parking facility there. Um, so it, it, it may not be as simple as, as what you're suggesting, but it's, it would alleviate, if that's the approach, it would alleviate the traffic concern that is really befuddling us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. No problem. Any others I'm missing? Yep. Representative Callahan. Ms. Hall, one follow-up question. Is there any public parking in the center of New Fairfield that could uh, accommodate a buses? To my knowledge, it's all businesses. It's all businesses. It's parking lots associated with um, our various uh, shopping um, uh, enterprises. Thank you. Any other questions? Rep Representative Dubisky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how does anybody know how many people are in the park at any given time? At the gate, um, cars that come through have to uh, come through, and if they've got the kinetic, if they've got Connecticut plates, they're let in free, but they still come through the gate. Um, and if they are an out-of-state resident, um, which because of our proximity to New York happens quite a bit. Um, they pay the fee. Um, going through the gate, um, if, if there are no walk-ins allowed and you have to travel through the gate um, by car, one could presumably count the number of people in the car. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Uh, we we're gonna move on to uh, Senator Kushner, next. Thank you, um, Senator Lopes and uh, your co-chair, Representative Gresco. Thank you also to the vice chair, Senator Hockadell, Representative Palm and the ranking members, Senator Harding and Representative Callahan. Thank you for the time to speak today in favor of House Bill 5009. You just heard from Selectman Hall about the importance of this bill. And uh, I just wanted to add my thoughts to uh, to your consideration. Uh, I, I appreciate some, I, I did read the testimony uh, in favor and in, in opposition to this bill that was posted last night. And I really do appreciate, especially Eileen Grant, who's with the Friends of Connecticut State Parks on concern about the understaffing of uh, our state parks uh, in the summer. And I think that is, a concern that's really important. Uh, and so I recognize the challenges that we might have to enforce uh, this change in the law. But I also recognize um, everything that has been said by uh, Selectman Hall. And I think you'll see this and you'll hear also from first Selectman Delmonico after me, you're gonna hear about how dangerous this is. And that really is the issue. Um, it is so dangerous. I've seen it myself on Route 39 when I've traveled between uh, New Fairfield and Sherman. Sherman is very close to uh, Squance Pond. I've heard from constituents both from New Fairfield and from Squance Pond Squance, and from Sherman about the serious concern about uh, the dangerous situation on the highway. And we're talking about families uh, in, in the main. And I, I think we especially now really to need to address this because we would hate to have a tragedy on the highway. I, I understand the capacity issue for the park. I think uh, it also ought to be reviewed because it is possible we could increase the capacity there safe in a safe way and accommodate more parking there or um, some other suggestion that's been made by um, Representative Mashinsky for having uh, folks uh, have opportunities to take a shuttle bus in. You know, I recognize there's some concern about where you would park, but we could potentially resolve that uh, through other public parking lots on the weekend, at least. Um, so I think that all of these considerations are important. I would encourage us to move this bill forward, allow us to continue the discussion about a safe solution. Uh, and you know, I, I, I know that Selectman Hall and First Selectman Delmonico have been on this issue for a number of years. Uh, they certainly have relayed the concern to me. And as I previously sat on environment, I know how hard it is when you get so many bills to put, you know, to move everything forward, but this is a safety concern. And I think it's something that we need to address quickly before there is a tragedy. So thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you, Senator Kushner. You nailed three minutes on the button. Any questions? Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll be moving on to uh, uh, yeah, Patricia Delmonico, town of New Fairfield. Good morning, um, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, um, Representative Callahan, members of the committee. My name is Patricia Delmonico and I hold the office of first selectman in New Fairfield. I'm here this morning to speak in support of HB 5009 concerning public safety capacity of state parks. I've been a resident of New Fairfield for 33 years and first selectman since 2017. And I thank you for this opportunity um, to provide testimony. My comments are very similar to those presented by um, Selectman Hall. So I will try to move very quickly. Um, every summer, Squans Pond is enjoyed by thousands of visitors, um, some traveling a great distance to enjoy the beauty of the park in company of family and friends. We welcome all visitors to New Fairfield and we strive to ensure um, that they have a safe and enjoyable visit to our town. Between 1996 and 2007, there were 13 drowning deaths at Squans Pond State Park. Recognizing the hazards at the park, DEEP invested funds to upgrade park facilities, hire more lifeguards, and reduce the capacity at the park. In 2007, DEEP determined that 250 cars is, prox is proxy for the maximum number of guests that can be safely accommodated in the park, and subsequently limited parking within the park to 250 cars. However, as has been discussed, DEEP continues to allow park visitors to walk into the park after the limit of 250 cars has been reached. Not only does this practice compromise the safety within the park by exceeding the limit determined by DEEP, um, but it also creates safety issues outside of the park. I commend the efforts of DEEP officials to notify travelers when Squans Pond reaches capacity using radio messages and signage along major highways approaching New Fairfield. However, such communication has not been su sufficient to deter visitors from traveling to and entering the park after capacity has been reached. Numerous additional cars may be observed parked on town roads and in area parking lots while the occupants of those vehicles walk to the park along busy State Route 39 and narrow windy local roads such as Shortwoods Road. Families with small children, picnic supplies, grills, and strollers can be observed walking to the park along the state road, which does not have a shoulder on either side. Further, I have personally observed local roads made inaccessible to emergency response vehicles by the number of illegally parked cars on both sides of the road. None of us want a beautiful summer day to end in tragedy. While the pandemic limited attendance at Squans Pond during the summers of 2020 and 2021, the park is once again operating at full capacity on summer weekends. And we are once again faced with multiple public safety issues, both um, inside Mr. and Mr. outside the park. Just, yeah, your time's closing. Any further comments? Um, uh, yes, just that we um, it's imperative that the parks be closed to new entrants when uh, public safety capacities are reached, um, specifically to Squans Pond when we reach that 250 car limit. Thank you. No problem. Any questions? Senator Harding, please. Thank you. First, uh, Selectwoman Delmonico, I uh, appreciate your advocacy on behalf of the town on this uh, piece of legislation. Um, I know you were kind of uh, finishing up your 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 last three minute there, so I don't know if there's any uh, anything else uh, you didn't add regarding some of the concerns that you, uh, you'd like to address. No, I think I, I I did get it in there at the end. Um, my biggest concern is just making sure that both um, uh, the, you know we have safety inside the park. We're not stressing the limits of the resources there, um, and likewise for the area surrounding the park. Any questions? Oh, Representative Callahan. Thank you, Mr. Monaco, for taking the time to, to testify this morning. Thank you for your service to my town, our town. Uh, my question I have is, uh, have you talked to the staff that work at the state park? And, and in addition to uh, law enforcement, uh, you, you are the head of law enforcement in New Fairfield, and do they concur? Yes, they do. I have spoken to both. Um, 
uh, the park rangers over the various, you know, over the years that I've been here, um, as well as our um, local officers and resident state troopers. And furthermore, there is a town park nearby about a mile away. Does it affect parking for residents there? Um, in the past, it has. Um, we do um, have a limit on out of town cars for that park since it is um, open to our um, residents and visitors also. Um, so that that um, issue has existed over the years. Yes. And, and thank you. One last question, Mr. Chair, if you'll indulge me. Uh, how long has this problem uh, persisted? Um, it has been a problem. Um, I, I mentioned that I have lived here for 30, 33 years. I have been aware of this problem um, for um, at least um, the past 20 or so years. Um, I think it really came to light for all of us as residents when um, those drownings increased in those years between the mid 90s and uh, mid 2000s. Well, thank you again for uh, uh, advocating for for uh, the town of New Fairfield and for uh, you coming in today. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, any further questions? Representative Dubitsky. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for coming in. Um, there clearly seems to be a big problem um, over in New Fairfield area. Um, and you say that this has been going on for 20 years or more? Um, yes, I know that the administrations, two previous um, administrations before me, um, as I said, dating back to the early 2000s, um, were dealing with this issue. Um, and that was before um, the capacity limits were, um, were limited. So DEEP did make efforts to improve the safety within the park. Um, at that time, um, but in turn, we we now have more safety issues outside of the park. Thank you. Um, are you aware of any uh, similar long-standing problems at any other um, in any other parts of the state? Um, I am not personally aware. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions? Any questions on Zoom, Joe? Dan. Okay. Uh, and thank you very much. Um, oh, thank you. Representative Danjo has a question. Okay. Representative Danjo. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you to the chairs uh, for allowing me to speak. Um, regarding the state park issue, I under understanding the safety components of overcrowding at various state parks. What would you say to someone who shows up at say Swans Pond, for example, and it's full and they're turned away and they perhaps have driven maybe an hour to get there, which would be the case for myself. If I were to go to Swans Pond, it would take me close to an hour to get there. I'm there with my picnic baskets, my family, and I'm turned away at the gate. Do you anticipate, um, what's the alternative for those guests that wanna come and visit? Is there an alternative for them? And do you anticipate any sort of altercation? at the gate from some people who might become pretty angry? Um, so, you know, this is something that we have, we run into every summer as people approach the gate and there's no longer parking inside the park. Um, and typically they are directed by park staff to other state parks. Um, and I, I, you know, I commend DEP for also making sure there's signage on the highways approaching um, New Fairfield, so 84 and 684, um, to try to direct people away from Squans Pond and then to other state parks. Um, because yes, sometimes, unfortunately, there are altercations um, and traffic, uh, traffic issues then created by um, cars stopping, trying to get into the park and so forth. So um, it, it does create an issue, but um, we do have some success in directing people um, to other state parks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any questions? Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much. We will move on to, I believe, Kim O'Rourke. 
Good morning. Good morning, honorable chairman and committee members. My name is Kim O'Rourke. I'm the recycling coordinator for the city of Middletown. It's a little hard to hear you if you can boost your volume. Try this again. How's this? Is that any better? No. We'll just listen carefully. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see. How's that? Is that any better? We need some. Uh, sure, proceed. We need some audio microphones of the city here. So thank you for this opportunity to provide comments regarding raised bill 6486 regarding EPR for tires. The city of Middletown opposes the proposed language in this bill. It is unusual for a municipality to oppose an EPR bill, but this bill does not contain EPR components and does nothing to create a more sustainable management program for scrap tires. The title is misleading. A well-designed EPR system would shift the end-of-life management cost to producers, would offer free and accessible disposable options for consumers, would increase education and outreach, include performance goals and accountability, and include incentives for a circular economy. In Connecticut, we have successful EPR programs for electronics, mattresses, paint, and thermostats. Legislation passed last year for gas cylinders. Middletown participates in all of these working programs. We have saved over $150,000 annually and have diverted over a million pounds of waste from landfills and incinerators. Scrap tires are a difficult and expensive material to manage. Middletown spends approximately $35,000 a year on the storage, transportation, and disposal of the scrap tires. We recently issued an RFQ for this service and only one vendor responded leaving the city with very limited options. The cost of disposal increased over 20%. To help cover these costs, the city charges residents $3 per tire and enforces a limit of four tires per vehicle at our transfer station. The cost and the tire limit are both barriers for convenient disposal. The tires get dumped illegally on public and private property. We're very grateful to the Connecticut River Conservancy and the numerous volunteers who have collected tires over the past many years in Middletown, but volunteer cleanups and limited city budgets are not a sustainable solution to this problem and private property owners are left with no assistance. So an EPR program for tires would help municipalities share the burden of managing the scrap tires, make it free and convenient for residents to properly dispose of them and remove barriers that encourage illegal dumping. It would also create jobs and incentivize a circular closed loop economy. A simple fee on tires will not address any of these issues. We just can't throw money at the problem. We need to change the system as we've done successfully with mattresses, paint and electronics. So the city supports replacing the language and raised bill 6486 with the tire EPR language from the 2022 legislative session. And there's further details in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Your timing was very good. Any questions for Ms. O'Rourke? I believe I see Representative Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Kim, for testifying today for all the work you do in the city. Um, definitely appreciate it. And no particular questions. I just wanted to thank you for providing your testimony today. Thank you. Okay, that was quick. Uh, Representative O'Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you so much for your testimony uh, this morning. Um, just a quick question: Do we know? Do you know what percent of the towns and or the tires in your community are uh, uh, dumped as opposed to returned? What percent are dumped as opposed to well, that come into our transfer station that we have to get rid of? Yes. Percent are dumped. I do not have that figure. Um, I have to say, uh, it's been difficult getting data on that. Usually, our guys just pick them up and get rid of them, and they don't keep track of them. Um, it's a very good question, though, and it, it would be great if we had that. Um, if we had that data. You no, know, no, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to figure out the best way procedurally um, of getting these tires off and and helping the municipalities and dealing with them. So uh, maybe creating some end of uh, 
use uh, benefit. Like we, we increase the bottle deposit that uh, eventually we're going to affect uh, from five cents to 10 cents, hoping that that will encourage people to get those off the road, the, the uh, off the public space. Uh, I'm wondering if we increase some uh, use for these tires uh, that may prevent them from being dumped. I know DOT had talked about using more of uh, old tires in their asphalt um, uh, mix. Um, so uh, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to trying to help our municipalities in dealing with this issue. Thank you. I, thank you. I do think the, an EPR program would help um, increase the uses of tires, and it would also help on the end of... Um, making it easier for people to dispose of the tires. They wouldn't have to pay to bring them somewhere. Um, it, it, would saw, it, would, it would address both those problems. All set, Representative? Yes, thank you very much, sorry. No problem. Representative Dillon, please. Good uh, morning. Kim, I really wanna thank you for, for appearing before this committee today. Um, uh, because you've, you've, you've done the work for so long. I, I had seen this language and I was under the impression that the Audubon Society supported it. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm really, really interested in reading closely what all of the testimony says on this and respecting the experience of people who have done this work. Thank you very much for being here and hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, uh, Ms. O'Rourke. And next we have uh, Diane Hoffman, who is also remote. Thank you very much. Uh, dear co-chairs and honorable members of the Environment Committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of Hamden Alliance for Trees, which is a grassroots organization in Hamden. The Hamden Alliance for Trees supports SB 122, an act concerning the replanting of trees in public areas as cleared by utility companies. Creation of such a restoration fund by the utility companies is long overdue as they have been removing hundreds of trees from our towns every year for a decade. This fund should be replenished on a regular schedule so funds are always available to allow for the necessary planting and care of trees in our municipalities in a timely manner. This fund must not be used as a justification for more unnecessary tree removals. We are in an environmental crisis and climate emergency. Trees are essential workers. We need them for clean air, for clean water, to mitigate flooding, to fight the heat island effect and much more. This is a public health issue and an environmental justice issue. It is also a financial issue. The removal of trees contributes to increased air pollution, resulting in increased medical costs and physical and emotional pain. It contributes to the loss of property values due to increased noise and ugliness and increased costs to cool our homes if we are lucky enough to be able to afford air conditioning. Current utility company practices work against the governor's executive orders, the work of the GC3 and the regional COG hazard mitigation plans, as well as local plans of conservation and development. Utility practices must be better controlled. The utility companies must participate in the 21st century and address their role in contributing to the climate crisis we are experiencing. Business as usual is not acceptable. Thank you for your consideration of this important bill. We look to you to provide the leadership that is so desperately needed at this time. And on a personal note, I would like to strongly endorse the written testimony that has been submitted by Julia Kane and Natalie Tallis of Darien and Ralph Jones and Patricia Sepp Sabosik of Hamden. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Hoffman? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next is William Lucy. 
who I believe is in the building. Sir, does the cap come with the job? Uh, it's mandatory, yes. Yes, that's what I thought. <laughs> Please proceed. Um, yeah, well, it is good to be in the building. Um, been a long time. And uh, it's also really, well, welcome to the Environment Committee, those of you here in person. Uh, it's also really good to see a lot of these bills in this first go around that didn't quite make it out. Last year, uh, we support a number of them. Uh, the resiliency uh, bill allowing towns, giving them tools to leverage funds to deal with the flood risks that are increasing. Um, the eelgrass restoration working group, Senator Summers did a good job of explaining how that is valuable. Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, the open space is a big one. Obviously, we need more parks. <laughs> All this crowding discussion we've had today, it sounds like uh more spending on open space would be uh beneficial to the public but I'm, I'm here today to specifically talk about the balloon release bill um this is something that i think it started in 2019 and we've been testifying in favor of that for four years now um i also am out on the water i know captain mike have talked to him about this issue um that spoke first and they're 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 everywhere and um, I, would, I submitted testimony that showed a lobster that was entangled from a commercial lobster fisher, uh, fisherman's pot was entangled in a balloon string. I mean, you find, you find these strings all over the place. I pick up balloons every single time I'm on the water. Um, and what ends up happening is they deflate, they go down, they get sucked into jet engines, they get sucked into uh, water intakes, they can really overheat your engine, it's a problem. Um, and then finally, when they sink to the bottom, um, they add to the, the litter that's down there. I've talked to the Atlantic Clam Company, uh, who harvests down in the Western Sound, and he pulls up hundreds and thousands of pounds of plastic garbage off the bottom of the Sound all, every year, because he's dredging up, he's grabbing clams and oysters. And so you can just imagine the layers of plastic and sediment down there. So anything we can do to turn off the tap of this type of plastic, we're in, we're in full support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Gresco. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Bill, for, for coming in and giving us uh, the perspective of uh, you being on the water, usually um, daily. Um, but uh, realistically, there is, even if we do this, um, there is no balloon police that's going to go out and stop people from from doing this however um i'm encouraged by the industry's um uh, be balloon smart pledge as um, a first step in maybe educating their customers um when bill lucy comes in and says give me a hundred balloons um kind of uh, uh, the conversation can go along the lines of, you're not gonna let those out, are you? Are you? Well, the, the state of Connecticut doesn't allow you to do that. Still buy them, but uh, you know, just don't let them out kind of thing um, um, is what I'm hopefully um, envisioning in, in this. But um, uh, my, my question, um, I guess, stems from um, your experience uh, on the water in that, uh, do you think that an alternative to Mylar is going to make a difference? Um, not really. My, Mylar is you know, excessively annoying because when it does break down, I mean, I find them on my property. You see them in parks, you see them everywhere, and they get into, they break in all those little bits. Those can be ingested, but also the rubber gets ingested. And what happens is when that rubber breaks up into small pieces, it gets coated with algae. And then the turtles like to eat it. It's kind of like put salt and pepper on the rubber and they think it's tasty. And so those are notorious. The latex is notorious for getting caught up in uh, in, in, in the digestive tract. So I, I don't think the material is the issue. I think it's the release is the issue. So whether they're latex or mylar, um, I mean, there was the paper lanterns were mentioned. You know, you put the candle in. I mean, that's paper. I wish all our single use plastic was made out of something like that, that if it did get away, it would just fall down to earth and rot away into nothing, but it's the release that's the issue. Thank you, Representative Palm. Good morning, Bill. Thank you for your wonderful work. Um, 
In your opinion, are the strings also uh, as problematic? Supposing we just theoretically, supposing we could do something about the the mylar. My understanding from the the captain who spoke earlier is that the strings are equally problematic. Is that your opinion? Oh, a absolutely. I, you know, if you go up some of the rivers like the Quinnipiac, um, we'll patrol up there looking for pollution. You see these osprey nests. Uh, there's one up by the Amtrak yard. It's almost completely consisted of packing bands. So what happens is the the birds grab these strings and they make their nests out of them and they get all wrapped up. I mean, any of that plastic string fishing line, I saw a crayfish all entangled in fishing line. I was fishing with my kid for trout last year. It's strings that don't rot in nature are really problematic for wildlife. That's what catches most of the stuff is the string. Thank you very much. That's it, Mr. Representative Callahan. Thanks for coming in, Bill, and for your comments. I, just really quick for you and for anyone else who testifies in person after you, how did you concentrate with those lights in your eyes? <laughs> I know. I was like, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. It's new, right? We have been you can out slide over a little for bit. a while. Because I was walking out here, don't bump into things. You don't, yeah. I appreciate you coming in. Yeah, that's right. There we are. It'll reflect it back. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, next, I see Aaron Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and committee members. I've uh, appeared before this committee a couple times previously to thank you for your strong uh, bipartisan support of uh, bikeways, trails, and greenways funding. And, and today I'm here again to express that sentiment with re respect to HB 6482. One would be hard pressed to find a state investment that has a stronger, more positive impact simultaneously on public health, arts and tourism, economic development, and quality of life. Uh, I often sit in on meetings of the Connecticut Greenways Council, which is the body authorized to score applications for Greenway and Trails grants. And it's always frustrating, al almost uh, tragic to see how many wonderful, worthy projects have to be turned down because there's simply not enough funding available in the program to meet the enormous uh, demand. And I think you have some written testimony from my colleagues, Lisa, Lisa Fernandez of the Rail to Trail Association and uh, Bruce Donald from East Coast Greenway, which spells out that mismatch between supply and demand in greater detail. I just want to comment briefly on uh, 6486, the tire EPR bill. I happened to be with New Haven's Riverkeeper, Peter Davis, a few days ago when he and I pulled out about 200 tires from West River Memorial Park in New Haven, which is right next to Route 1. It's notorious as one of the worst illegal dumping hot zones in the state. When I told Peter, our riverkeeper, there are some folks who argue that that improper disposal of tires isn't really a problem anymore or it doesn't really impose a cost on municipalities, uh, he could not stop laughing because that that is just completely uh, false. Most of the illegal uh, disposal in New Haven is in our parks. Our parks department is one of the most cash strapped departments in the city. They simply do not have the resources to address this problem. And it's not just the cost, it's the diversion of staff time and the opportunity cost. It can take three weeks for the parks department to have the bandwidth to do a work order to pick up tires, even when volunteers have already done uh, the difficult part of removing them from the water. So absolutely, we should we should raise uh, the fines for legal dumping install more security cameras in known dumping hot zones but that's not enough we, we need additional tools to address the problem i do share the concern that the way the bill is currently constructed a grants program administered by the state rather than by a stewardship organization uh, the 75 25 grants formula doesn't quite do enough to help municipalities or specifically address the illegal dumping problem that's so damaging to our waterways and in terms of the 25 percent municipal grants i would strongly hope that in determining where those grants goes, which is line 100 of the bill, that there's a preference given for designated environmental justice communities, because we know that as with so many other environmental threats and hazards, these communities are bearing the brunt of the tire dumping problem and have the least resources to address it. So I know it's been a long journey for tire EPR. I hope we can finally get it over the finish line this year uh, in, a, in a form that satisfies the needs of our municipalities and watershed uh, stewardship groups. So thank you very much for your work and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Mr. Good. Any questions, Representative Dillon? Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Aaron, uh, for, for your testimony, but also for your mention of the West River. I went outside to speak with Representative Haynes and her guests, and uh, 
and they were talking about that. They asked me if I cared about the Long Island Sound and tires. And I said, well, actually, it's a huge issue on the West River. And, and it became a major issue with DEEP this summer because we were looking to get a grant, a sustainability grant, to try to deal with the devastating flooding that was happening to destroy property and uh in a part of my district. And uh, they didn't consider us a, a uh, an environmental justice community, even though New Haven was cited when, when that program was created. So uh, we have to deal with it uh, in, in terms of a diversion, yes, but it's also a threat to public safety because it's exacerbating a problem that's happening because our sewers have not been separated. And it is, um, it is uh, cre clogging up the uh, the uh, and creating. And I won't dwell on the awful yucky stuff that we saw floating in the reed uh, during during bad weather. But uh, thank you very much. And and uh, I guess that wasn't a question, Mr. Chairman. So I I really appreciate your courtesy. And I, we can't keep up with New Fairfield. I know, but but West River is small but mighty. Thank you very much. All right. Um, any questions online? Anything, Joe? I didn't see anything. All right. Thank you very much. I believe we're all set there. Oh, good. Good. All right. Um, next, I see Lori Brown. Yes, good morning, Senator Lopes and Representative Gresco, Vice Chairs and Ranking Members and all the members of the committee and, and a special thanks to uh, Gaia for being so helpful in all of this <laughs> first hearing. Um, my name is Lori Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters. And on behalf of the League, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to express our strong support for many of the bills on your hearing agenda today. We work closely with many of the environmental organizations and experts that are leading these initiatives. And so there's an abundance of testimony today from supporters of legislation to protect trees, to fund open space, greenways, climate resiliency, to protect horseshoe crabs and restore critical grass, eelgrass habitat and reduce um, entanglements of wildlife with balloons, just to name a few. Um, CTLCV uh, is joining their efforts in support of all of these bills. Um, I did not prepare individual testimony for each bill separately, but they're all identified with the bill numbers in our uh, written comments. Um, and we're very pleased that wildlife and habitat are certainly you know, a very strong theme this year. Um, and there appear to be obviously more bills in the works for that to reduce pesticides, protect birds and light pollution and whatnot. So, um, but on a separate issue, uh, there are two bills in particular that I would like to highlight that have to do with waste management. Um, CTLCV strongly opposes 8, SB 895 regarding the bottle deposit program because it really takes us back in the wrong direction. We need to continue expanding the types of containers uh, to recycle, not, not finding exemptions. Um, the second bill is one you just heard about, um, House Bill 6486, which is about the extended producer responsibility for tires. So as you just heard from um, others, uh, including Bill Lucy and, and Kim O'Rourke, uh, discarded scrap tires pose terrible environmental problems. Old discarded tires are breaking up and releasing toxins into the environment. They're poisoning our land, our air, our water, and our wildlife. And while uh, CTLCV absolutely supports efforts to increase tire recycling and reduce the illegal dumping, this bill does not, it's not going to get us to a true EPR program. The tire legislation has been raised in this committee for several years. And the original intent has always been to sort of ensure that industry is fully engaged and responsible for designing and abiding by the tire disposal program that considers the full life cycle of the product. CT, you know, we've, we've done this in Connecticut um, successfully with other dif difficult to recycle products that you've heard already, electronics, paint, mattresses. Um, but there was legislation proposed last year that many municipalities and advocates felt would get us closer to a sustainable solution. So we'd like to encourage you also to look at the language of last year's House Bill 5139 as your starting point. So um, once again, CTLCV really appreciates the strong environmental agenda this year, and thank you for considering these comments. Oh, Lori, right on the button. Um, any questions for Ms. Brown? 
Uh, Representative Paul. Good morning, Lori. Uh, very quickly, I don't think in your list of priorities uh, you mentioned anything about the organic reduction bill. Do you have a, a position on that, just out of curiosity? I'm sorry, the organic reduction bill. Uh, the human composting. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, personally, I absolutely 1000% support that. Um, and clearly, you know, as the um, I, I think it's just a question of how the program's designed. And I think there's lots of interest in it from the land trust community just to make sure to get it right. Um, but no, very much in support of that, the green burials. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Next would be Senator Cohen. Security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. There's this light, right? Oh, like that's not very welcoming. Environment committee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, Senator Loves, Representative Gresco, uh, Ranking Member Callahan, and uh, Ranking Member uh, Senator Harding, as well as the rest of the Environment Committee. So glad to be with you all today. Uh, albeit a little strange being on this side uh, this session, um, but I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, you have a bill before you today, 6479, that I am extremely passionate about. I will spare you uh, reading my testimony. I believe you have a hard copy of it uh, for your perusing pleasure at a future date. But many of you uh, will recall in 2019, we passed legislation which enabled municipalities to set up uh, climate and coastal resiliency funds. Uh, the gist of that legislation was to allow them to invest in a higher percentage of equities uh, so that they could more aggressively see a return on those funds and implement them as needed. We do know uh, from our friends at the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation, CIRCA as they are affectionately known, uh, has told us we will see about 20 inches of sea level rise uh, within the, uh, the next couple of decades by 2050 is the figure. Uh, that's extremely concerning for communities like mine on the shoreline. And so we need to encourage municipalities to set up these climate and coastal resiliency funds. A lot of them have done so. Uh, and what I am hearing from those communities uh, that have done so is that there is a little bit of a roadblock, if you will. Once they set up these funds, uh, they need to set up a commission uh, they need to have uh, some investment expertise, and it can be incredibly costly. Uh, so thanks to some folks in Brantford, actually, Connecticut, uh, Jim Finch, who I believe has also submitted testimony for uh, this bill and for the committee to review, uh, suggested that, hey, why not invest these funds through the Office of the State Treasurer? This has been before the committee before. I would like to say uh, it's received widespread support uh, throughout the General Assembly and sort of uh, a situation where I think we've run out of time on this bill and so um, in getting it passed in the in past session. So I'm hopeful that we can do so this session uh, with uh, renewed vigor and uh, hope to uh, allow these municipalities to be able to have the expertise of the Office of the State Treasurer and invest these funds appropriately. Happy to take any questions. Sure. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, Representative Palm. Senator, have you spoken to anybody at uh, municipal groups like cost? And do you know how they feel about this? Yeah, so most municipalities are, this would be fully optional. So uh, as is the, uh, if a municipality wants to set up a climate and coastal resiliency fund, um, if totally optional, uh, it's just enabling legislation that we passed a few years ago. And if they have these funds, uh, again, enabling legislation to in in allow them to invest through the office of the state treasurer, we've done things like this uh, 
similarly for municipalities in the past and it's worked out very well. Uh, so I, I don't want to speak for cost uh, or CCM, but I suspect they'd be in favor of this. I haven't looked to see if they have submitted testimony. I do know that you will be hearing from some municipal leaders if you haven't already uh, strongly in favor of this legislation. Uh, Representative Callahan. Good to see you, Senator. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, do you know of any other municipalities that are already doing this? Uh, in terms of that have the funds set yeah. up? Yes. Yeah. So Brantford has funds set up. Madison has funds set up. Uh, I believe Glastonbury, if they haven't already, uh, they were in the process of setting up a climate and coastal resiliency fund. It's not limited to the coast. And that's why uh, the, the term climate's in there as well, because our inland communities experience storm surges uh, just as we do on the shoreline, certainly a little bit more at risk uh, for coastal flooding, obviously, if you live on the Long Island Sound, but uh, every community across the state needs to prepare for and, and have resiliency measures in place so that, uh, you know, in the event there are storm surges or other natural disasters, uh, that these towns have a way to uh, pay to rebuild, if you will, or to prevent um, some some problematic situations with respect to their infrastructure. What has happened uh, in the case of Brantford, they set aside about a million dollars a number of years ago, I guess it's now four years ago, even before we had passed the legislation. And again, they were really pioneers here and, and brought the legislation to us at the time on the Environment Committee, and, and we were able to pass it. And once they did that, what they realized is it was going to be quite costly for them um, to figure out how to bring somebody on to invest these funds for them. Uh, it was going to be cumbersome to get a whole committee in place to review the investing of these funds and to oversee it. Uh, and that's where the idea came from, to really use the Office of the State Treasurer. I will note to Representative Callahan that uh, the Governor's Council on Climate Change uh, had uh, recommended, uh, I guess three years ago now, that these funds be put in place for all municipalities across the state. Um, so this really goes hand in hand with that. Well, thank you for coming in today and I appreciate the answer. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Gresco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, the Treasurer's Office has the capacity uh, to do this. That is my I'm understanding. Eating. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now I've got a dog. Oh, yeah. that's Miles. Nancy. Miles. Miles. Put Nancy, put the oh. mute on. Oh God. Okay. Okay. Nancy. Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, no, you're you're not ready. You put the mute on. Oh my God. <laughs> oh no. Oh hey, no. Okay. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Oh my God. I mean, stop talking to her. So <laughs> oh wait. I Thank you. Myself. And then the way this language is written uh, this time, um, it also doesn't require deep to do the work for the municipalities as far as finding grants and, and uh, applying for funding. That's correct. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right now that I've caught my breath, that was good. Uh, anyone in the room? I see Representative D'Amico followed by Representative O'Day. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Senator Cohen, it's good to see you again. And we miss you on the Environment Committee, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, um, so Senator, I wanted to direct your attention to uh, a bill that's on the agenda, the public hearing agenda today that you did not address, but I know you were, you were very involved in its predecessor. Uh, this is a bill that has to do with the, um, the, the, the changes that we made to the bottle bill in 2021. Uh, and it, it's, um, it's uh, Senate Bill 895 uh, on, on today's agenda. Are you familiar with this at all, Senator? I, I'm sorry, Representative. I didn't review the the entirety of the agenda or the bills before the committee today. My apologies. That, that's okay. I, I just wanted to I just wanted to elicit your opinion uh, since since you, you 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 and I and several others worked very closely together on in in 2021. So so this bill, uh, raised Bill 895. Mike, Mike. Uh, yes, Representative Domingo, if you could 
narrow your questions to the testimony that Senator Cohen gave, not switch over to another bill. That'd probably be a little bit more helpful. I, I didn't know that I was, wasn't allowed to switch over to another bill that's on today's agenda, Mr. Chair. If, 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 that's, if that's the case, then then I apologize. Oh, you, you can she just said she testify to it, but generally you're, you're, we're, we ask, as members of the committee, we're asking questions based on the testimony the person has given and okay. not something else. I mean, occasionally, okay. if they're a subject matter expert, you can jump to something else, but generally consider well, asking in, 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 in view of the fact that the good senator uh, brought out the bill uh, in 2021, uh, in the Senate, I, I would consider her to be a, a somewhat of an expert on this. <laughs> or not. Let, uh, <laughs> let's um, refrain to just what her testimony. Any, any questions to her testimony? No, that's okay. I'll, I'll save it for, for uh, another, another testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative O'Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Senator, for your testimony. Just real quick, I, I, I appreciate, I didn't get a chance to read all of the testimony today, but I did uh, begin to glance at yours and try and get through much of it as I can. In taking a look at the, um, the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate uh, Adaptation, that's, that's where you cite or as the, uh, the authority that you cite for the, the up to 20 inches in rise of sea level uh, by 2050, and I'm I'm on their website. I'm I'm wondering, do you know where they get that information, or how they determine that that's something they're looking at? Uh, Representative O'Day, thank you for the question. I do know that they have uh, so much information on their website, and I would I would guess that they cite where they obtain their data from on there. I do not know. I I. I I wouldn't venture to uh, throw out a guess, although I have several um, thoughts on that, but I certainly wouldn't guess where they pulled their particular data from. They do have maps and imaging that is provided uh, for the entire state of Connecticut and um, certainly recommend that municipalities across the state prepare, prepare and plan for projected sea level rise um, but I, you know, I think you would have to ask Circa themselves where they are obtaining all of their data. Understood. And thank you. I was just wondering, it's, uh, I'm on their website now. I've been for uh, five or 10 minutes just trying to find it because I, that, that's the first time I've heard uh, that type of number. And uh, but in any event, I appreciate your testimony. I'm in favor of giving municipalities uh, uh, options. Um, all the time. So if it's an opt-in proposal, I'm all for it. And uh, thank you very much for coming this morning. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Any questions for Senator Cohen? Seeing none. Thank you. Have thank fun you back so in much. Transportation. <laughs> Appreciate I'm it. watching it on the other screen. The next on my list, I have uh, Pasca Naden. Jennifer uh, not seeing her Jennifer Licht yes hello can you hear me yes okay great hi uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak today my name is Jennifer Licht and I'm speaking about house bill number 5009 uh, concerning the public safety of state parks in Connecticut I fully support this bill and I applaud the members who have proposed it I am a full-time resident of New Fairfield. I live about three miles down Route 39 from Squance Pond State Park. And I've lived here for about 25 years. Uh, I remember this being an issue. I know someone asked the question when, when my husband and I first moved here about 25 years ago. And I know at a certain point, you know, we had issues with traffic, um, people parking along Route 39, which was very unsafe. And I know at a certain point there were no parking signs put up, um, which did help. Now the situation we're in is where um, for a number of years, we've had people dropping off pedestrians when the park has reached full auto capacity. So as was mentioned, this is creating a very unsafe situation. People are dropping pedestrians all along Route 39, which is again, as uh, Mrs. Delmonico mentioned, a very narrow windy two lane road with no shoulder. Uh, or they're parking at Stop and Shop, which is sort of the closest big business <clears throat> with a parking lot. 
and they're walking over four miles to reach the state park. Um, I've personally seen pedestrians walking with children, coolers, chairs, and such, um, creating very unsafe situations for the pedestrians as well as for local drivers. You know, you throw in a couple of bike riders on a Saturday and you can imagine it's a mess. Um, it also makes it very difficult for emergency vehicles to access the area homes along the way, as well as the state park. Um, on another note, my three daughters are lifeguards and I know they, there have been many issues with staffing, lifeguard staffing um, at the state park. And due to the loud, cr large crowds um, there on the weekend, it's created unsafe situations in the park as well. Um, as Mrs. Delmonico mentioned, there have been many drownings. Um, so I just want to say that I fully support this bill, and I believe that the limiting the number of walk-ins will make conditions both inside and outside the park safer for everyone and certainly will be very beneficial to our town. And I thank you very much for having me today. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Any questions? Uh, Representative Callahan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just briefly, Ms. Lick, thank you uh, for uh, speaking out for uh, this bill and for your town and the effects uh, uh, it's had on traffic and safety in the town of New Fairfield. Uh, was there, was uh, there anything else you, you need to add? Has your neighborhood or community had it been impacted by the traffic, especially? Well, I, I live, as I said, about three miles down the road from the state park in a community that's just off of Route 39. And it has created this traffic situation getting in and out of our community, as well as cars attempting to come into local communities and you know, just making the, the traffic situation unsafe and making it difficult for me, you know, for residents to leave the community to go to the grocery store, to go wherever it is that you need to go because the roads are just simply clogged. And I appreciate that, you know, people are trying to access these parks, but and I do commend, as I know was mentioned, there have been the signage posted in and around our town, as well as I believe it's also posted on 684 and 84. Um, has been great. So, you know, you see a lot of times when you drive into town, okay, the state park is closed. Unfortunately, I guess people aren't heeding those signs or maybe hoping they can just park somewhere else. And again, it just, the whole thing just creates a mess, frankly, in our town. Well, thank you again for taking the time to testify and your, for your valuable words today. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. No problem. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for coming on. Uh, next, you. I have uh, Mike Noel. Thank you. In person. Please you know, state your name and proceed. You have three minutes. Okay, great. Well, it's great to be here in person as well, Chairman. Uh, Chairman Lopes, uh, Chairman Gresco, members of the committee, thank you for your time this morning. My name is Mike Noel. Uh, I'm a director of public affairs for Tamra. We are um, a company that provides a range of technology and services to Connecticut's container deposit refund system, or the bottle bill as it's known. We provide uh, reverse vending technology to grocery stores and redemption centers. We provide container pickup services on behalf of the beverage industry, and we process uh, the containers and broker them in bulk back to recyclers. Um, to some extent, I'm also representing our industry peer in VIPCO, who's based in Naugatuck, uh, who manufactures um, reverse vending machines in Naugatuck. Tom is based in Shelton. Um, and uh, today I'll uh, provide some brief comments on SB 895, uh, and I'll take the opportunity to share a little update on how bottle bill modernization is going so far. So um, first on SB 895, the bill proposes essentially waiving the labeling requirements on containers that are on the shelf as of December 31st um, of this year. Um, we feel like this is a reasonable uh, accommodation for the beverage industry. Uh, we wouldn't want to see containers unnecessarily wasted um, or, um, or full goods wasted just because they didn't have the right label for a transition period. Um, so we're, we're comfortable with that. Um, there will need to be a certain amount of public education um, so the public knows what the deposit value is at that time. Uh, the second aspect, the bill proposes excluding spirit-based hard seltzers. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, the legislature's call on which beverage categories are included or excluded of the bottle bill. Um, 
carbonated beverages and malt based hard seltzers are included in the law today. So um, if spirit based hard seltzers were to be excluded, we should expect a certain amount of confusion from the public. But that's where consumer education comes into play. Um, on the bottle bill modernization so far, there were three phases to the law that passed. Uh, the first phase was investing in the redemption system to make sure the public had convenient access to get their money back. Um, since 2021, June 2021, Connecticut has essentially doubled the number of redemption locations that are available to the Connecticut consumer. Um, this will have invested $11 million in additional handling fee revenue to retailers and redemption centers in the state in 2022 alone. Um, this created nine new redemption centers statewide, um, and it also created um, over 330 new retailers uh, participating in the deposit refund program. This includes uh, city underserved counties or cities like Waterbury, Hartford, Bridgeport, um, and New Haven. And uh, the second phase of redemption of the bottle bill modernization was making more beverages eligible for redemption that happened in January. We launched a website and a public education campaign with the Connecticut Food Association and DEEP. I'll just wrap up. Um, the website, if you want to check it out, is recyclingmakesensect.com. Um, and we're looking forward uh, and preparing for the next phase of expansion, which is, or modernization, which is increasing the deposit to 10 cents in January. Uh, happy to an answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Representative Gresco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, uh, real world scenario, um, the difference between a malt-based hard seltzer and a spirit-based hard seltzer is just how you program the barcode. There isn't going to be, as, from, as far as Tom, Tom was concerned, and I'm, I'm sure you could speak from the grocers on this, it, it, it's not like a, a tough delineation um, like the customer is going to have. The machine's going to know the difference, correct? Machines will know the difference. Okay. It depends on the UPC code that's programmed. Okay. And then uh, lastly, um, you had... Uh, given us some updates with some numbers. Um, uh, have you heard about the overall redemption rate percent coming up? Uh, we've been told it was hovering somewhere in the low 50s. And I'm wondering if um, over the past year with new redemption centers and an increased handling fee have more accessibility, whether or not you knew, and if you don't, that's cool, uh, if the overall redemption number is starting to tick up. So 2022's number is not out yet. Um, the overall redemption rate, this is the percentage of containers redeemed, of deposit containers sold that were redeemed. Um, 20, it did go up from 2020 to 2021 from 43% to 46%. Um, that had about six months of a handling fee increase. That being said, we don't expect an increase in the redemption rate um, in 2022 and not even in 2023 um, because the public's incentive to participate has not changed. It's still a five cent deposit. In fact, I would project that the redemption rate will go down this year because you're increasing the number of containers sold that carry a deposit. Um, and if the public is not aware that they even have a deposit on yet, then they may not be redeeming them. It's typical what we see in other states and countries that have expanded their deposit systems. We do expect it to increase um, next year. Um, in other states that have gone to 10 cents uh, have seen it increase from, well, say, let's say for Oregon, they went from 64% with a five cent deposit. And within three years, they went up to 86%. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Oh, Representative D'Amico. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Noel, for coming in and providing both written and uh, verbal testimony. I appreciate it. So I wanted to ask you, uh, since you did testify on on um, one of the uh, uh, bills on our agenda today, uh, uh, bill number 895, I'd like to ask you a question or two about that. Um, so, so um, uh, would you agree uh, that there were, that when the, the law, and I'm sure you're familiar with the law that was the, the changes that were made to the to the, the bottle bill uh, law back in, in 2021. I know you were involved in that. Would you agree that in the language there is no distinction made between um, be, between um, malt based uh, spirits? Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, malt. 
between uh, malt based um, and, and, and spirit based um, uh, items? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. Okay, so there was no distinction made there, and 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 uh, so so this so would it be fair to say that this legislation that's in front of us today, uh, Senate Bill eight ninety five, represents uh, a a change uh, to uh, what was uh, in the in the bill from twenty twenty one. Yeah, this bill uh, redefines beverage container to I, I believe exclude spirit based hard seltzers. And I think okay. the law passed in 2021 simply said hard seltzer is a beverage. So yes, that, that would be correct. Okay. So would you agree with the testimony of some other people who submitted written testimony, as well as some of the previous uh, verbal testimony that we heard this morning, that this would represent a step backward in that it would exclude some of these containers from the provisions of the, um, of, of, of the returnable law? I think it's for the legislature to determine what is considered progress or not. But what I can say is that containers that carry a deposit are, are up to four times more likely to be recycled. Um, so states that have no deposit have an average recycling rate of 22%. States that have a 10 cent deposit have an average of 88%. Okay. No, I, I appreciate that. So just one more time for clarity. So, so you would agree that, that, the, that the bill from 2021 makes no distinction between malt-based and spirit-based when it simply says hard cider, uh, hard seltzer and hard cider. That, that's correct. Okay. So this would be a significant change to the law. Yes. Okay. And, and again, as you point out, that, that's up to us to decide if it's a positive change or a negative change. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mr. Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Senator Hardy. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so you were involved with the process for this, this, this new chain or this new bottom bow that we have here today. Is that correct? The, we were involved in the discussions that happened in 2021, right. and, yes. And so the, the changes that are being proposed here that you're, you're testifying today, um, it was your understanding, and I think many within industry, um, many individuals that were part part of the bottle bill, interested parties, that this particular change that's being uh, presented to to, to this, this committee today for a public hearing was, was actually the understanding of, of, of what would what, what would be exempt. Is that correct? Um, no, not not uh, at the time. We when we saw the bill language came out in 2021, it said. Uh, a redefined beverage, including hard seltzers. And we took it that at face value. Um, and then this bill came out and says it excludes spirit-based hard seltzer. So that's, we're just reading the bills as they come out. I'm not aware of necessarily of, of additional discussions or negotiations that happen beyond that, but that, that may have, may, I just personally wasn't involved. Okay. And, and through you, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, were you involved or were you watching any of the um, discussions on, on the House or Senate floors in terms of legislative intent surrounding hard seltzers? Uh, n not that I can recall. Okay. So if there were legislative intent laid out either in the House or the Senate regarding this exemption, you wouldn't be aware of that? Is that, is that what you're saying? I'm not personally aware of legislative okay. intent. I've, I've heard... Um, the argument made on both sides that, you know, liquor was intended to be excluded. I've also heard the argument that um, hard seltzer was not mentioned uh, during the debate. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Any questions? Any further questions? And yes, this, uh, for ratification of those in the committee, this, this bill is a cleanup bill from last year uh, where we maybe got our circuits crossed and we're just trying to make a clarification and what may or may not have happened. But uh, Senator Harding, I think, got to the heart of it, and uh, I agree with his position. But thank you very much, Mr. Noel. Oh, po point of order, Mr. Chair. I, I would disagree with your characterization of it as a cleanup. I would suggest it is a change to the law wow. and a significant change to the law. Representative D'Amico. Yes, sir. That, that's not appropriate, sir. And be more than willing to talk to you later on about it. Any other questions for Mr. Noel? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I have Camille Riccoli. All right. Next would be Nancy Alderman. Okay, I've just unmuted myself, so I hope that's okay. 
Um, I'm here, I'm Nancy Alderman. I'm president of Environment and Human Health Inc., a group of 11 physicians and public health professionals. And I'm here to testify on two bills, the balloon bill and the EPR tire bill. I'd like to start with the balloon bill. We've heard a lot this morning and I'm not gonna go over the dangers that balloons uh, pose to the environment and to the marine life, but I would like to talk about helium. Helium, you cannot create helium. Helium is a finite resource. We need helium for MRIs. We need helium for space uh, exploration. We need helium for other medical devices. Helium is a precious commodity. We should not be filling balloons with helium. You have to mine for helium. So this is a, a big deal. And, and a lot of discussion on this bill went this morning that I listened to, how do we tell people not to put balloons in the air once they're filled? How do we deal with it? There's an easy way to deal with it. We should not be filling balloons with helium. If they are not filled with helium, they cannot go into the air and they will not pollute and harm uh, wildlife. So um, I, it's actually, as you think about it, it's crazy that we are using helium to simply blow up balloons. So I'm recommending, we are recommending that you ban helium in helium filled balloons and then your problem will be solved and they can blow up balloons using what we all used to use, our own air. Moving on to the EPR tire bill. The tire bill, I'm, we are very sympathetic to the fact that you have to get rid of tires. It's a huge problem. It always has been a problem. And we've been working on shredded tires for 15 years and the dangers of shredded tires. This bill has no provision in it to protect the public's health from shredded tires. Nowhere does it say in the bill that you can't shred up tires and put them where children play, or you can't put them in uh, synthetic turf fields, nor does it say that they should not be used for mulch. We know that shredded tires, even though they sell mulch in big back I'm stores, so your, your they time actually- is up if you can- I'm sorry. If you could summarize, please. Oh, sure. Yeah. Summary, uh, tires can be dangerous and it's very, critical that a bill have where and where not they can be used. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Alderman? Uh, Representative Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. I'm, I'm glad you raised the important information regarding helium. I know they're currently saying there's a shortage of that. Um, I was curious, in the discussion before, somebody brought up the prospect of biodegradable balloons. Do you have any information or knowledge on that that you could share? Well, two things. No, I don't. However, um, you're still using helium. I mean, it doesn't get rid of that. This precious resource is still going into balloons. And the other issue is when something is said it's biodegradable, it doesn't biodegrade this moment or when it lands in Long Island Sound, it doesn't biodegrade that moment. It, turn, it still will turn into microplastics, into smaller things before it degrades, still has plenty of time for our fish and mammals to eat them, and, and still uh, has plenty of time for birds to ingest them. It also doesn't get rid of the strings. And there was a lot of testimony this morning about strings. So as I said, there is really one way to solve this problem, Just, you know, really. And that is to stop allowing a precious resource, helium, to be put in balloons in the first place. If you do that, you will not have any of the other problems that so many people have talked about today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Any questions? Oh, I think I see someone. Representative Dubitsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for coming in to discuss this issue. Um, do you have any uh, 
authoritative information that there's some worldwide shortage of helium? Um, I just know that occasionally they talk about the fact that um, there are two countries that have helium that mainly have it. One is the United States, the other is Russia. And today I, we have a morning email that goes out every morning. And my morning email was that the Navajo Nation uh, has just said you can't mine for helium on our reservation. The, the United States continues to look for helium because it's becoming more and more valuable as more and more people need MRIs, more and more people need um, need uh, medical uh, things that all take helium. The space uh, exploration all needs helium. So what we do know is you have to mine for it and we have to get approval of mines uh, to get it. So it's still cheap enough that a vendor on the street can spend his day filling up balloons with it. I I guess at the moment it is, and that's really terrible. <laughs> that's not good. It's so not. Rather good. it be more expensive. I'd rather that that there's no need to put helium in balloons. There is no need for that. You have to sort of figure what are the needs, and we just listened all morning long to so many people talk about the problems with balloons, and yet no one really has an answer how you're gonna stop it. You can legislate, okay, you can't release them. That probably won't stop it. Um, people won't know it, they won't pay attention to it. Who's going to come in and find them? If I'm having a birthday party and I buy 50 balloons, who's going to come to my backyard and say, okay, you have to pay $35? It isn't going to happen. So there is a way to get at it. And there is a way to solve our natural resources. And the way is people should blow up balloons with natural air, not helium. Okay, so if we ban using helium in balloons, um, don't you think people are going to use other things? Like yeah, they'll use, there is, a, the only other thing that's lighter than air is helium. So anything hydrogen. else is not going to fly. How about hydrogen? I, I guess I, I don't know what a balloon would be like with hydrogen. I'm sorry. Well, I, That's beyond my pay grade. I'm very sorry. Well, the, the Hindenburg was filled with hydrogen, if I, if I recall. Yes, um, so it definitely I, was, I but I'm not see. sure. In, in, in a pardon a store that they have hydrogen. I think it's flammable, isn't it? I mean, the thing blew up. So I, I don't think party stores are going to fill balloons with hydrogen. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Alderman? Not seeing any. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank uh, you for having me. Oh, always. Next on the list, uh, Doug Bedard. Representative Gresko, my name is Tom Straley. Uh, I was inserted in his position uh, with Pepsi Bristol, Connecticut, to comment on this bill. May I begin? Uh, just say your name again, please. Tom Straley. I was listed as number 55, and they traded my position. Uh, and I'm with Pepsi in Bristol, Connecticut. Okay. Clerk, give me the thumbs up. Go ahead. Uh, minutes, I'm, I'm here to testify in support of raised bill 895 with amendments to clarify definitions and requirements for the state's bottle bill, most recently amended in 2021. Well, I'm here on behalf of Pepsi Bristol. My comments mirror those which have been submitted by the American Beverage Association and will uh, encompass the entirety of what I say with more backup. My comments are gonna focus on section two uh, of the legislation and relate to the labeling of beverage containers in the bottle bill deposit system. First, we would like to see put into law or codified uh, the, the order issued by DEEP on August 2nd, 2022, which expanded the allowable definition or label indications for refund value on beverage containers. The additional options simplify compliance. We would like to clarify the labeling exemptions for containers already produced 
and in our inventory. The bill exempts containers in dealers inventory or retailers currently, and we would like to add the distributor inventory also. There are over 600 SKUs that have been added to the bottle bill or in the bottle bill now, some of which are slow movers and we, we without the exemption, we're gonna have to throw them out. This change would permit certain containers in dealer inventory and distributor inventory to be sold and redeemed without the required labels, therefore preventing products being pulled from shelves and possibly destroyed. Uh, because the SK unit, SKU unit is the indicator, uh, these would be charged the nickel or the dime when it occurs in January. And they're also uh, serviceable by the reverse vendors. Finally, regarding section three of the legislation, we are supportive of any measure that would return more of the unclaimed deposits to the distributors to defray the expenses that have been added to the bottle bill. While we in support the intent of section three of the bill to allow distributors to retain two calendar quarters worth of unredeemed deposits to build up cash reserves prior to the implementation of the 10 cent deposit, we believe more comprehensive solution is required will be advocating for an accelerated and complete transfer of the unclaimed deposits. Mr. Uh, like thank I, you, committee. Your timer went off. Any, any summary or any questions? Uh, Mr. D'Amico. Thank you much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, may I be permitted to ask uh, Mr. Strahl uh, a question about section one of the bill that he just testified on? You may, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So am I pronouncing your name correct? Is it Mr. Stra Tom Straley. Straley. Mr. Straley. Mr. Straley. So I, I, I appreciate your comments on the other sections of the bill. I would like to direct your attention to section one of 895, if I could. Um, uh, so so th this, th this section um, um, uh, purports uh, to, to make a distinction between spirit-based beverages or canned cocktails as opposed to the malt-based. Um, um, are you familiar with the legislation from 2021? I, I presume you are familiar with the legislation from I, 2021. I am, and, and my recollection, uh, it, it, because it didn't apply to me, wasn't uh, something I assimilated in its entirety. Uh, okay. We're strictly in the non-alcoholic business. I see. I, okay. as, as Betsy Bobler and the Lipton teas and everything else that we sell, uh, none of which are applicable to the alcohol. Okay, so, so you wouldn't wanna offer an opinion as to whether the legislation from 2021 makes a distinction between malt-based and spirit-based. I, I don't have the bill in front of me and it's out of my traffic lane. Very I, good. I'd probably get in an accident if I commented. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Strally. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Um, we are up to Amy Patterson, Connecticut Land. I'm here. Can you see me? We can hear you now. Please Terrific. Proceed. I did turn my camera on. I hope you can see me as well. Good afternoon. Here I am. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, and distinguished members of the Environment Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to present testimony today. For the record, I'm Amy Blamore patterson and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Land Conservation Council. CLCC is the umbrella organization for Connecticut's land conservation community, working most predominantly to support the state's 130 or so land trusts. We have submitted testimony in support of five bills, and we've also submitted general comments regarding two others. Um, all of these are extremely important bills and your leadership in raising them is so much appreciated. I'm gonna use my time to summarize my testimony regarding HB 6483 in strong support for bonding for the Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Grant Program or OSWA. Thank you again for raising this bill uh, this year again. In addition to wearing my CLCC hat, uh, regarding HB 6483, I'm also here on behalf of the State Recreation, Natural Heritage, and Open Space and Watershed Land Acquisition Review Board, for which I serve as co-chair along with Eric Hamerling. 
As you likely know, Connecticut has set a goal of conserving 21% of the state's land base by 2023. Of that 21%, the state is charged with conserving 10%, land trust municipalities and water companies 11%. Since the goal was set in statute in 1998, we have been estimating how many acres are needed to get there. And every year, those estimates rise as the state falls farther and farther behind. It's 2023, and we are not nearly on pace to meet the 21 percent goal. And to put how far behind we are in perspective, according to the Council on Environmental Quality, at the state's current pace of land conservation, it will take 65 years to meet its share of the goal of 10 percent. And there are other cal calculations suggesting that to meet the overall goal, it would take the state 80 years. So with the state being significantly behind behind, the role of the conservation partners, that is the land trust municipalities and water companies, is essential. And the OSWA matching grant program is key to their efforts. It's important to note that the OSWA program also includes the urban green and community garden program for targeted and distressed communities. Yet after a robust start, which includes from 1998 to 2001, offering grant rounds twice a year as required by statute, the program went to once a year and due to inconsist inconsistencies in funding, DEEP was forced to cancel rounds twice and award far less than the maximum percentage authorized by statute. This unpredictability in both availability and the level of funding deters landowners and new applicants from seeking grants out of concern that there will not be sufficient funds in the next round, leaving many exceptional projects on the table. So to ensure consistent annual bond funding will mean that the OSWA program will be successful. And I wanna mention uh, one other point. All said, with the challenges we have now in meeting state conservation goals comes an opportunity. There are several existing and new federal programs that land trust communities may tap into as a source of matching funds. Um, right, your your timer went off. Oh, it did, I'm so sorry. That's no, so better already. I was trying to let you finish. Oh, well, thank you. So, so to raise the level of funding and make sure that it's consistent will allow us to leverage those funds. And I just wanted to reference my testimony asking for that technical correction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony and joining us. Um, John Sheeran. Good morning. Good morning. Chair Lopez, Chair Gresco, and distinguished members of the Joint Environment Committee. My name is John Sheeran. And I am testifying today on behalf of the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association in support of House Bill 6486. The U.S. Tire Manufacturers is the National Trade Association representing 12 major tire manufacturers that produce tires here in the United States. USTMA members appreciate the opportunity to provide our views regarding HB 6486. I'd like to address why the program envisioned by the bill will address Connecticut's scrap tire management needs including problems with illegally dumped tires. In 2015, USTMA conducted a review of scrap tire management in New England, and we shared this study with the Tired Stewardship Symposium sponsored by Connecticut D. The study showed that while tire stockpiles had been eliminated from the state, there were no existing markets to consume scrap tires in Connecticut. The Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management process convened in 2020 by DEEP, identified concerns with small scale illegal scrap tire dumping. These are exactly the two issues HB 6486 is designed to address. Many states have programs to grow scrap tire markets by conducting research and implementing grant programs to grow scrap tire markets. Robust markets are important as they create a demand that pulls tires through the scrap tire system. USTMA supports HB 6486 and its systems for managing scrap tires. We've had the privilege of working collaboratively across the scrap tire value chain to help craft this bill's concepts. This bill is tailored to address unique aspects of the tire industry, utilize the best practices that we have seen across the country, and develop a working consensus to solve the twofold problems of lack of markets and miscellaneous illegal dumping. In practice, market development helps industry to take necessary steps to move scrap tire recycling into the future. Both Utah and Tennessee have fees specifically dedicated to market development, and we've seen progress in Utah 
in handling difficult to recycle off the road tires, for example. And we've seen a nascent market for rubber modified asphalt grow in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. States with more wide ranging fees have also dedicated funding to market development, which is why we in the US have reduced stockpiles by over 95% and moved our beneficial use rate for scrap tires from 11% in 1990 to about 71% today. Your, 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 time, your time is up. Um, Thank you. Uh, Representative Gresco. Thank you. Why is this, what are we having to me? Shirley. Yes. Turn the mic off. Sorry. OK, take two. Uh, John, uh, thank you for A, uh, your testimony, and B, for the, um, uh, the industry's uh, willingness to have a conversation on how we transition to an EPR program. Um, and I had a question as far as when I go in to get my four new tires, well, for me, two new tires, um, what happens to the fee I'm already paying um, for for disposal? Because the way I'm reading your piece of legislation, there would be another uh, $2 or potentially $3 fee um, attached to, to this. Retailers use the existing charge collected on uh, tires left at their stores for the processing, the collection, storage, and processing of the scrap tires they receive when they sell new tires. So why can't you use that money? Well, that money is used for the collection, storage, and processing of the scrap tires. And we are advocating for a market development program in addition to a grant program for uh, illegal dumping that would uh, make whole uh, municipalities and resource recovery agencies that have to deal with the miscellaneous illegal dumping. It seems to, well, there's gonna be a lot of uh, negotiation as we uh, go forward on this, but it seems to be it, treating the symptom and not necessarily uh, the, the underlying uh, issue. And um, my other question is in your 76% um, rate that you're uh, quoting for recycling, does that include uh, shredding and then burning them? Markets for scrap tires in the United States include tire-derived fuel, where the tires are combusted in, for example, pulp and paper mill boilers, where the vast, vast majority of Connecticut tires uh, go today. In the United States, uh, some states, some regions, use scrap tires as uh, synthetic turf infill, as mulch, as rubber modified asphalt, which we see as the best uh, short-term market for uh, scrap tires. And there are many other markets for scrap tires as well. I would agree with you in, in the um, rubber modified asphalt as, as uh, uh, the best short-term um, destination for the second market here, and, and I will be engaging our new DOT commissioner uh, to see what the likelihood of expanding our pilot program here in the state uh, um, would be. So for with that, you do have uh, uh, my commitment to um, see if we can't get you uh, an end use uh, market here in the state of, of Connecticut. So John, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Representative O'Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you, sir, for your testimony. I, I didn't get a chance to go through all of it. And I'm sorry, I'm jumping between this meeting um, and transportation and back and forth uh, asking questions. So I, I apologize if I'm a bit repetitive. Uh, and Mr. Chair, I'll try not to do that. My, um, my understanding is that tires are some of the most recycled uh, consumer products in the country. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Uh, scrap tires are recycled more than paper, plastic, aluminum, other metals, and uh, only automotive batteries have a higher recycling rate uh, among consumer products. And um, what percent of the um, 
unrecycled uh, tires are actually dumped. Do you know, is there studies out there on that? Well, we've tried to collect data on that and we've heard estimates of well under 1% uh, of the generation is illegally dumped. Uh, we'd love to see more data on that, but it's a, a very, very small amount that is, I mean, too many, but still a very small amount that is actually miscellaneous illegal dumped. Uh, in contrast, almost uh, the vast, vast majority of consumers leave their scrap tires at retailers who then try to assure that they are recycled and properly disposed unless they get uh, raided by uh, illegal scrap tire dump th dumping thieves. Um, other than the asphalt, <clears throat> um, other than using uh, rubber mod modified asphalt and, and using these tires in the end use for asphalt, which by the way, Mr. Chair, I, I think you and I both recall um, the uh, the commissioner of DMV in previous years, not the current one, mentioning that they were going to increase the amount of uh, rubberized uh, modified asphalt because it was, it was obviously a good use for the rubber and it also was actually a good end asphalt. But other than that, what are some other types of end uses you see for tires that that might be beneficial. Molded and extruded products where the um, ground tire rubber is used to make a whole variety of mats and pavers and artificial landscaping, uh, stonework, for example, uh, is an excellent market for scrap tires. And we saw a lot of growth in that market in uh, the, the stretch between 2019 and 2021. Um, Tire-derived aggregate used in civil engineering construction projects, such as stormwater infiltration galleries, which actually clean the water as it flow through, flows through those uh, materials, is a second uh, market that beneficially utilizes scrap tires. Uh, there's many markets that could utilize scrap tires with that, that we don't see in Connecticut. Uh, moving further down the road, there's the prospect of pyrolysis or devulcanization that on an industrial scale could utilize vast quantities of scrap tires as well. Um, what, are the, what are the other states are using the EPR programs for tires? That's a, an excellent question, uh, Representative, o, Representative O'Day. And the answer is none. No other state in the US uses an EPR program for tires. So Connecticut would really be going rogue uh, vastly different from the whole rest of the country uh, should an EPR program be implemented in, in this state. Do you have an opinion or do you know why the other states don't have any EPR program for tires? I do. Generally speaking, the free market shared responsibility system that we began establishing in the United States back in 1990 has worked demonstrably very effectively. First and foremost, eliminating the uh, over 1 billion scrap tires and stockpiles that was the initial impetus uh, to regulate scrap tire management, and then further creating a recycling market that is now uh, leading the country in terms of consumer materials being recycled. So uh, while miscellaneous illegal dumping uh, is, is a troubling aspect that basically requires enforcement and the licensing of transporters, um, steps that Connecticut has declined uh, to pursue, uh, the free market shared responsibility system we have in the United States has been considered very effective across the country, even in California. And how would 6486 address the recycling problem or dumping problem that uh, the EPR seeks to try and fix? The um, dumping problem would be addressed by a grant program that would be uh, provided to municipalities or resource recovery agencies to make them whole so that they don't have to bear, continue bearing the cost of that miscellaneous illegal dumping. Uh, the other 75% of the funds, the net funds, the net proceeds raised by the bill would be used for market development. And what 
Connecticut really needs is markets that will consume those scrap tires and pull them through the recycling system. I, I was, so one of the, I, I totally agree with those people that have testified here today about the, these, these old tires being in rivers, but I, I Googled how other states have done it. And, and what was shocking to me is were tires actually used intentionally dumped in rivers for re, for for uh, environmental reasons, to your knowledge? Um, I, I think I know the uh, direction that this question goes. Tires at one time going back into the early 70s were used uh, to, in the development of marine reefs offshore in some states like Florida or Washington. They were used for erosion control along river banks. And sometimes uh, after 40, 50 years, those projects can fail and those tires could wash into the river. Uh, some people think that tires provide structure for fish. So maybe they throw them off the end of their pier in the hope that fish will nest there and then they'll be able to catch them. Uh, we, we have been uh, avoiding that type of practice and do not believe that tires should be put in the water. Yeah, I was I was shocked when I read that that uh, but um so um if you basically my question is why why would we do the arguments for EPR versus um um 6486 and again I want to reiterate to the chair I I generally as he as he stated we look for bipartisan resolution and compromise between uh, different groups that come in seeking legislation. Why do you believe ultimately 6486 in, in a sentence or two would be better than an EPR program? 6486 addresses the key problems that Connecticut is facing in a very tailored way. Market development, which EPR does not address in any way, shape or form, and miscellaneous illegal dumping, which again is not addressed by an EPR program. And the fact that we'd be the only state doing it causes me concern. Okay, well, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your time. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Representative Gresko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, if, if what you're saying uh, to us here, uh, John, um, have you worked with any of the municipalities um, in the state of Connecticut to come up with a plan that you submitted this, this uh, grant and um, uh, plan? Uh, because uh, they're banging my uh, email off the hook saying it's a multi-thousand dollar problem um, for every municipality um, in the state. Uh, have you worked with them? We have uh, participated in the Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management meetings as uh, basically as an observer, we're not allowed to, to present or to speak at these kind of meetings, but we've listened very carefully. We've also uh, collected data uh, to some degree with uh, certain resource recovery agencies. So we've had um, modest communications with uh, municipalities on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to uh, stop. Yes, I saw. Uh, Representative Michelle, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, have a question uh, uh, for um, the witness is, do other countries have an EPR uh, program for tires such as Canada? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Representative Michelle. Um, many uh, other countries have EPR programs for a wide variety of materials. We just don't think that it would be uh, optimal or applicable to a single state in the US. Thank you, that's all Mr. Chair, thank you very much. No problem, any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Um, next, I believe we have Jason Patlas. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Co-Chair Gresco, Co-Chair Lopez, uh, Madam 
Vice Chair, Ranking Members, and members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify uh, this afternoon. Uh, I, uh, we've submitted uh, written testimony for the record, uh, so my oral testimony will be brief. Uh, on three bills uh, that the committee is considering in this hearing, 6480 on the old grass, uh, we are doing that testimony jointly with the Beardsley Zoo. Uh, 6481 on helium balloons, we're doing that jointly with Beardsley as well as Mystic Aquarium and then 6484 on horseshoe crabs, uh, also jointly with Beardsley. And just quickly on each of the three, on eelgrass, it's a critical habitat in Long Island Sound. I'll just give you one stat to think about. Right now, uh, there's 1,465 there's 1, acres of eelgrass. The Long Island Sound study has a goal of 3,895 acres of eelgrass by 2035. That's a big goal. We need a collaborative effort to get to that goal. Uh, this working group will help us achieve that. Uh, on uh, balloon release, um, we are all very supportive of that. I think there's nothing for any of us who've been on the sound, uh, on the water, there's nothing more heartbreaking than having a beautiful day with the Long Island Sound and horizon in front of you disturbed by a colorful group of balloons that's floating in the middle of the water. And this bill will help address that. In fact, we would uh, strongly support that the 24 hour period and 10 minimum number of balloons be um, excluded and any intentional release of helium balloons really be what the uh, bill uh, proposes. And then horseshoe crabs, lastly, it's a critical species, it's an indicator species. A lot of other species depend on horseshoe crabs. Uh, it's a declining population across the Eastern seaboard for reasons. Uh, related to the pharmaceutical business. It's decreasing as well in Long Island Sound for more local reasons. Uh, banning the harvest of horseshoe crabs will help immediately uh, turn that population trend around for the positive. Um, that's a quick summary. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, I had a quick question myself is, um, how is your, how is uh, Norwalk um, Maritime uh, doing with their horseshoe crab um, repopulation effort. How are the little suckers doing? So we have we have several initiatives underway re relating to horseshoe crabs. One is uh, cultivation in our aquarium facilities, and that's going amazingly well. We've got a lot of new research that we will look to publish in the next couple of months in terms of how to cultivate horseshoe crabs from the time they hatch. They hatched at the Maritime Aquarium three years ago. Uh, three years in, they're the size of my thumbnail. Uh, so they're still very small. Um, and, uh, you know, we're learning a lot about what baby horseshoe crabs take in, in cultivation. Um, that's one initiative. The other initiative that's really, really important for the population, we're doing this with federal funding. Um, we're removing abandoned lobster traps and derelict lobster traps from Long Island Sound. Cornell has estimated a million traps across New York and Connecticut waters. Uh, over 10 years, they've retrieved about 20,000 lobster of traps. Uh, thanks to partnership with DEEP and partnerships among the environmental community, uh, Project Oceanology and Save the Sound in particular, we've started a new effort with federal funding. And just in a couple of trips, we've, uh, we've pulled up about 170, almost 200 traps, uh, you know, which means that there's a lot more out there. So. Maritime Aquarium uh, is leading a number of major initiatives for horseshoe crabs. Your bill uh, to, uh, to prohibit the harvest of them will help our conservation efforts. Thank you, Jason. It's a fun day to go out there and, and, and um, fish those traps uh, yep. out of Long Island Sound. Does anyone have any questions or, or comments? Seeing none, Jason, thank you again for the, the testimony and we'll see you soon. And thank you for the support of you and thank you for the support of the committee on, on these important initiatives. We're here to help. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Shirley McCarthy, followed by uh, Shahil Cantasaria. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Affirmative. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me. My name is Dr. Shirley McCarthy. I'm a retired professor from the Yale School of Medicine, and I'm here to support bill number 122, an act concerning the replanting of trees in public areas cleared by utility companies with caveats. So background, 
The medical literature contains many studies on the human health value of roadside greenness, i.e. trees, which I'll cite shortly. The resultant healthcare costs of the extensive roadside loss of trees, i.e. vegetation management resilience projects could actually be in the millions. The utilities need to change this practice, not only due to the health issues, but also due to our need to mitigate climate change and support wildlife. North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. The planet has lost 70% of its vertebrate wildlife and insects are going extinct at eight times the high vertebrate extinction rate, all human caused. As you all know, insects are the basis of our food chain. If they go, we go. So I do support the replanting of trees, native only, however, since native species support insects and birds and other wildlife. But I just want to make it clear that this bill should not be an endorsement of the current level of vegetation management, which I think needs to be curtailed, because there is no substitute for a mature oak. Up to 2,300 species are known to be associated with an oak, and it is also a major carbon sink, over 500 pounds per year. So I'm just going to cite some of the evidence in the literature. Uh, one review cited the wide range of benefits of trees, including reduced UV, air pollution related respiratory disease, heat stress, improved cognition, attention, mood and mental health, better birth outcomes, immune functioning, cardiovascular function, weight status, and decreased neighborhood crime. A study in the American Heart Association recently showed that residential greenness is associated with lower levels of blood levels of factors that indicate cardiovascular risk. More street lined trees, less heart attacks. Another study, and we're an aging population in Connecticut, showed that. Early, yes. The, uh, can you wrap up, please? Yes. Okay. So decreased cognitive decline, yada, yada. And just another financial study estimated total annual air pollution removal. By urban trees across 55 U.S. cities is 700,000 or more metric tons, representing 3.8 billion in public value. So the bottom line is we need more trees, not less trees. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Shirley. I think the majority of us here would agree that uh, more trees are uh, a better thing. But let me just pose this quick question to you, if you have a second. Um, yeah. Despite despite robust uh, profits, uh, how do you or would we deal with the with the fallout if if um, the the um, industry the the utilities say that they wanted to charge ratepayers an additional uh, amount of money to to make this happen? Well, if it comes to that, I suppose it's worth it given the benefits, but the utilities make a ton of money. I don't believe they should be for profit when they're such a vital surface, uh, service. That's number one. The other thing is if they underground long-term, they don't have to cut down all these trees on both sides of the street. Uh, and they also always cite that well, 90% of power outages are due to trees falling down. Well, I actually went back and tried to find the literature that they were citing that says that it doesn't exist. They cite some pamphlet that they hand out to homeowners, but I've never seen a scientific paper that has shown that 90% of outages is due to trees. Shirley, again, thank you for your testimony. Does anyone have any other questions or, or comments? Seeing none, even on Zoom. Uh, again, Shirley, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to go to Shahil Cantasaria, followed by uh, Matt Knickerbocker. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, can you boost your audio a little bit, please? Yeah. Let me just get a little closer to the mic. Is this All any right. better? Yep. That's good to go. All right. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Lopes and Representative Gresco in the Environment Committee. My name is Sahil Canisaria, and I'm the principal owner of Central Connecticut Redemption Center in the lovely city of New Britain, Connecticut. I've actively been involved in the Redemption Center industry for the past 20 years, and most recently in the crafting of the legislative updates to the bottle bill in the past few legislative sessions. 
I'm here to speak in opposition of Senate Bill 895. First, I'd like to thank the legislators and the Environment Committee's leadership on the increase in handling fee that redemption centers have finally received after 30 plus years without an increase. The three and a half cent increase has given our independent redemption centers a fighting chance to continue to serve the customers and communities while at the same time allowing us to address the increases in operating costs associated with the inflation and other pandemic related inconveniences. The modernization of the bottle bill expands the types of containers in the program, which now includes juices, teas, coffees, sports drinks, and of course, hard seltzers and ciders. But we are seeing frustration because Redemption Center owners have to turn away certain containers mistakenly returned with the assumption they are part of the program. If deep in the industry can't agree on what's included in the expansion, how is the public expected to be aware of what should be covered? The recent debate on spirit-based hard seltzers is causing many operational issues at redemption centers. In particular, we are seeing thousands of cans of high noon vodka seltzers daily, which are being deposited in the trash instead of being redeemed. We feel these products should be included in the bill to avoid any further confusion with our customer base. The current law does not define what the alcohol content makeup of a hard seltzer is. Therefore, we should not be granting the liquor industry a doorway out from their EPR responsibilities. In the main bottle bill, these same liquor distributors have 15 cent deposits on these high noon containers. Another matter of great concern, which could make the bill we're discussing and the bottle bill program a moot point. We wrote to Commissioner Dykes in the summer of 2022, expressing our significant concern over the language found in Section 9 of Public Act Number 21-58, an act concerning the solid waste management. As we pointed out, when the bill was being crafted in 2021, Section 9 is causing uncertainty in the industry. If not addressed, we'll bring the demise of the independent redemption centers in the state of Connecticut. The language found in the Act for the stewardship model does not allow for operation of an independent redemption center in Connecticut. This poses a great dilemma in the industry, which is halting critical upgrades needed at redemption centers and stopping the expansion efforts of new redemption centers throughout Connecticut. Independent redemption owners cannot take the financial risk of opening new centers with a dark cloud looming around the corner of a shutdown of their center under a stewardship program run by large beverage companies such as Coke and Pepsi. Recent Thank activity you, at- Can you wrap it up, please? Yes. You know, three minutes. Yep, yep. Recent activity at Deep has clearly shown a situation where certain parties are not complying with statute, that any further action by Deep concerning a beverage stewardship container organization or any plan under the statute are completely unauthorized. In closing, the Independent Redemption Centers of Connecticut are asking members in the Environment Committee to ensure adequate resources for DEEP to educate public on the expansion of the new container types and the eventual change from 5 to 10 cents in January 2024. Finally, we implore you to address the uncertainty and chaos being caused by Section 9 and Public Act 21-58. Thank you. Shield, thank you for your uh, testimony. A uh, point taken on uh, section nine, it is, um, uh, on the radar screen. Uh, does anyone have any questions or, uh, comments here in 2B? Um, uh, representative, uh, D'Amico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, Shahil, thank you for coming to testify and thank you for always uh, giving us good information in past years as well as this year. So I was wondering if you could just uh, explain in a little more detail the 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 uh, the, the problem with Section Nine uh, that that you were that 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 you just Section Nine of of the legislation from 2021 that you were just referencing. Sure. Well, so uh, to summarize, what Section Nine is trying to accomplish is to allow the state of Connecticut to have basically Big Beverage or the ABA in charge of the entire deposit redemption program. So they would essentially take away the independence of our redemption centers and run the entire state program with minimal oversight from deep or the state. They essentially own all the unclaimed nickels and they own all the redemption outlets. Uh, we can't have that happen in Connecticut. That would basically destroy all these small business owners and all the expansion efforts that are taking place with the funding that all of us redemption centers have used and the $5 million grant fund that was also instituted back in 2021, which will be uh, deployed this summer. Okay. And, and, and could you speak in a little more detail about the, the, the July 1st uh, um, uh, uh, timeframe that, again, that you referenced uh, here and, and in your written testimony? Sure. Yeah. So the, the language contained in Section 9 uh, contemplated that DEEP approve a stewardship organization that meets the specified criteria 
by July 1st, on or before July 1st of 2022. To date, there are no stewardship organizations that have been approved by DEEP. So at this point, the redemption centers feel that the process has been abused in critical ways in which DEEP and the American Beverage Association have acted outside the authority granted to them and the General Assembly's limited grant of authority and have failed to meet the applicable statutory conditions and deadlines. Okay, thank you for that. And then uh, to, to, to go back to what you uh, mentioned earlier with regards to uh, the, uh, the, the, the bill in front of us, uh, eight, um, uh, 895 having to do with um, the spirit-based and malt-based um, beverages and so forth. So I, I asked this question of a couple other uh, testifiers and I, I will ask you, uh, 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 I, I know that you're familiar with the bill from two years ago. Yep. Um, so did that bill make any distinction between malt-based and spirit-based as far as you, you, you know? From my knowledge and my interpretation of the bill, uh, it clarifies that hard seltzers are included in the bill. It does not specify what makes up a hard seltzer. So a hard seltzer can be made up of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, beer, alcohol, okay. spirits, gin. Uh, it's by the definition of law, it should be in the bottle bill. Okay. So, so all of these items should be, as, based on what you're saying, all these items should be in the bottle bill, um, um, regardless of whether they are malt-based or spirit-based. That is, that's correct. They're made okay. of the same exact aluminum can. I think they're okay. actually produced so what, by the same manufacturer. So in your view, would it be fair to say that bill, that, that section one of bill 895 that's in front of us uh, today um, uh, represents a significant change to what was passed in, uh, in the year 2021? I believe it does. I believe we're going backwards. I think what the bill attended in 2021 was expanding to more container types. I think the Senate bill 895 in the current year is actually removing containers that are in the, the bill, in the current bill. Okay. Thank, thank you, Shahil. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative uh, uh, D'Amico. Uh, Representative Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for testifying today. Um, your knowledge is definitely very helpful. Um, I was curious, this might sound like kind of a stupid question, but it is a serious one. Is, is there any logistical difference between a spirit-based beverage and a non-spirit-based beverage? Meaning, is there any problem handling these containers differently? No, we, we would handle the containers uh, the same way that we handle the malt-based containers. The only difference would be uh, the distribution chain that picks those products up from the redemption centers. Okay, because I'm just trying to make sense as to why we would be carving out certain types of beverages based on what the alcohol is uh, made of. And do you know of any other um, bottles or containers where something like that is done? No, I believe it, the, the carve outs only in this, uh, the alcohol space. I don't think there are any other carve outs in the, uh, the non-alcohol space. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Chafee. Uh, seeing no other hands, raised in the room or in Zoom. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have uh, Matt Knickerbocker, uh, followed by followed by um, Jenny and Jones. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before your esteemed committee today. Uh, I, am, I find myself in the unusual position of testifying against a bill, which is uh, namely HB 6486, uh, EPR for tires, although I want to uh, basically put myself in the same position as Mayor Luke Bronin. We are strongly in favor of EPR programs for tires. However, the language of this bill is not acceptable. Um, without going into the detail of the testimony that I've already submitted in written form, this bill does not address prevention of disposed tires being winding their way into the uh, waste stream inappropriately, uh, polluting rivers and streams, which is a problem. And uh, it's been said that uh, we need to create a bill that uh, addresses uh, building markets. That's a completely separate issue than providing a convenient manner for uh, consumers to dispose of tires. What we're looking for would be found in last year's bill, HB 5139, which creates a stewardship program that's supported as a nonprofit 
by the industry. And the whole point of an EPR bill is for industry to take its share of responsibility of the end of life of, of the product. So I'm going to uh, reiterate that uh, on behalf of cost and other organizations, we oppose the language of this bill, but we do would very, very much like to see this language change and, uh, and support a, a true EPR program for tires, which this bill is not. Uh, I will leave the rest to you to uh, for the reading the testimony that I've submitted. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And um, being on the C C C M, C C uh, being on that board, uh, yeah. um, um, had over the last few months, uh, did you engage with the uh, tire industry in, in um, uh, any of their uh, meetings? Uh, uh, did you engage with them um, concerning uh, whether or not they attended the meeting? Was there any interaction um, going on? Uh, to the best of my knowledge in our EPR working group meetings, uh, I, I, a member of the industry was uh, present as an observer. I do not recall them uh, speaking. Uh, there's always public input, uh, whether you're an industry member or a member of the public or a municipality or a state legislator. Anybody who, uh, there's always public input at the, during those meetings. I do not recall anybody engaging us uh, from the industry. I, I, I can't say for sure that they they did not, but I don't recall if they did. It, it does not come to mind. No, sir. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, next, we have a question from uh, Representative O'Day. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, sir, for your testimony. Just wondering why you don't think, why, why do you believe no other state uses an EPR program um, if you know, well, I, I, I don't know, but, uh, in as much as I personally, I don't think that should su surprise anybody. The United States lags the rest of the world in EPR in general. Uh, we far, we are far behind Europe, far behind Asia, um, behind Canada, which, uh, even though, uh, Canada does not have a national program, uh, their provinces one by one are adopting uh, programs. So I would not look at the lack of an EPR program for tires as uh, evidence that we don't need one. Uh, when I look at the studies uh, that show uh, river pollution, uh, contamination of fish and other wildlife in rivers and streams being directly linked to uh, rubber runoff uh, from uh, improperly discarded tires, I see a need to help with the prevention of getting of these materials going into the environment. And EPR is an important part of that. I could also take you on a tour <laughs> to, to some of the uh, transfer stations that I'm personally familiar with and show you uh, stacks of tires that have been collected from roadsides that are difficult to get rid of. So uh, like all EPR programs, um, we're looking for a true product stewardship program to help with the disposal. And this is not something new and it's not rocket science. We have very effective uh, product stewardship programs with paint, with mattresses, with electronics. It's a proven model. It's proven to be cost effective. It does not burden the industry. It gives everybody a stake in the process and helps clean up the environment. I, I hope that information is helpful. Very, very so so uh, to, to be clear I, I agree with you we need to do something I'm just not sure if if that's the right thing to do at, at doing an EPR program versus uh, this bill I, I, I'm, I'm I'm honestly asking the questions because I don't know and just sure. trying to figure out what makes the most sense and I agree with you just because it doesn't exist anywhere else in the US doesn't mean it's wrong it's just I, I'm looking for the best answer and if no other state is doing it, and it's 2022, then I want to know why, or 2023, then then why is no other state doing it? And why do we want to be the first? I, I don't know the answer to that. And and so I appreciate your, your response. Thank you. Well, I, I, would, I would say that it is under consideration in other states. So it may not be adopted, but this is part of the overall national EPR effort. Understood. Um, understood. I, as, as, as everyone on this committee knows, I don't like to be the first and I don't like to be the last. Let's see if we can, uh, figure out what's going on and then do sure. what's best. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. And if I can help, you know, please feel free to reach out to me offline. Be glad to do so. 
Thank you, Matt. Uh, seeing no other hands raised in the room or uh, in the virtual room, uh, we'll move on next to uh, Jen Eaton-Jones, followed by Claire Kane. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Sorry. Um, honored co-chairs, Representative Gresco, st distinguished members of the Environment Committee, thank you for this opportunity. It's good to see some new faces. I'm Jennifer Heaton-Jones. I'm the Executive Director of the Housatonic Resources Recovery Authority. We are a regional governmental solid waste authority serving 14 municipalities in Western Connecticut. I'm also uh, Representative Harrison's constituent. The HRA opposes the language in RB 6486. However, we do support extended producer responsibility for tires. The current language does not address municipal or environmental concerns, nor does it establish an adequate stewardship program for scrap tires. Instead, the proposed bill is self-serving to industry and requires the State Department of Revenue to administer, collect, and enforce the fee authorized. It essentially puts the burden back on government, not on industry, to address the material management of tires. It calls for that grant system that is administered by the state, not a stewardship organization, with no enforcement and no oversight. What we want is a policy that provides adequate and sustainable funding to a stewardship organization that provides public education, that will assist in the elimination of illegal dumping. It will facilitate end of life management for higher and better use of scrap tires while protecting human health and the environment. And last but not least, it will reduce the cost burden on municipalities. I'm tired of hearing there isn't a problem. If there wasn't a problem, if that was the case, we wouldn't be here. There is a serious problem with the fact that this billion dollar industry wants to point the finger at third party haulers and take no responsibility for their product. They know EPR for tires works. Look towards our north. Canada has nearly eliminated illegal dumping of tires. I have included in my written testimony online um, our concerns, su suggested substitute language, which points to last year's bill, and I have provided the Canadian Tire EPR resources. I also want to address the question regarding why are there no other EPR tires um, in the country. I would say it's the same reason we don't have one here. We have lobbied against industry. I have been testifying for this bill since 2011. And I also believe that it's okay to be the first as we were last year with cylinders. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jen. I have a question, but uh, out of respect for everyone else in the room, instead of going first all the time, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, you at least here physically in 2B first. You can raise your hand. I was raising my hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, thank you very much for your testimony and for all your advocacy as always, uh, Ms. Heaton-Jones. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask uh, your input on is, you know, we, we've been talking about this and this was very much the gas cylinder approach that you had uh, referenced. and. Uh, uh, addressing the, you know, the waste we have here in the state of Connecticut that some have suggested that uh, the better approach is to do a, you know, product by product type of EPR program. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the waste stream is very complex and there are many, because there are many waste streams, there are many solutions. And I think each product has a different set of issues and problems um, and therefore they can't all be lumped into one bill. And so, I, uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, I, I think that that would also reflect your testimony today that, you know, tires kind of have a, are unique in many ways, 
particularly in the waste stream and, and how they are recycled and also some of the issues we've had with 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 uh, tires being discarded on the side of roads and, and waterways, et cetera. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to add, add about that or, you know, the, the importance of, of, of what you believe this program would, would provide to the state and, 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 and its waste management and its tires specifically? Well, I think it's, um, we can look towards the EPR for mattress stewardship program as another exemplar program of how we eliminated illegal dumping and created an incentive as well as making industry take some responsibility, shared responsibility for end of life management of their product. With the mattress program, the industry, the PRO, the, the stewardship organization provides us as municipalities containers at our transfer stations. Those containers are taken to a recycler. We do not pay for the container, we do not pay for the transportation and we do not pay for the disposal, but we're able to use that container for the ones that we collect at our transfer stations at no cost to our residents and to the products that we find that are illegally dumped. I see that this bill could give similar relief to municipalities providing a system in which it doesn't create a barrier, that fee at the end of disposal. It provides easy, convenient, and accessible disposal of a material that we are finding in our environment. And, and, and I just want to thank you so much for your testimony, and I'm good with my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Harding. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in 2B? Mary? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I respect you as a witness because you are on the front lines. You deal with the trash directly for your municipalities. And so did, they, did the industry reach out to you and collect statistics from you? before they did their testimony? Because they're mentioning municipal statistics. Thank you for that question. Um, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to clarify that. Um, industry reached out to myself, I would say in February or March of 2022, while I began collecting data on the member municipalities I represent, which are 14, not the entire state of Connecticut the data that I had shared with them at that time was incomplete because we had just begun uh, collecting that data. I have not given them any additional data and I've been collecting data for near, nearly a year. Um, and most of the data again is about transfer stations and municipal cost from our Waterbury's $20,000, $25,000 a year to Bridgeport $80,000 a year. It was cost um, data. And it was not a data analysis on illegal dumping. So I wanna clarify that. Um, and also to address um, how they worked with us, I would not say they approached us and asked us any of our input on a, a solution towards this, the material management of tires. This bill came as a surprise. Okay, well, now that you've been surprised and it's here, uh... If they aren't coming to you, can you go to them with your data so that, you know, hold it right in front of them so they see what a problem it is for municipalities? I myself have hauled tires out of rivers every year, and uh, it is it is backbreaking work for for constituents to physically remove these from the river rivers and uh, waterways. Following the publication of this bill, I did reach out to industry and asked if I can work with them. And what would they say? Will they take your statistics? Um, yes, they have agreed to to meet with me and work with me. Okay, well, that's good. Happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, anyone else in 2B? Representative Harrison. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Good to see you. I know we spoke uh, last year regarding uh, the tanks and I think we had a very good conversation. Um, so what I'm interested, you know, you do represent a small thing and I'm hearing about the tires in the waterways, which none of us, none of us want. Um, but I've also heard that some of those um, go back, you know, maybe 20 years, 30 years where they thought that they had a positive influence on the environment. Do we have any data to say, are we pulling tires out that went back that far or versus currently and really being dumped? It's very difficult to get data, good data. 
anyway. Um, we have not collected the data on the legacy of tires that are in our waterways, river, or even in fields, uh, farm fields across Connecticut. It is something that I would hope that industry would help us obtain. And I also, I, I ask member municipalities across the state of Connecticut to work with us, work with the Connecticut Product Stewardship Council, work with CCSMM, work with, with my authority, help us collect that data so that we can understand that. At the same time, it's very important to understand it's continuing to happen. These are, we're not talking about just legacy tires. We're talking about everyday tires on the side of the road. I mean, you must have seen them. You must see them too when you're hiking on trails throughout Connecticut. Um, on the side of the road, on the side of our, um, whether they're main or state highways in our municipalities, we we're dealing with it because there's a barrier for the easy and convenience of residents and consumers who don't want to pay that $5 at retail. Take that fee away and give it to them at the front end. If the consumer, if, if industry is willing to um, put forth a, a fee, then let's put it at the front end, point of sale, just like we have on mattresses and paint. They pay for it. At the end of life, which we we know there are a lot of tires that end of life, they don't last forever. That consumer has no barrier. They're taking it back because they've already paid for disposal at the front end. So we don't have them on the, those one or two tires on the side of our roads or addressing with enforcement reporting. Canada has a great reporting um, policy. We'll prevent those third party haulers from uh, having an incentive to illegally dump it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Harrison. Representative Palm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is that last point that you just made, is that what you meant by um, illegally dumped tires are a direct result of market failure and economic inefficiencies? Yes. Agree. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the virtual world, Representative Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Heaton Jones, for uh, testifying today. Um, I just wanted to go back to two uh, two subjects. You discussed the data, and um, uh, you know they mentioned data on on illegally dumped tires. Can you comment on to, as to that data? And then my second question would be: You mentioned Canada, and uh, Following my question to the U.S. tire manufacturers, I wanted to ask you: Can you elaborate a little bit on what Canada is doing for uh, with the tire, uh, with the tires in terms of uh, recycling? Thank you. Thank you, Representative Michelle. I'm not quite sure how much more I can explain on the data. We can get back to that on the extended producer responsibility um, policy in Canada. They have a policy where um, there's reporting from the producers um, that manufacture the tires to reporting from those who are collecting them at retail processors and the recyclers. Um, so there's, uh, I would say it's um, a, a good balance of collecting data um, for what's in circulation. Then there is responsibility for public education and outreach to educate the public on how to properly dispose of their tires. There are levels um, of, uh, depending on the size of the municipality or the province, how many retailers or drop-off locations are provided uh, to consumers, um, sort of similar to paint care. And um, there's enforcement, there is an audit, uh, so it's very similar to what we have in other EPR policies in Connecticut, uh, like like I mentioned, paint care and mattresses, very similar. And uh, as I had mentioned, there's also a lot of reports and data from Canada in regards to how much they have eliminated the illegal dumping because of that reporting system. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, no, definitely. That was very helpful. Uh, regarding the data, I was, it's only because it wasn't clear, but I can uh, go back uh, offline with you and just discuss what happened with the data because I was a little bit confused by that. But that, Oh, I'm good. sorry. So it was that you missed the, the information I gave. I had explained that the data that I collected was um, incomplete. 
uh, that they are referring to, that I believe that they are referring to. And if I am wrong, I hope that you will ask them to submit the data that they have, because I'm curious to see what they are referring to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, seeing no more questions or hands raised in the, oh, here we go. Uh, yes, no, uh, Representative O'Day. Sorry, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you so much for your testimony. I just want to reiterate my good colleague from the 85th. I very much value your testimony as, as uh, a person who's involved with this on a daily basis. And uh, so I greatly appreciate you being here in your testimony. Um, just on the, on the EPR, I, I, I agree with you uh, in the sense that uh, we need to do something. And, and so um, as someone, as you may have heard, is, is, who looks for solutions that, that are the best compromise between conflicting uh, information, um, why do you, do you agree with the premise that only about 1% of tires end up illegally being illegally dumped, which is one of the, the, the smallest amount, or I'm sorry, just whether or not you agree with the industry that 1% of the tires uh, end up being illegally dumped. Do you, do you think that's accurate? I would say I don't have the knowledge on the percentage and what does 1% mean? If we're talking about uh, 500 million tires, I, I, what's 1% of 500 million? I don't know the number, but I, I don't know what number is in circulation. So I don't know what the 1% is referring to, but I would say that um, it has been a comment was made to me by industry that, oh, it's, it's only 50,000 tires or only 500,000 tires. That may not be a lot to a recycling company that processes three and a half million in a year, but that's a lot to a municipality that has 850 homes. And we're finding, you know, 50 or hundred tires on the side of our roads that as a small community have to clean up or to the city of Hartford that's spending $70,000 a year. I don't know what that 1% represents, I, but I do know what it's costing our municipalities across Connecticut to clean up that 1%. Now, how would you say that an EPR program would keep bad actors from illegally dumping? Because I think we need to take away the barrier that they get to just come pick up. There's no accountability. There's no reporting. You don't know how many tires are in their truck. They're driving away. They're keeping the cream of the crop and throwing out their whatever it's 20, 50, 100 tires that are bad um, and not having to be accountable to the recycler. Where's the system that holds everyone accountable from the time that it's at the retailer to the time that it gets to the recycler or the processor? There needs to be accountability. A reporting system would help us in that regards. It also, um, we need to, to change where it is that gives them incentive and where it creates the barrier for them to be the, uh, the, the one doing illegal or dumping. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative O'Day. Seeing no other hands raised or uh, questions from the room. Um, Jen, thank you. Um, it was a pleasure working with you last year on getting the EPR for cylinders um, done. And in full disclosure, um, um, the industry did ask us for this past off session to come up with um, um, a plan for an EPR and um, well, this is what we got. So, uh, it, but uh, I think it was made clear by myself, at least, that uh, we were looking for, you know, no state involvement, uh, free, convenient, consistent, and just like we did for the cylinder industry. So um, we will move forward from here. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Representative Rusco. May I just add to that comment that the cylinder process for EPR was successful because industry took a role and and communicated with us, worked with us. Worthington was an exemplar in that process. And I would hope that the tire industry would look towards that as a way to move this process forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, Claire Kane, uh, followed by Monica McNally. Thank you. My name is Claire Kane. I'm the trails director for the Connecticut 
Forest and Park Association, and I'm speaking today in support of HB 6482. If you're not familiar, our organization has managed and maintained the Blue Blaze hiking trail system for over 90 years. Our 825 mile trail network stretches across 96 towns and provides access to some of our state's best natural spaces. In fact, nearly every person in the state lives within 30 minutes of a Blue Blaze hiking trail. Increased storm events means there's more work than ever to maintain trails and keep our trail infrastructure safe and cleanup and repairs are a huge part of our annual maintenance workload. Maintenance of our trail system and really all trails in Connecticut requires a tremendous amount of resources and financial support from the Recreational Trails and Greenways program is absolutely foundational to our ability to do this work. Just to give you an idea, funding from this program currently supports a variety of programs for our organization like training of our extensive volunteer force, our Connecticut Woodlands Conservation Corps, which is a backcountry job training and education program, inclusive hiking and outreach programs, connecting trails to schools, trail safety initiatives, as well as Connecticut Trails Day. And this year is actually our 30th anniversary of Connecticut Trails Day. And this event really is evidence of Connecticut's long love affair with trails. I mean, Little Connecticut has the largest Trails Day celebration in the country with more than 200 events and 5,000 participants on the first weekend in June every year. And these guided events offer families and the outdoor curious a safe way to experience our open spaces and trails, often for the first time. And we want these folks to have a great experience, to come back and explore more. And that means trails that are in great shape. We know that trails are more popular than ever and as the primary source of funding for essential trail work and engagement in Connecticut, it's vital that we increase the bond authorization for the Rec Trails and Greenways grant program by three million. We also recommend that the community add language to this base bonding authorization. So at least three million is contributed every year. And that's really what we need to care for and maintain our state's incredible recreational trail system. I've submitted more in my written testimony, but I wanna thank you for the opportunity to provide comment and I'm happy to answer any questions. Claire, thank you for your uh, comments. Uh, anyone here in the room or virtually with any questions? Seeing none, Claire, thank you for your patience and for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Monica McNally followed by Emily Gunther. Good afternoon, Chairman Gresco, Representative Callahan, and members of the Environment Committee. My name is Monica McNally. I'm the first selectman for Darien, and I'm here um, giving testimony in support of SB 122, an act concerning replanting of trees in public areas cleared by utility companies with some suggestions. Clear cutting exposes residents living near power lines running parallel to train stations train tracks, I'm sorry, to barren land, excessive noise and safety concerns. The local environment is significantly altered for humans, animals, birds, and there's also a very big impact on drainage and temperature in those locations. The need for reliable energy must be balanced with these concerns. From our experiences last fall with Eversource's proposed clear cutting in a residential area in our town, I'd like to offer some practical points that we had to address in our final agreement between Eversource and um, the Connecticut Department of Transportation that I don't see in the current draft of this bill. I would suggest first that any clear cutting plan must include a replanting plan as an integral part of its remediation. This replanting plan in turn must include warranties and a future maintenance plan that includes watering. Um, otherwise, many plants won't make it through the first summer. These parts of the plan should be solely the full responsibility of the utility company. And additionally, towns should have an option of including, you know, including fees for a plan consultant in their funding request if appropriate expertise is not available on their staff. 
So these are just some of the elements of um, a successful cutting and remediation plan. I have other elements that I included in my written testimony. Thank you for allowing me to testify in support of moving this bill forward. Thank you. Good timing. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam First Select Woman. Anyone with uh, questions from our room or virtually? Uh, Representative O'Day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At the risk of owing another pizza, I just want to quickly just say thank you, uh, the First Select Woman, for coming up and testifying. Um, I will note that the, I've seen pictures of the clear cutting that's gone on in Darien. Uh, by uh, Eversource and DOT, not only along the merit, but also uh, along property lines. Um, and I do believe that there should be some uh, replanting required that is appropriate for the area. In other words, I, I've seen firsthand where they've cut down a tree in my property that was right over the power line. So I, I agree that Eversource needs to do that, but they didn't do it in a responsible manner. And when it's done, in such an uh, an extreme manner has been done in your in your town. I do think they need to address that uh, for the neighbors. So thank you so much for bringing it to my attention, our attention, and uh, appreciate your testimony here today. Thank you, Representative O'Day. Seeing uh, no other comments or questions, again, thank you for your testimony and uh, for your patience today. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Emily Gunther, followed by uh, Stephen Mendelson. Hi, can you hear me? Slash see me. Can you boost the audio a little bit? Uh, yes, can you hear me better now? Much better, thank you. Okay, great, um, thank you. Um, so Aaron, I'm, uh, this is my husband, Aaron, and myself, um, newlyweds. We are uh, first time homeowners, just moved to um, little Brook, uh, just a little over a month ago. And, um, we were told about the trees, um, that were agreed upon in the settlement with Darian, um, prior to purchasing our property, but it was not disclosed to us, um, whatever source would be doing on their property. And so our, um, property line buds right up against, um, property owned by Eversource and, uh, DOT. And so, um, we were given a courtesy, voicemail from Eversource to let us know that they'd be coming to um, do a survey of our property. And then later that week, they um, came and chopped down the entire plot next to us. So now our house is completely exposed to the train. We have no screening whatsoever. It's completely unsafe. We live on a road um, that butts up into the Selix Woods, which is a very popular um, destination for residents to come walk with their families and hike with young children. So we feel that there's a really big safety concern. Um, we spoke to Eversource and there's no plans to replant any of the um, trees. I, I, they must have cut down hundreds um, in the property owned uh, next to us along a residential um, street. And um, there's no plans to not only replant, um, but also remove the um, the invasive species that are in that um, plot of land. Um, so we're very worried that there won't be any regrowth um, next door to our property. Um, we Even if we wanted to sell our house at this point, um, I don't believe our property value is, um, the, uh, is of the same uh, that it was prior to the clear cutting. Um, and um, we're also, worried about the wildlife. All of their um, homes have been destroyed. When we first moved here, we would see a lot of different types of wildlife. And even in the past couple of weeks, um, we haven't seen anything. Um, so it's been extremely upsetting. It's been really, I don't wanna cry, but it's been uh, really, it's, it's, you, you should come see it yourself. It's, it's really hard to look at. Um, and so we're just concerned that there is no plan in place going forward. And we would like to address that and um, just make sure that our voices are heard. Well, thank you, uh, Emily. Thank you for your uh, your emotional testimony uh, and uh, got our attention. That's for sure. Um, look, uh, we've had issues with with um, clear cutting of trees by not just uh, utilities um, um, in the state over the past a few years, in the name of well, safety, in the name of 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 uh, consistent and reliable power and i understand that but with the 
with, with the consistent uh, uh, backlash that uh, our residents have been giving uh, both the utility industry and, and quite frankly, our own um, our own state departments. Um, I would be uh, uh, looking forward to maybe somebody uh, listening to us um, for a change and, and, and getting some sort of replanting or uh, at least stump grinding um, going forward. So uh, you have a question from Representative O'Day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quick, if you could, Emily and uh, Aaron, send us pictures that I've seen to the committee chairs uh, or to the clerk so that the, we can spread them around because I think it is very telling to see uh, picture speaks a thousand words and and I, I understand because I've seen the pictures why you're so emotional um, and so if you could do that appreciate it you know representative Tracy Mara and and Monica McNally brought this to my attention and and I'm very sorry you've experienced that and uh, I promise you we'll look into it thank you thank you Mr. Chair thank, thank you. you thank you representative O'Day and again uh, Emily thank you for your testimony we look forward to uh, seeing those uh, photographs. Uh, next is uh, Stephen Mendelson, followed by. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Oh, sorry. Hey, before um, um let's uh, <laughs> let's see if we can back up a little bit here. Uh, did we lose Emily yet? I'm still here. Still here, Emily. Uh, thank you for hanging on. You have a question from Representative Dubitsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for coming in to testify about this. Obviously, it's a very emotional issue for you. Um, do you know why they cut down the trees? Um, they, uh, we were told that it was um, because they, there was a risk of them um, either growing too tall if they weren't already too tall um, or already being too tall to grow into the power lines. So there's a, a major power line in that area? Yes. So our house um, is we're on the same road at, that butts up into the, the train tracks. The train tracks. OK, is is there a power line on the train tracks? So there are tra transmission towers. There's quite a few of them. Yeah, there's there's both the DOT owned transmission towers for the train line. And then there's also a separate uh, power line that is just, um, you know, power for the local town. So okay. there's two. So um, does it seem reasonable to you that they would cut the trees to prevent them from interfering with the power lines? Yeah, I, I would say so. And it, it's, of course, understandable. However, the entire plot of land probably could have done with mitigation of, of a number of trees that were in danger of uh, impeding in the power lines. But there was probably dozens of trees that were nowhere close to those lines. And let's assume for the fact that every single tree did potentially present an issue, fair enough. As, as we understand it, there are no plans to replant anything underneath um, a, a reasonable expectation of um, growth from the trees or building a fence to prevent um, you know, any animals or even people uh, you know, getting into contact with those tracks. So yes, of course, it's understandable that they would um, remove trees that presented a danger but with no plan to replace anything with something at least reasonable. Do you know if the trees that were cut had been planted or if they were naturally occurring? That is a good question. I I don't have the answer to that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Davitsky. Um, and um, thank you again, Emily. Um, all right, I'm just waiting. So, you know, anyone else with any questions, comments? I don't want to make the same mistake. All right, here we go. Mr. Mendelson, you are up and thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Senator Lopes, uh, Representative Gresco, members of the Environment Committee, my name is Stephen Mendelson. I'm here to testify in strong opposition to Section 2 of House Bill 6485, an act concerning natural organic reduction in green burials. Let us not be fooled by euphemisms like natural organic reduction and terramation. This 
this bill seeks to promote human composting, the treating uh, deceased human beings as, as if they were recyclable garbage into soil and fertilizer. It devalues human dignity, even if some people consent to it and antithetical to the, to the dignity that the, the, the first section on green burial seeks to support. I am Jewish. I come from a tradition where natural burial in the earth upon death is, is a mitzvah, an obligation. Our practices are already very green. We do not embalm. We do not do anything to either hasten or, 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 or delay the natural composition, decomposition process. Halakha forbids all these practices like embalming, metal caskets. In Israel, that we, there are no caskets used at all. Uh, we absolutely forbid cremation. It's something that was done uh, we would never, it was done uh, by, by, the, by the most murderous anti-Semitic regime in history to our martyrs. And this process, reducing human bodies to soil and fertilizer through human composting, reminds those of us of those of our martyrs whose bones were also turned into fertilizer, whose fat was turned into soap, and whose skin was flayed off and turned into lampshades. Uh, again, as I said, there's nothing natural or even gentle about this process. After the, most of the flesh is decomposed, at least some bones need to be pulverized, just as with cremation. Regarding the libertarian argument here, uh, yes, I, I, I understand that people have the right to, do, you know, to to make their own funeral arrangements. But unfortunately, in this case, this will impact others as well, and that's where we have to protest. If we allow if we allow people to be reduced into this what the representative Denning called quality mulch, then there's no way to stop the commingling of human compost with other soils and fertilizers and it, the sale of human compost to grow food, something that is unlikely with ash from cremations. I refer to section two uh, I one of the bill allowing for the retention of the remains, uh, and only one state round even tries to do anything about it. I think it's entirely unenforceable. There's no way of stopping somebody from growing, certainly no way of stopping somebody from growing uh, backyard tomatoes in their human compost and then giving the tomatoes away or to other people who have no, no, no clue that they're essentially becoming existential cannibals here. Soil and green is no longer futuristic. It is here now. It's also a religious liberty issue for us. Uh, my religion, Judaism, forbids, and I assume many other religions may well too, benefit, driving benefit from a, from a corpse unless it's necessary to save a life. We have to, well, rabbis have to inspect farms uh, now to ensure that there's no human compost used in order to certify the uh, produce as kosher. What about Kohanim, Jews who are from the priestly lineage from Aaron? Uh, will they have to avoid forests and things because they're scattered uh, uh, human compost there? They're all all these questions have, have already been raised, and finally, what, this is actually a, a, a metaphysical and existential issue because what we're dealing with is a movement, a that seeks to make this normative and what is now a choice will eventually become a duty, and it's also part of the deep ecology extremism, which views humans as the enemy of the planet rather than the traditional environmental view that man is the center of creation and we have to guard our environment to, prom to promote human flourishing. We should never sacrifice human dignity on the altar of deep ecology. I would hope if you believe that most people do, and I think most people are, are appalled at this, at, at, at what's, at what this is, at, at, at this whole idea, then please remove section two from, from the bill. The laudable goal of promoting green burial should not be contaminated by the radical dehumanization of human composting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mendelson. Uh, any questions or comments from first here in 2B? Representative Callahan, followed by Representative Palm. Thanks. Thanks for coming in, Mr. Mendelson. Uh, and thank you for waiting all morning and dealing with the light shining in your eye there. You but, uh, it's okay. Uh, I'll just but, move a little to my left. <laughs> but it, it, your your testimony is essential to the public hearing process and, and the process for uh, setting laws in Connecticut. Hmm. Uh, giving a, people opportunity to understand for us to understand how it detrimentally affects people or or, or a whole sect of people. So I appreciate you coming in. That's and that's my comment. You're, 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 I'll just say you're very welcome. I think again on the surface, a lot of the a lot of the proponent testimony is sort of saying this is my choice and it's not going to affect other people. And I'm here to say yes, it will. Both, as I said, in terms of the 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 human compost go going out into the public domain and there's no really no way of stopping it and b existentially by 
degrading the sanctity of of dead bodies when when we treat when we treat the uh, when we treat our deceased in this way it eventually leads to uh, down, uh, to, to the way do we treat yeah. the living people it's it, it, it's right. all interrelated as the reverend dr martin luther king jr said uh, we are all there it was a, a a single garment of destiny that I'm trying to I'm trying to remember it offhand, and I can't. Right. That's okay. You made yeah, the point but, very well. We are interdependent. There's not. We're not all. It's not all about me, myself, and I here. Understood, and I, I appreciate your comments and thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very welcome. Thank you, uh, Representative Palm, followed by Representative Felipe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And sir, I came in a little bit late. I was at another hearing. Are you a rabbi? I'm not a rabbi. Not. Okay. I just wanted to address you properly if you were. That's all. No. That's why I asked. Stami, you're just, just an ordinary, knowledgeable uh, Jewish person. Although I, I've talked to other people in my community and, you know. Okay, that's all uh, right. Thank I'll you. Just, I just... I'll just say most of us never heard, never knew this was a thing one month ago. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most of you never thought this was a thing one month ago until this bill was raised. So here, here's my question to you, sir. Yes. Um, when you talk about the sanctity of the earth, and I thank you for that, um, some people who consider themselves environmentalists and who would like their final act on earth to be one that is ecologically sensitive would say, using your exact argument, that the most humane and, and um, sacred way to use land is to protect it in this way and not take up large swaths of land with um, human remains. So I guess my question would be, do you not see the logic in the argument that uh, creating a, a cubic square foot of compost is uses less land than a burial plot, however green it might I be? I don't think it's all that much, A. And B, uh, from what I've read, uh, I, I was I was looking at this, you know, there's uh, the National Association of Kevra Kadisha has several websites, one of them which I linked to, uh, Last Kindness. It has another one, ncremation.org, and they're trying to convince Jews not to cremate. I think we all here think cremation is really horrific in terms of in terms of its carbon footprints and is something that we should all strive to move away from. And they're and, and again, the, the website tries to encourage Jews to follow our tradition in terms of green burial. But what they say in terms of the amount of space used. Here in the United States, we have we actually have plenty of land. I mean, Israel may be a little more, uh, you know, ha has more densely populated. But here in the United States, it would take something like ten thousand years for cemeteries to fill up one percent of the country. So we we the the issue of space for burying people is really somewhat of a red herring here. Okay, um, and then my second question to you is. Um, the nature of this law is permissive as opposed to um you know regulatory in the sense that it doesn't demand that you do this it simply allows you to do it if you so choose you don't seem to be making a distinction between that uh i in some ways i do but i think eventually if this is seen as the most environmentally correct way of disposing of human remains it will become an obligation and there will also be people like homeless people who may not have a choice and they will be composted without their consent so we also have to think about that too i mean again we've seen other things where something is first introduced as a choice and then it slides and then there's pressure and coercion to people in, in to, to uh to engage in things that they would not have otherwise consented to. So we have we cannot just view choice as a an immediate yes, no. And we also have to realize, you know, how does this affect not just uh some well-off white uh elite person in Wilton, Connecticut, but also maybe somebody, you know, who's homeless in Hartford. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative um, Representative Felipe, followed by Representative Dubitsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll, and I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for coming before us and, and testifying. We're you know, very happy to have you. But coming from a standpoint that's not quite um, religious, but more the practical parts of your statement, um, 
when you talk about, you know, somebody growing tomatoes and then giving those tomatoes out without uh, somebody who is purchasing them consenting to having tomatoes that were made with human compost, would that be satisfied if there was just some sort of labeling or way that we can identify whether or not that was uh, the human compost was used? Uh, I don't know. I mean, in terms of kosher supervision, you would have to ask rabbis, but this would make it an I, I would think it would be enormously complicated if we had to inspect every farm now to make sure this human compost was not used on the farm. I, I simply think, though, it is gross. The idea of de deriving benefit from human remains, whether you're religious or secular, is, is so gross, is so disgusting, is so much like we, we just got three days past International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I and, and as Horrific is what the Nazis did to my people, murdering six million. We also should not forget what they what they did after they murdered them. The ones that they didn't burn in crematoria, as I said in my as I say in my testament, my both oral and written te testimony here. It reminds us of our martyrs whose bones were also turned into fertilizer, whose fat was turned into soap, and at least according to some reports, whose skin was flayed off and turned into lampshades. So the idea that we should benefit from this human compost and grow tomatoes in it is really in some way sickening. I don't care even whether you're secular, religious, what, what, how low can we go? I think a lot of people will be sickened by that idea. Um, and in order to not prolong this, Mr. Chair, I'll forego my second question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Felipe. Um, Representative Dubitsky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for coming in. Uh, when you first started speaking, I my my the immediate question that came to mind was, well, if if you don't like it, just don't do it. Why why would you prevent other people from doing it? But then you uh, you went on and explained that you think that it can go beyond an individual's decision. Mm. Um, my question to one of the proponents of this bill was about what is actually left. And I'm concerned about chemicals, mm. drugs, um, things like that, that um, I don't know if they break up, if they break down in this process. And I'm, I'm, I'm worried about, as you said, the, you know, once it's, once it's dirt, mm. it can be mixed with any dirt mm. and used for any purpose mm. that dirt's used for. Mm. Um, let me ask you this. Um, if you are, how, does, does this, how do, how do I phrase this? Does the, um, the condition of, ha of the risk of having this material grow your food, is that something that is something that is uh, abhorrent to your religiously or is that a secular issue? For I think both. I would say both on that. I mean, let me say this. Cremation is important to me re religiously, but the point is you get about four to seven pounds of, from what I understand, is you get about four to seven pounds of ash from creation. Yes, you can perhaps you know turn something into a diamond or something, but it's kind of hard. Here, it's quite easy. To, this is, uh, as, as Representative Deming said, earlier in the testimony here, this results in 250 pounds for a human being of what he called quality mulch, which is nutrient rich, which would seem to be preferable to ordinary soil. Um, did you say 250? 250 pounds for a person because you're mixing in alfalfa and straw and additional materials into the decomposed human remains. So it actually weighs more than the original person. Okay. Again, I, 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 this is just from my research over the past less than a month. 
All right, until this until the proposal was first posted on the CGA website, I had not heard of human composting. Okay, so just tell me if I'm wrong. So when you go and you get a and you you bring one of your loved ones to be uh, cremated, you come back in a week later and they give you an urn with four pounds of ash. Yeah. When you bring your and that loved can be very composted. Okay you they they what they haul it out it, 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 it? apparently it's uh something like a cubic meter a cubic yard it's a much it's much more stuff all right with cremation most of the stuff goes up as carbon dioxide and and pollutes the environment that's why they're proposing this process that doesn't cause the same carbon footprint as uh as cremation but we have green burial as an alternative that is environmentally friendly and that doesn't and that, that doesn't desecrate that respects the dignity of the human body i think it's also in terms of the religious differences let me also explain this i think historically all the major monotheistic religions have historically believed in burial all right, you go back uh, to the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans, they cremated. When Ro ancient Rome became, uh, when Rome went from pagan to Christian, at the, at the exact same time, they went from cremation to burial. And basically, Judaism, Islam, uh, Baha'i, and I believe Eastern Orthodox Christianity still mandate burials, would not tolerate any of these alternatives, whether it's cremation, Aqua alkaline hydrolysis, which I mentioned in my testimony, or uh, human composting. It's I think what the problem. The reason why this bill is probably before us is because first Protestants back maybe like after the uh, second uh, after the First World War, after the after the 1918 flu pandemic, and the Catholic Church in 1963 started to permit cremation, sort of breaking the consistency of monotheism with burial. So, and what I'm trying to say, I think what's happening is, is that there's a metaphysical reason for this. And I think the medical, you know, again, polytheistic societies, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, contemporary India, they burn the bodies. And it sort of sort of says, it's, it's a dualistic view that the body is the enemy of the soul rather than the body does the work of the soul, which is particularly the Jewish view, that we, we use our bodies to do mitzvot, to do good deeds. And so therefore we should respect our bodies even after we, and just let them return them naturally to, to, to the gotcha. source With, in the earth. Without going too, yeah. too far afield, let me ask you one more question. Um, tell me about the timing. Um, my understanding is that um, that with regard to either cremation or composting there is a, a delay after death um uh, I've, not, I, I, I've heard there's a couple of days i'm that's not really my i will say composting takes you know a few weeks to a few months and so you know it and you're spinning in that drum and there's a whole i, I see like 10 uh, or more you, you know on, you're, you're not you're not understanding my question okay. my question is with regard to the initiation yeah of the process there's a several day wait and isn't is there not a uh a, a provision in in uh, rabbinical law about oh yeah the well timing what, of uh, oh, okay of now, now i understand what you're saying yes halakhically uh we're the, the we're, we're supposed to bury somebody within 24 hours within one day actually it, it says in deuteronomy the example given in the book in in, in devarim deuteronomy is that uh, is, is of a condemned criminal, and, you, is, and, it, and it says you, you shall surely bury him the same day. It's a disgrace to have a dead body out, uh, even of a condemned criminal. And so Calva Homer, anybody else, needs to be buried in one day. Let me just say here that with my father, who passed away in 2010, it was right before the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. So we weren't able to have the funeral immediately. And so we had Sukkot on Thursday, the second day of Sukkot on Friday, Shabbat, and so we weren't able to have the funeral on Sunday, and this was at Weinstein's. And even though with the delayed funeral, they used ice. They did not embalm my father. So this claim that you 
that even even if there's somewhat of a for, for a legitimate reason of delay that you need to embalm is false. And I think some of the some of the things that are being used to market this process are not true. Okay. Like thank, that. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative uh, Dubitsky. Uh, Representative Cooley, followed by Representative McGee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mendelson, for coming in. Uh, you uh, referenced uh, Soylent Green, um, as well as uh, the uh, Nazi practice of creating commodities yeah. out of human bodies. Uh, mulch, by definition, is a commodity, agricultural commodity. Mm. Uh, do you have concerns uh, that this bill is moving towards the commodification of human remains? I certainly do. It's, there's My question is, what can you do to stop it? I do cite the bill in Colorado, which at least attempts to do something, but I think that provision in Colorado is unenforceable. The other bills in Washington, Oregon, California, Vermont, and most recently New York, I don't see a provision at all like this. And there's nothing in those states that would stop somebody, again, from commodifying it. I, I can I can imagine human compost being a commodity sold on the shelves of Home Depot. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Cooley. Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Mendelson, did I say it correctly? Uh, yes, you did. Um, I just have a comment. I, I do thank you for your perspective because I think it's important. Um, I think oftentimes, no matter how popular something is or how effective we feel it may be, mm. um, we have to listen to multiple perspectives mm. because people have different idea, different ideologies, mm. different beliefs. Yeah. And I will say, I, I brought this back to my district and there were a lot of reservations around, um, one, I think that there, it, there needs to be a lot of education, a lot of information. Um, from from those who maybe were moral or even secular, there were still reservations mm -hmm. around it. People just didn't understand it. They wanted to know what it meant. And then, you know, and, and I think no matter how um, important we believe these things are, um, sometimes they don't represent, you know, the vast group of people or they may represent a group of people. And then, you know, I've spoken to environmentalists who are focused on environmental justice. Mm -hmm. And this was much different than something that they would advocate for. And so I do thank you, like I said, for your perspective, because whether I agree or not, I think it's important. And I think that you're giving voice to people who, who you know, who are Jewish or maybe not, because mm -hmm. like I said, I brought this back to my district and it was a concern um, for, for a lot of people. And so I do thank you for sharing today. Thank you're you. very welcome. And I'll just say, I think, I think, again, how this affects particular different minority communities. OK, I mean, we would, you know, I, 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 I sense that this is, as I kind of said earlier in response to a different question, that white people from Wilton are more likely to be the ones pushing this than homeless black people in Hartford. I, I, I think there is a certain amount of a certain well, class, class sensitivity to this that. I, I, and maybe Thank you, that's what is coming. I think you're going to be good with, with just okay. stopping right there. All right. I'm autistic. I go on and on. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so we don't want you to you know, dig yourself a hole, so to speak. Okay. Uh, no problem. Th th thank you. You're very welcome. Moving on to the next in individual, uh, Eric Hammerling, followed by Betsy Guerra. Welcome, Tree Hugger. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks thanks for a chuckle as well. I do appreciate that on a, a difficult day with a lot of important issues before you. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Hammerling, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. I've submitted testimony on seven bills, uh, and if I were going to draw a through line between them, it would be a general lack of resources, <clears throat> both funding and people available to support stewardship of our state's outdoor recreation and natural assets. HB 6482 would increase the bond authorization for the Recreational Trails and Greenways Grants Program by $3 million. And we believe this program is worthy of ongoing base funding in the state budget of at least $3 million a year, every year. In the fall of 2021, DEEP received an unprecedented 65 applications requesting over $22 million from this program, and only $3 million in bond funding was available. 
DEEP is expecting another huge response to its current RFP that closes March 1st. Recreational trails are ranked at the top of both community assets and needs for the future in Connecticut's State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan, and multiple studies linked to my testimony demonstrate that trails for hiking, running, biking, equestrian, and other uses attract and sustain families and businesses, create healthy communities, foster a high quality of life, and are an engine of Connecticut's outdoor recreation economy. HB 6483 would increase the bonding authorization for the state's open space grants program by 10 million. And similar to our recommendation for trails, there should be base funding in the state budget of at least $10 million a year every year. Our pace toward meeting our state's 21% open space goal is way too slow. At our current pace, it will take more than 80 years to reach it. Similar to recreational trails and community open spaces, Connecticut's state parks are amazing assets that make our state special. In 2021, over 17 million people visited state parks, the highest attendance ever recorded. And this was an increase over the previous high in 2020 of 13 million. While swelling state park attendance is a great success story, the staff available to maintain and operate parks has not kept up. In the mid 1980s, there were over 200 full-time park employees. Today, there are only 83, and park managers are overwhelmed. If we want to address important issues in state parks, like those raised in SB 896 with managing tree removals at state parks and campgrounds, or in HB 5009 with insur ensuring park capacity uh, is managed safely, <clears throat> we need to make sure there are enough park managers incorporated into DEEP's budget to implement them. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in person today. Great to see you all, and I'd be glad to respond to your questions. The timing, you've done this before. I have. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, uh, for your testimony. Uh, anyone in 2B with any questions? Representative Felipe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for your testimony. Could Do you happen to have on hand the average uh, cost for a new bike trail somewhere around Connecticut, what that might cost? So a study was done a few years ago by uh, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection looking at the cost of various surfaces of trails. Uh, if you're talking about a, a paved bike trail, and if it's a newly paved trail versus uh, just uh, painting a line along a road and saying, here's a new trail. If you're talking about building a new uh, one mile of trail that's paved, it's about a million dollars. That that was uh, the estimate of what the, the state um, had come up with. And there are other surfaces of trails for, uh, you know, equestrian uh, trails, which are usually not that paved surface, but more of a stone dust type surface, uh, or uh, just natural trails that are at much lower cost. Uh, but the value of all of those trails to uh, Connecticut's economy is very high. So, um, you know, it's it's generally, in my opinion, worth the investment, uh, and it's important that we keep making it. And when you say paved trails, um, I'm thinking from an urban perspective, right? Does that include if you have to like move an esplanade, maybe move a sidewalk a few inches to the right or the left, uh, those kinds of, uh, you know, infrastructure changes as well? Well, in, in that instance, uh, it, it might not be as expensive because it would be just uh, adding on to an area that's already paved. I, I was talking about an area where it, it, it might be going from a natural surface to a paved surface. That would be about uh, $1 million per mile cost. Um, but, I, you know, again, I, I, one of the great things about our trails in Connecticut is that they are in every community. Uh, that that uh, just about every community has in its plan of conservation and development an interest in having more trails. Um, and so we, we hope that's an area of continued investment. Understood. Appreciate the answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Felipe. Representative Palm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Mr. Hammerling. Thanks for being here. As always, I appreciate so much your, your expertise and your knowledge. And while you have said you don't have expertise in the uh, bill concerning green burial, um, I am very uh, interested in your opinion on it. If we were to uh, take care of the concern about Oswa, because I agree with you that, that land should be dedicated for preservation and recreation and not, we don't want to be 
taking land away for this. Would you be more comfortable that this bill was actually a good one? Well, I, I, I did put in my testimony that, you know, I, I, as, as you noted, I was just concerned with section one of that bill. Uh, and, and I think what's in section two of that bill, which has to do with establishing standards for green burials and, uh, you know, other practices uh, makes sense. Um, I, I have certainly been hearing about this for a few years of the interest in green burials in particular. I realize that's just a subset of what's addressed in that bill, but, mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I think especially because, as, as you mentioned earlier, it is a permissive bill and not a requirement. Uh, it's an option that should be available. And I appreciate the state thinking about how it can be appropriately regulated. Thanks, Eric. And also, um, I appreciate your comment about the nature of the underfunding chronically of DEEP as a, as a through theme through, through many of the things that we're trying um, to accomplish here. And I think that that point can't be made often enough. So I appreciate very much your being here and what you said. Thank you. And I can assure you, I'll be back again making that point. Uh, it is one that uh, unfortunately we really need to address as a state. Uh, the, at our state parks, we have over the, just the last 20 years lost over 40 field staff um, there are now for each of the park management units in our state parks division, uh, an additional 2000 acres that they had to manage, uh, which they didn't have to manage before because they've condensed, uh, the number of units that are there. And it, as, as you've seen, some of the issues on this, uh, agenda today are made, uh, much worse and much harder to resolve because there aren't the resources at deep to address them. So, um, you know, we, I, I realize it's a bit of a, a broken record, but I, I, I know you appreciate that it's uh, an argument that we need to make. Thank you, Eric. Seeing no other hands raised or questions, um, we're going to move on to, uh, Betsy Guerra. Thank you, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, members of the committee. My name is Betsy Gare. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns. I have submitted testimony on several bills. I just want to uh, summarize on a couple of these. Uh, cost opposes House Bill 6486, an act concerning EPR for tires as drafted. I do want to emphasize, and I know you've heard a lot of testimony on this bill, that Connecticut's municipalities are facing a very real solid waste management crisis. We need solutions. We need them sooner rather than later. And EPR in Connecticut has been very successful in addressing issues related to mattresses, paint, electronics. We think that you can build an effective EPR program for tires and that it will be a critical part of addressing Connecticut's solid waste management crisis. Unfortunately, this bill doesn't get us there. So I would concur with the testimony provided by others that we should look at last year's legislation, House Bill 5139, I believe, and, and work together to try to get EPR for tires moving this year. Um, in addition, I just want to touch on our support for House Bill 6479 regarding the state treasurer and climate change and coastal resiliency funds. This is a simple change that would allow uh, the state treasurer to invest these trust funds that towns are setting aside to address climate resiliency issues. When you're dealing with coastal towns, towns along inland waterways, they are seeing uh, increased flooding due to rising sea levels and so forth. So it is something that they're struggling to address. This was a, a unique program that was developed by the town of Brantford. We're hoping to um, have a webinar with uh, the Audubon Society and other organizations and our cost members to really provide them with information on how to do this in their community because it is that critical of an issue. Thank you. Good timing, Betsy. Thank you for your for your testimony. Any questions from the uh, room, Representative Davitsky? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming in, Betsy. Um, you say that you're in favor of the of an actual EPR for tires. Um, do you think that what's presented here won't work? Yes, we are concerned that what has been presented will not be a successful program. And on what basis do you say that? Well, the, the way that this is drafted, it basically establishes a, a 
fee program, but it doesn't really do anything to ensure that it's not going to be um, something that imposes additional costs on the state or the municipalities to manage. So we do feel that there is uh, a framework for creating an EPR program for tires that should be modeled after the successful programs for mattresses and paint, where the manufacturers do take greater responsibility for making sure that these are disposed of properly. You know, we're finding them all over in our towns. They're abandoned in ponds and lakes and along the roadside, and it's becoming a real issue. And we also know that the cost for disposing of those has increased. So I had was at a council of government meeting. It wasn't one of our members, but the city of Meriden uh, commented that their cost for disposing of discarded tires has quadrupled in the last year. So it is something that we're, we're seeing uh, more and more of, unfortunately. And I do think there are some retail, retail tire centers that do a good job already. Uh, but unfortunately, it's just not enough. So I, again, we have a successful model. I just think we need to make sure that the legislation mirrors that model and not create this different type of program. But the model that you referred to is for products that don't have a, a resale value, that have no end use. They used mattresses and paint, nobody wants them, but people do want recycled tires, don't they? I'm not sure about that. I'd have to check on that. I mean, I know they are used for certain uh, crumb rubber uh, areas, but I'm not really clear on what the market is for that, but I'd be happy to check okay. on that for you. Would you support proposals that um, increased or made other uh, other avenues available to use those tires, such as um, adding it to asphalt or things like that. So it would add value to the used tires. I think those are some, certainly looking at reusing products as part of an overall effort to address solid waste management. So we would certainly be open to that. I don't have any expertise on whether or not that's viable, but you know, certainly like with glass only recycling, they have found markets for recycled glass. So I, I think that's certainly worth exploring, but I would defer to uh, some of the people that have more expertise on that than I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Dubitsky. Representative Palm. Uh, Ms. Guerra, hi, thank you for being here. Do, do you think um, concerning uh, 6479, if this resiliency fund were taken under the aegis of the treasurer, do you think more towns would be apt to comply? In other words, is it the management of the funds that is most onerous, or is it more of a philosophical difference of not wanting to partake in that program? Yeah, I, th I think you you kind of speak to that that it it is difficult to have somebody in a small town have the appropriate financial expertise to manage those kinds of investments. And so I do think that it makes sense to have the treasurer. Uh, invest those funds. I know that uh, Senator Cohen mentioned that she had spoken to the treasurer and they're supportive of this. So I, I think it's a really a simple change. It would go a long way to making more towns comfortable with creating these funds. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no more hands raised or, or questions, comments. Thank you, Betsy. Next, we're going to move on to uh, Ann Godwa, followed by Susan Eastwood. Hello. Good afternoon. How are you today? Good. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Lopez and Gresco, Vice Chairs Hochadel and Palm, and Ranking Members Harding and Callahan, and Distinguished Members of the Committee. My name is Ann Gadwa. I'm the Advocacy and Outreach Organizer for Sierra Club Connecticut. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on several bills today. Uh, first bill I'd like to testify on is SB 895, and that's concerning the deposit initiator counts and carbonated beverages. Uh, Sierra Club opposes taking these spirit-based cocktails and canned cocktails away from the deposit. Uh, this could uh, potentially exempt a significant portion of the containers from the bottle bill, which has been shown time and again to be the most effective way to recycle and reuse containers. Um, and municipalities will get the burden of um, recycling these containers, and it's really about the container and not what's inside. 
uh, hard seltzer and hard cider was uh, underlined and um, included in Public Act 2158. Uh, it was obviously the intent to have these included in the bottle bill. Um, and really, we need a strong, consistent bottle bill for it to work properly. Um, attempts to weaken it will cost and burden state, state municipalities, stores, and consumers. Uh, Senate Bill 896, an act concerning tree removal on the properties under control of DEEP. We support this bill. Um, public process and transparency, we believe, are very important to this process. Uh, and we've been alarmed by the amount of trees taken down um, that, you know, are best for wildlife protection, best for ecosystem preservation, and for carbon capture. Uh, why we had an outing this uh, summer at uh, Haystack Mountain after I had gotten uh, lost because they had cut down so many trees that I all of a sudden couldn't figure out where the trail was. Um, and we wanted to showcase how the uh, removal of the trees with no real public process was uh, detrimental. Um, so trees really take care of everything else on earth. Uh, every other bee on this planet needs the trees. So we really need to be mindful when taking them down, especially when they're under the purview of the public. Uh, one way to strengthen this bill, I think, would be to get some money for DEEP to be able to um, <laughs> do these processes <laughs> that would um, that are going to put a little bit more burden on them if we have passed this bill. Uh, HB 6481, the intentional release of balloons, we support it. They pollute our land, our waterways, our hills, kill our wildlife. Plastic is a really huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we would suggest that there'd be no release of balloons at all and not capping it at 10. Uh, HB 6482, uh, authorizing bonding for bikeways, greenways, and recreational trails. We do support this um, uh, in addition to what, oh, oh man, all right. So we also, <laughs> uh, usually I'm trying to fill it in. Um, all right, so we also support HB 6484, the uh, har harvesting of horseshoe crabs. Um, birds need them, we need them. Their population is down significantly. Uh, they've been around for 500 million years um, through meteors, extinctions, ice ages, everything. And they should not go extinct because currently humans cannot figure out how to sustainably utilize Earth's resources. Uh, we also are opposed to an act concerning EPR for tires for all of the um, reasons mentioned by many other folks this morning. And I thank you. <laughs> okay, any questions in the room, everybody? Um, sorry, I have to lean over. Representative D'Amico. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ann, for coming in to testify. So I, I want to uh, just ask you a question or two about the first bill that you testified about, and, and it's uh, Senate Bill uh, 895, having to do with um, uh, beverages and, and returnables and, and so forth. So, so um, uh, I, I'm looking at your testimony, and and, and I, I just wanted to uh, to make sure that I understood. So so you are you are saying that the the, uh, the intent of the bill that was passed two years ago uh, was to include was to include um, uh, the the spirit based as well as the malt based uh, hard seltzers. Is, is that is that what you said? Yeah, there was no definite. There was yes, exactly. So so so. It's, so as far as you're concerned, if you look at the language of the bill two years ago, you, you don't see any distinction there between those two. Uh, is that correct? No. And that's, okay. yeah, that's sort of my prop today is that this is, I mean, this is with it's vodka. And so what it says, it's, it's hard seltzer essentially. And it is, um, I mean, it's the same container that any other seltzer would have to exclude it from the bottle bill would, would put burden and, and frankly, not have the same impact as it would be including in the bottle bill to get it recycled and reused. okay no I, I appreciate that and 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 uh i'm looking at at another piece of testimony from someone else saying that to to, to make a distinction or to make this change uh would, would only le uh, lead to confusion uh, to the uh, among the consumers uh by, by making this distinction would you agree with that that, that, that could lead to some confusion I do agree with that. I agree that it would be um, confusing to just exempt the same exact container just because the uh, ingredients were slightly different. I, I see. Okay. So so as far as you're concerned, uh, uh, th th this uh, proposed uh, change should not go forward. Would that be accurate? Yes, we oppose this bill. Okay. I, ver I very much appreciate it. Uh, and and w while we're at it, is there anything else in, in 895 that you would like to speak to? Uh, that's only, obviously, that's only one section of the bill. Anything else that you would like to speak to or, or no? 
No, no, no. That was basically the intent. Okay. Of Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions from Ms. Jadwa? I don't see anything. Thank you very much for your testimony. All right. Just to follow up on, if you want to look at this can, there uh, is Vermont. No. There is all <laughs> other sorts of states that are. I fully um, understand that. Depositing these, so it's not that much of a stretch. I believe so the next you. person to speak is Susan Eastwood. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Environment Chairs Lopes and Gresco, Vice Chairs Hockadell and Palm, Ranking Members Harding and Callahan, and all of the distinguished members of the Environment Committee. Um, my name is Susan Eastwood. I'm a resident of Ashford. I am the chapter chair of Sierra Club, and so of course I support all of uh, our testimony that Ann just presented. Uh, but I'm speaking as an individual today and also as a founding member of the Zero Waste Coalition of Connecticut. Um, so today uh, I did submit written testimony on um, 6486, which I'll focus on in my oral. I also, there's also more on 6481, the balloon release in there. Um, but I oppose a, a 6486 because the proposed language does not address municipal or environmental concerns, nor does it establish an adequate stewardship program for scrap tires. Um, in um, extended producer responsibility, um, this bill lacks the producer part of extended producer responsibility, putting all of the extended responsibility onto municipalities and consumers. So I, of course, support EPR programs that are done well, but this one I don't feel is adequate and I think we should be looking at language that has been presented uh, in other years and by other uh, folks who testified, such as, such as Jen Heaton-Jones from HRRA. Uh, um, so, well, so in my testimony, I put some more uh, bullets of proposed uh, additions or improvements to the bill. Also, um, I'd like to speak a little bit about um, the recycling disposable tires, which is a particularly complicated issue because they're bulky and also because they release toxic chemicals into the environment. Certain types of reuse, such as crumb rubber infill, have been shown to spread these toxic chemicals far and wide. And when used as a fill for artificial turf in playgrounds or athletic fields, they can endanger our children with carcinogens. Um, burning, also another way of, of using old tires, uh, releases an incredible amount of toxins into the air. And the chemicals in tire dust and microplastics uh, endanger our wildlife as well as working its way up to us. Um, so I think this bill should add language to specify environmentally responsible practices for recycling and reuse of tires, at least, at, or at least specify unacceptable methods. Tires are very toxic. So we should not go from bad, such as unsightly and polluting illegal tire dumps, to worse, playgrounds and athletic fields that expose our children and young athletes to carcinogens and other dangerous substances. It's vital to include responsible, acceptable, types of reuse and to incentivize alternatives to toxic chemicals used in the manufacture of tires. Um, I urge the Environment Committee to reject this language and replace it with a more environmentally responsible proposal that also um, helps municipalities to cut the waste stream, which is our ultimate goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Any questions? I don't see any questions, so thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next, I have Eva Saranowitz, Serana, followed by Dan, uh, Diane Loricella. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, Senator Harding, Representative Callahan, and members of the Environment Committee. My name is Eva Saranowitz, and I'm here on behalf of the Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association which is the largest professional organization of veterinarians in the state of Connecticut. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment on SB 53, an act mandating veterinarians report cases of su suspected aggravated animal cruelty and authorizing the reporting of suspected animal cruelty. Uh, we appreciate the overall intent of this bill and support its goals. We are concerned, however, that veterinarians are protected in the process. Um, this proposal does offer the reporting veterinarian protection from civil and criminal liability, but does not offer anonymity when reporting. We request that anonymity be included. Uh, veterinarians who suspect aggravated cruelty or neglect at the hands of potentially violent individuals may be at risk on a personal level 
from reporting, and this risk may extend to their staff as well. So we would request that in the cases of reporting that, again, that anonymity be considered. Thank you for the opportunity to offer the veterinarian's viewpoint to these discussions, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Always nice to hear from a subject matter expert. Any questions? Representative Dubinsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> thank you for coming in. Could you repeat the uh, group that you're from? The Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association. Okay, thank you. Um, my concern, and perhaps you can, you can address this, my concern is that when, um, when veterinarians become mandatory reporters, people who have, who have abused animals will not bring them to vets anymore. They'll just kill them. Um, is, is there something that, am, am, I, am I reading that wrong? Or is there something that we can do to change this bill to address that concern? Well, I think there is a concern for that. I mean, I mean, realistically, um, that concern exists and it's a concern that we have as well. Um, I don't know if anonymity would help that. So at least they, they would be the not knowing that that's who's reporting. I am not sure. I don't know what the solution to that problem is, but it, it does make for a concern. Or will somebody just allow an animal to suffer because the injuries, they know that the injuries were caused by someone in the home and they don't want to bring them in for a problem. I mean, it's, it's the opposite side of trying to help trying to help other animals in the household and children in the household. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see no other questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next is Diane Lorcella. Thank you so much and good, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Diane Lorcella. Um, I'm going to speak quickly, of course, to four bills. I'm gonna combine some of them. Uh, uh, I live in Norwalk, Connecticut, and have been a, a resident for over 35 years. Uh, today, uh, I also wanted you to know I'm a former member of the DEP back in the 1980s. So my first two bills that are up for just an introductory discussion is a Senate Bill 894, an act concerning functions of DEP and agriculture, and HB 6487. A reg, an act concerning regulations of the same two. I want to also suggest you may want to throw in Department of Public Health, something that is missing from uh, so important and intrinsic in having a holistic approach to both the functionality and the regulatory. I'm a former regulator. I was a hazardous waste senior investigator when I left for the private sector, of which I am now in the private sector as an environmental consultant. I ask that you look at, as previous members, about the issue of funding of staff. Uh, it is very difficult for municipalities to, even though they're on the, on the scene all the time, they need guidance from people that have certificates and are uh, uh, well uh, adapted and trained. And I even have seen that uh, as a former enforcement person back in the 80s, how the uh, enforcement capacity of DEP, and I mean enforcement meaning not slamming people with a hammer up front, but educating about regulations. I think it's time that we, we really help DEP and the health department and the agricultural department staff up, and there is money for that, as, and they of course must serve well, training and certifications. The second half of what I wanted to talk about is the two um, uh, bills, and I, I know I'm about halfway through or less, uh, have to do with waste management. I totally agree with all the previous speakers that have talked about Senate Bill, uh, uh, the Senate Bill relating to the um, issue of, uh, of the bottle bill. I think anything that will do as a longtime environmental advocate, making things clearer for the public and those that are in the regulated community is very important. And this bill seeks, in my opinion, to go backwards and undermine and, and create a situation where the public will say that government can't do anything right. Let's leave things as they were. It only took, what, 10 or 20 years to get the bottle bill reactivated. And I applaud all of you. I also want to applaud you for letting us speak virtually in a hybrid 
a situation. I really appreciate all the work you, you folks have been doing. Lastly, I just wanted to say on the EPR tires bill, 6486, I am opposed to this version of that. I am in the business and I'm also an advocate. I've pulled those tires out of the Norwalk River as the founding president of the Norwalk River Watershed Association years ago. I am not speaking on their behalf today, but I wanted to tell you that we need to go back to the drawing board and look at last year's bill that took hours and hours of good discussion. Diane, your, yes. your time is up. Please summarize. Uh, could I wind up? Please. Attach a public marketing and education uh, uh, measure to each of the bills that this wonderful esteemed committee puts together because the public will only do things when they understand the best way to do them. I really appreciate Susan Eastwood uh, and, and um, uh, Miss uh, Jen Heaton Jones, Aaron Good, uh, Nancy Alderman. I'm going to cut spoke. you off now. Just thank you. Uh, Thanks so much. For you. Sure. Any questions for Ms. Lorichella? I don't see any questions. Thank you very much for Thank coming. Thank you. To uh, next, we have Rhea uh, Zrondenko, followed by Lori Vitegliano. Hello. Um, good afternoon, members of the Environment Committee. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Uh, my name is Rhea Drostenko, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here on behalf of the Connecticut River Conservancy to oppose HB 6486. We host an annual cleanup in our watershed and our volunteers see firsthand the issue of illegal tire dumping by pulling out hundreds of tires from our rivers every year. We see how it plagues our public lands, how scraps get into our waterways and how tires become breeding grounds for mosquitoes. We've been doing this work for years, but the problem has not gotten any better because we need to address the root cause of it. Earlier today, the industry shared that only 1% of tires are illegally dumped, which doesn't sound like a lot, but 3.41 million scrap tires are created annually. So therefore that's 34,100 tires dumped each year, more than six tires for every square mile of Connecticut. I want to be clear, we are absolutely in support of the extended producer responsibility for tires. However, the language of this bill does not reflect a true EPR model. I urge that the committee look to the language of last year's HB 5139. Most of the tires that currently make their way through the disposal system in Connecticut get sent to Maine to be burned as tire-derived fuel, or TDF, at cement kilns or pulp mills. TDF is not a sustainable solution to our tire crisis. This bill includes TDF in the definition of recycling, which is misleading and disingenuous. So when the industry states that 70% of tires are recycled, do those numbers include incineration? So we should look to the language of last year's bill that prohibits TDF being considered as recycling. As written, this bill would implement a scrap tire recycling development fund, which is not true EPR. Producers would keep a portion of the fees collected from consumers, and the state would be burdened with the responsibility of dealing with the waste tires. A true EPR, um, a true EPR for tires framework would include the creation of a tire stewardship organization made up of tire producers, and it would not be a state-run program. Um, and we can see this language being reflected in HB 5139. EPR, EPR for tires is a model with proven success in most EU countries and in Canada. Both Ontario and the British Columbia have found that illegal tire dumping was virtually eliminated because of EPR. Thank We've you, been fighting. Hi, I'm your timer is up. Uh, Thank and, you. And any questions? No questions online. No questions in the room. But thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, now is Lori Vitigliano followed by David Greenson. Good afternoon, Senator Lopes and ranking members of the Environment Committee and uh, and all distinguished members. I'm Lori Vitagliano from the South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority, and the RWA appreciates the opportunity to provide comments opposing House Bill 6486 an act concern, concerning extended produ producer responsibility as written. You've heard many comments today. And uh, by way of background, the RWA provides approximately 43 million gallons of water per day to some 430,000 consumers in 15 communities in our region. 
The source of this water is a system of watershed and aquifer areas in 24 municipalities. Much of our 27,000 acres of land is managed for watershed protection, timber resource, conservation, wildlife habitat, and open space. And illegal dumping of tires is a problem for us. Unwanted tires illegally dumped on the side of the road and in the open space areas pose a major health and safety challenge because standing water inside of those tires attracts mosquitoes and spreads disease. As I said, and you've been hearing a lot of testimony today uh, on this topic, so just underscoring that we have successful, Connecticut has successful extended producer responsibility programs, as you've heard, for Stewart for electronics, mattresses, and paint, and last year's success of the cylinder bill. Um, so again, there's a proven track record to provide safe and convenient ways to recycle these items and uh, ways to help the municipalities and the residents as well. So as written, House Bill 6486 would not do so. Um, also, Again, uh, please refer to the language that was proposed in 2022, House Bill 5139, which would have implemented a sustainable EPR program for tires. Just trying to talk quickly to get through my second one. Also, uh, RWA submitted testimony supporting House Bill 6483, an act concerning the open space and watershed land acquisition program. We purchase and conserve open space and watershed lands with the OSWA program. The bill is intended to provide $10 million annually, and uh, we rely on this program to help with our overall go to goal to protect watershed and public water supply. And hopefully I've, uh, I'm under the, the button here because I didn't hear the a timer. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't hear the timer either. And what's that? Okay. Any questions in the room? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. We have David uh, Greenstein, followed by Margaret Lynch. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Gresco, Lopes, Ranking Members Harding and Callahan, members of the committee, my name is David Greenstein. I am the Vice President of Lake and Tire East. I've held this position for over 20 years. Chairman Gresco, it's almost good to see you, uh, but I wanted to thank him. He did come to our tire recycling facility this summer, and we had a lovely uh, conversation. Uh, Lake and Tire East has been responsibly recycling tire, discarded tires in the state of Connecticut since 1978. We employ 175 employees, occupy and operate in two buildings in West Haven that equal approximately 100,000 square feet. Over the years, Lakin has invested millions of dollars in transportation equipment, software, as well as sophisticated tire shredding equipment. Lakin currently collects and disposes of approximately half of the Connecticut's annual scrap tires of about three and a half million tires. To put into context, Lakin Tire East, since its inception, has successfully collected and recycled over 50 million tires generated by the state. We know that almost all discarded tires are successfully processed by the recycling system that already exists in Connecticut. We can say with confidence that 99% of discarded tires are diverted from landfill to recycling facilities, producing valuable end uses for tire-derived material, and only 1% are dumped illegally. The problem in Connecticut is not the existing collection and recycling system. It is the illegal acts of a group of tire thieves scavenging through retailers' scrap tire holding bins, selecting the good tires, and then illegally dumping the rest, law enforcement problem. I am guessing that you're surprised that there are people that actually do that, but it is a fact, and it is where most all illegal dump, dump tires come from. We do not believe an EPR system will stop these illegal actors mentioned above. A new EPR system may, however, have unintended consequences and disrupt the current efficient and cost-effective system. However, Chairman Gresco did challenge the industry to come back with a proposal 
that the tire recycling industry could support. We spent the last eight months with industry partners looking at various ideas, and I've come back with the bill that you have in front of you today, HB 6486, which we did not choose the title, by the way, we do not consider this uh, proposal EPR. We also engaged in a survey with a number of municipalities and believe the results from the illegal dumping is not the ramp and it would not be successfully addressed by EPR. We are here to work with this committee, other stakeholders, to find a solution for illegally dumped tires and to ensure that this continues to be a comprehensive system for the management of scrap tires. Our proposal has the support of Lakin Tire East, Liberty Tire, the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association, the Tire Industry Association, and the Institute for Scrap Tire Recycling Industries. Our proposal, proposal addresses the two issues needed to ensure a comprehensive management policy for crap, scrap tires in Connecticut, the developments of market markets for hire and use, and the illegal dumping of scrap tires. The proposed legislation targets the areas identified without causing damage to the existing effective infrastructure that manages the overwhelming scrap, uh, overwhelming majority of scrap tires generated in con Connecticut. The legislation also places program responsibility with the Department of Economic and Community Development. The ECD is well suited to enhance markets for tire derived materials in the state, as well as ensuring through local government grants, the flow of all waste tires to strong end markets and away from potential littering affecting local jurisdictions. Currently, the state of Connecticut does not have a significant tire recycling and use opportunities. In fact, the entire New England region is lacking sufficient tire recycling options. The only substantial option today is processing the tires at recycling facilities to create tire derived fuel. In the past, Deep has not been a proponent of tire derived fuel. Uh, David, can you please summarize? Your time is up. Yes, I'd just like to say if that option was taken away, we would have no options um at all today um for our recycled material and i'll uh, leave it at that and and thank you for the opportunity to speak and i wel welcome questions it's okay i have a hunch there's a question representative gresco thank you mr chair thank you uh david for your testimony yeah, i'm over here good uh, to see you good to see you as well i i have to say that i did enjoy the tour of your facility and the uh, uh, efficiency at which it works, and um, as we go forward uh, with this with this bill uh, through this committee and through the process, um, I will make good on what I had said to you in, in our tour, and that uh, you are going to be an in, uh, in, integral cog in uh, whatever we come up with um, in the state of Connecticut. So uh, we appreciate the work that you're doing. Representative Musinski. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask about as a person that pulls the tires out of the water um, with my colleagues. Yes. Uh, if if we had an extended producer responsibility program, then they all the tires would be tracked. It would seem to me that because they're going to be tracked, that would be an inspiration to uh, fence in the tire pile, so it could not be raided at night by the thieves who separate out the sellable ones from the ones they want to throw in the river. Could you comment on whether an EPR would likely cause the industry to keep a closer eye on what happens to their tires? Yes, I'll comment on several fronts. First of all, something left out of the bill, which should be considered, but um, Chairman Gresco did not really want us to address a manifest system. But a manifest system would be a great tracking method um, from the source of the retailer all, all the way till its end use. To the extent um, we have found tires in the waterways, that, that, that is just a horrible thing. Um, there was a question earlier, can we tell where those tires come from? The answer is yes. Every sidewall of a tire has a date code on it. And we have done some research and it's not been conclusive, but many of these tires are 30, 40, and 50 years old. It's terrible, um, but it is not recent um, droppings into our waterways um, that, that is happening today. And um, furthermore, uh, to your direct question of EPR eliminating these illegal actors, 
We're in a time of high inflation, high costs. Used tires are very valuable, and these people are very industrious, going in the middle of the night, breaking locks, taking 200 tires, finding the 40 good used tires, and then disposing the rest somewhere illegally. It, it truly is a law enforcement issue. Okay, just to follow up. So you're saying that all, all scrap tires are currently locked up right now and that the only way the thieves get them is they break the locks? Or are people storing them out in their back of their lot? Uh, there's certainly some cases where um, they can be secured better. Yes. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions in the room? Representative Cooley. Uh, thank you for coming in, sir. Uh, regarding the uh, use of tires for producing energy, do you know how many megawatts are being currently produced through the uh, use of tires? I don't know the megawatts, um, but it's often um, looked at in terms of BTU, and tires have a very high BTU content, um, about 14 to 15,000 um, uh, BTUs uh, per tire. And um, it, it burns hotter uh, and more efficiently. And with proper scrubbers, um, it, it becomes a wonderful alternative fuel. I wish there were other answers, um, but today um, across our entire country, unfortunately, tire derived fuel is the largest consumer of end of life tires. Thank you. Representative Dubitsky. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned that if a full-blown um, EPR system were to be put in place, there would be adverse consequences. Could you explain what those might be? We have an existing structure today um, where the tires, there, there are three collectors and processors in the state and the tires are picked up efficiently. We, we can argue over, nobody wants 1% or 34, 35,000 tires, but an EPR system, which has not been well-defined, um, could have the consequences of disrupting this efficient collection system. Okay, and is it possible to craft a system that does not disrupt the uh, the architecture of that system? I, I would have to say that there is, there is a possibility if crafted carefully. Okay. Um, are there, now you, you also said that most of the tires are burned for fuel. Is there anything that we can do as a legislature to increase the marketability of the used tires and give you other options other than sending them to pulp plants to burn them? The, the biggest category that's been spoken of before is the rubber, rubberized modified asphalt. Um, and if we could find ways for the DOT um, to continue their test pilots and, and expand that, that, that would be a terrific help. Okay, so where are we with that? I have no knowledge of where we stand with that today. Who does? I'm not sure I know. Okay. Isn't, don't you think that's an important aspect of getting rid of used tires? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I, I will try to look into it, but my guess is that if you represent the uh, people who have to deal with used tires, you might want to know as well where we stand on that um, we have looked at it in the past and um, it was uh, not something that was would be entertained um, at the table this was several years ago um, we're certainly very open to revisiting it okay um, well it, it may take a little effort on part of the manufacturers to or, um, now, you represent manufacturers, right? No, we represent local business right here in Connecticut, collecting over half the tires in the state. Okay. Um, 
Well, the, and those small businesses are looking for additional uh, markets for those tires, I assume, right? We're always looking for additional markets, yes. Okay. And, and we're hoping the bill address that by creating a fund for that. Creating a fund for that? Yes, to explore market opportunities in Connecticut. Okay. Um, that's a fund with taxpayer money? It's a fund with consumer money. The fund, the money to explore markets, it's going to have to come somewhere and it will trickle down to the consumer. If it is put in the hands of the manufacturer, they're going to have to raise prices. Okay, well, um, please don't take this wrong, but it, it would seem that um, you, you have not looked into whether or not or where we stand with regard to uh, rubberized asphalt, and you're asking for a fund with consumer money to explore. Can't you just get on the phone and ask people without this fund? We, we have done that, as I said. Um, and... A couple of years ago. Uh, yes. Okay, well, might be time to pick up the phone again. Fair Thank enough. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other discussion? Joe? Uh, Representative O'Day, I believe. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Um, just have you been listening to the testimony about the EPR system in Canada? Yes, I have. So... Uh, I will I'd be the first to admit I I don't know the answer to how to get tires out of our rivers and to prevent the one percent from what I understand to be the the theft and uh discarding of tires illegally. But obviously there have been a number of people that are opposing this bill and say we should do an EPR system like the one in Canada, even though we don't have any of those systems for tires programs in, in the US. Can you tell us? why the EPR system in Canada either works or doesn't work? Well, I can speak to the Ontario Tire Stewardship, um, which in 2018, I might be off the year, had to be disbanded because misappropriation of funds and other illegal activities um, that didn't work. They have rebooted it. And I believe as we sit here now, uh, there is not any clear evidence one way or another uh, that the um, new product stewardship system is effective or not. But the original uh, start of it was uh, unfortunately an epic failure. And um, look, I, I'm trying to, so I was opposed to the bottle bill, but I, but um, based on what I'm looking at, if if it gets more of this pollution off of our streets, and it incentivizes people to turn in the empty cans and bottles that it, it may ultimately be a good thing. We're incentivizing people to make money and, and turn in this trash. And five cents wasn't doing it, at least to the to the extent that people wanted it to, do, to be done. Um, in looking at these tires that are, uh, some of which are decades old, obviously that they're, that that's not gonna be, an EPR system won't, get rid of those but uh or help with those but um i will say to my colleague from the 47th district uh the dot commissioner in the past dot has stated they wish to or want to and plan on increasing the asphalt the rubber asphalt program so um i know that it being on transportation we just said within the last week or so at a, at a meeting that we're going to look into where that program stands and to what extent it's been increased, because I do think that's a good uh, way to, to create a demand for these tires other than simply throwing them away. Um, in looking at your testimony, um, and that goes towards the development of markets for higher end use. Um, how would you address how does how does this legislation help municipalities? Uh, as opposed to a, an EPR program, because that that's, I think that's a very compelling testimony. Our municipalities need help. And, and how would this bill help municipalities as opposed to an EPR program, if at all? 
um, again, with the established fund, there will be a portion set aside um, to fund uh, the dis proper disposal of uh, discarded tires um, in the state. Uh, we endeavored, and, and Jennifer Heaton Jones spoke earlier, she and I um, as have had many, many conversations. Um, not only were we involved in helping her um, get the questionnaires out to her municipalities, but try to get the data back, um, which was a bit spotty, but to the extent there are tires accumulated at municipalities uh, such as hers, this fund would provide um, monies to dispose of the tires properly. And is there an estimate as to what this fund would be? How much? Um, that is yet to be determined. All right. Well, if you, if, if you or someone can look into what that fund will be as an incentive to, to passing this legislation, that would be appreciated. Um, and I look forward, to, and I appreciate the chair's comments about working with you going forward as the largest uh, recycler of Connecticut tires. Um, and uh, thank you for your testimony here today. Yes, I, I just like to add whether uh, I think that that fee would probably be between one and two dollars. So there would be three and a half to seven million dollars appropriated for it. And yes, I, I am committed. My company is committed to come up with a suitable solution with the state and we'll continue to reach out to all the stakeholders and responsible parties to come to a reasonable solution. Thank you again. Any further questions? Check online. Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, Margaret Lynch, followed by Nicole Rivard. Mr. Chairman, I don't see Margaret Lynch in the room. Nicole Rivard. Okay. Oh, that's why we can't find you online. <laughs> Please proceed. Hi, I'm Nicole Rivard. I'm honored to speak to the Environment Committee on behalf of Friends of Animals in support of HB 6484. You've probably come across a horseshoe crab that's lying on its back and stepped in to help flip them over and right themselves. Well, now they need your help in another way to ban the senseless killing of horseshoe crabs in Connecticut, which New Jersey did in 2008. We applaud Representative Gresco and his genuine love for these ancient mariners, which gave the bill the energy it needed to pass by a unanimous vote in the Connecticut House of Reps in 2022. He also championed the 2017 ban in Stratford after Westbrook, West Haven, and Milford were declared no-kill zones by the Atlantic Marine Fisheries Commission. Not only have horseshoe crabs along the Atlantic coast declined in status for three consecutive reviews by the commission, the horseshoe crab is already functionally extinct in Long Island Sound. That's according to the late Jennifer Mate, a member of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Horseshoe Crab Specialist Group, who Connecticut was lucky to have as a biology professor at Sacred Heart. Let that sink in. That means horseshoe crabs no longer play an effective role in their ecosystem, which negatively affects many other species. Migratory birds need to eat horseshoe crabs' eggs, especially the threatened red knot. In 2021, fewer than 7,000 red knots were found in the Delaware Bay, a key spring stopover habitat. That's less than a third found in 2020. Without sufficient eggs to feed on, migratory birds run out of energy and die before reaching their breeding grounds. In addition, sea turtles feed on horseshoe crabs and other species such as anemones, barnacles, oysters, and seaweed use horseshoe crab shells as homes. In Connecticut, 16 commercial fishers are licensed to kill horseshoe crabs for bait for eel and whelk species so people can eat smoked eel and conch fritters. Deep's new regulations still allow each fisher to kill 150 horseshoe crabs per day from May 22nd through July 7th, excluding weekends and five days around the full moon in June. Theor theoretically, each license holder could still kill a staggering 4,950 horseshoe crabs each season. And these numbers don't address poaching. 
Not to mention Connecticut's annual quota is still an appalling 48,689 horseshoe crabs. We hope this year's bill will move forward without a carve out for the pharmaceutical industry, which rounds up hundreds of thousands, drains their blood to develop safe vaccines and return them to the ocean after which many die. While horseshoe crabs are not currently being rounded up for their blood in Connecticut, they can be targeted in the future. Meanwhile, we no longer need to use horseshoe blood since scientists created a method to synthesize the compound found in horseshoe blood without involving crabs. It is awe-inspiring that horseshoe crabs have figured out how to harmonize with the environment to last half a billion years. Humans can really learn a thing or two from them. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gresco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Nicole, for your testimony and uh, for pointing out uh, our loss, the unfortunate uh, passing of uh, Dr. Matei during um, this past fall. So hopefully we can uh, get the bill over the finish line this year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice. Any no other questions? Thank you very much for your Thank testimony. You. Um, Next, we have Andrew Ginsberg, followed by Beth um, Critton. Hi, thank you, uh, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, and all the other esteemed members of the committee. My name is Andrew Ginsberg, and I am the general manager here at Hartford Distributors. We are a local beverage distributor, and today I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 895, an act concerning deposit initiator accounts and carbonated beverages. Uh, HDI is a family-owned business uh, of which uh, we are now in the third generation. Um, we directly employ more than 200 people to whom we provide good wages, good pensions, and good health care benefits. Most of our employees have worked with HDI for their entire careers, and more than half of them are members of the International Bro Brotherhood of Teamster Lab uh, Labor Union. HDI processes and redeems tens of millions of containers each year under Connecticut's bottle bill. We play a central role in the state recycling system, and our work is both visible and transparent as we track the report and, and report the flow of containers and all associated costs. We currently pay over $9 million in bottle bill and local industry-specific taxes, including handling fees, driver fees, environmental fees, and other excise taxes. In 2019, we paid $1.9 million in the sheets to the state alone. As you are likely aware, uh, these state mandate costs for a family business recently went up. Before 2021, Connecticut beer wholesalers paid a one and a half cent handling fee per container to retailers and redemption centers. But the updates to the bottle bill, which were signed into law that year, increased that amount to two and a half cents. That re represents a 66 increase uh, percent increase um, to my company and our industry. A separate provision in the 2021 up, uh, updated bottle bill will increase the container redemption from five cents to 10 cents beginning January 1st, 2024. I and other in my industries are concerned that customers may begin stockpiling containers later this year before the redemption rates double. Under current law, distributors like HDI must remit quarterly payments to the state for unclaimed redemptions no later than one month after the immediately preceding quarter. If consumers hoard their cans as we think they might, uh, in anticipation of the increased redemptions, there's a very real chance that the state could charge us for unclaimed 2023 redemptions that are then redeemed in 2024 causing us to uh, reimburse retailers uh, and redemption centers at twice the rate that they initially paid. Ginsburg, this represents a net loss. If you could just wrap, yep. summarize. Of course. Obviously, uh, I don't. you don't have to be a mathematician. This represents a five cent loss per uh, unit redeemed. Um, we, we very uh, much are in support of 895. Uh, to us, this is a common sense, thoughtful change that will benefit local employers such as us. And we appreciate the committee for putting it forward for consideration and urge committee members to support this concept. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's see if there's any questions. Uh, Representative Musinski. Musinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm stumbling on that. Um, very sympathetic to your request. And I just wanted to ask you if 
you care or not if we were to take out the section of the bill which um, exempts some of the containers from having any deposit. That's uh, so, in this bill, but I'm not sure why. Well, we, we at HGI are here to abide by uh, whatever is passed down to us by and, and decided upon it at the legislative uh, level and to do our part. Okay, so you're, you really have no interest one way or the other on that other section? Uh, I'm I'm here to uh, talk to the the sheets part of uh, section okay. 895, okay. Uh, the sheets section of Senate Bill 895. Okay, thank you. You made a good case for that section. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Thank you, Mary. Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ginsburg. Thank you Just for your testimony, um, Beth Critton. Hopefully, I said that correctly. Well, that light does go right in your eyes. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Beth Critton. I'm here as an individual. Um, it, it, it says it's I'm just not talking into it properly. Um, I'm I'm here as an individual, but I, I'm also a member of the board of the Connecticut Forest and Parks Association. I'm a retired land use attorney, as Representative Dubitsky may remember. Um, I, um, I'm here to urge uh, the Environment Committee to recommend approval of HB 6482, an act authorizing $3 million in funding for DEEPS Recreational Trails and Greenways Grants Program. As I point out in my rather lengthy written testimony, approval advances state and local plans of, of conservation and development. Greenways, recreational trails, and bikeways contribute to the state's economic viability, its quality of life, and the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of all of us. Recreational trails and greenways promote environmental resilience. The increased use and the effects of climate change have exacerbated the need for maintenance, repair, and improvement. Yesterday, I did research for this uh, committee meeting by hiking six miles on the West Rock Ridge State Park trails in Hamden. I'm gonna take you for a one and a half minute hike, if I can run you through it, uh, through forest, past the remnants of the historic site of Judge's Cave, past ancient lava flows. From viewpoints, you can see downtown New Haven, its harbor and Sleeping Giant State Park. On the Blue Bay's Regicides Trail, you climb a hill that goes right over that tunnel on the Merritt Parkway. You're burning 300 to 600 calories an hour. Your heart beat is accelerating. Your muscles are working and you're absorbing vitamin D. You pass people of diverse ages and, and uh, ethnicities from infants in backpacks to groups of teenagers, a father and son actually talking with each other, no screens, families with their dogs. Most people say hello and smile, but you'll see the litter. You'll see those tiny little liquor bottles. You'll see if you know what you're looking for, invasive plants, pushing out our native plants, critical to the support of pollinators and birds. Um, when small, you can simply pull them up. Left to grow, they must be dug out, cut back, or treated with herbicides. Overgrown vines are strangling some of the trees. You see an unfinished footbridge. The park ranger, you learn, has retired. It's not clear that the bridge will be completed. You hike through eroded sections and muddy sections that could benefit from stabilization or boardwalks. Rock steps installed years ago are misaligned and deteriorating. Unauthorized. Beth, it, the okay. buzzer. Uh, one CPA, CFPA member is responsible for all of this. Um, this is just one of 110 state parks, 32 state forests. We've hiked two miles of the 825 mile Blue Blaze Trail system, um, hundreds of trails traverse state and local parks. Our trails sustain us without su su financial support, such as that offered by this bill, 
our trails will continue, will no longer be any in any condition to continue to sustain us. Thank you for your patience. Sorry Thank you. to go over time. That's all right. I felt a little bit more than six miles, but that's okay. <laughs> How, how many in this modern day how, how many steps is six miles uh, you know i think it depends on your on the length of your steps yes. how's that for an evasive answer <laughs> very short legs so it works um any questions um i don't see any but thank you very much for your thank recap you. and hopefully one day i'll be on the trail there i encourage you to do it you'll be calmer <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be calmer Joe would be checking my pulse. <laughs> uh, all right, Nathan uh, Froling. Welcome and please proceed. You can hear me okay? Yes. Good. Good to be here. Thank you, chairs, ranking members, vice chairs, and honorable members of the Environment Committee. I am Nathan Froling, Director of External Affairs for the Nature Conservancy, and I'm pleased to present our support for House Bill 6480, 6483, 6484, and qualified support for 6479. Let me start with our support for 6480, establishing a working group on the restoration of eelgrass. As you know, and I've heard today, eelgrass is an important but imperiled marine plant species in need of restoration in Long Island Sound. We, the Nature Conservancy, have been involved in eelgrass restoration research, and more recently in standing up an eelgrass management area on Fishers Island. So we know from our work that there remains a need for additional insight into eelgrass restoration, how best to do it, and the proposed working group can be instrumental in that effort. Next, we support 6483, concerning Open Space Land Acquisition Program, or OSWA. The bill would increase the bond authorization for the program to $10 million. The OSWA program has been absolutely vital to our work in protecting thousands of acres of land. This program has also been essential to municipalities and local land trusts. A modest improvement in funding for OSWA is timely. With COVID, we learned how important open space is to people in addition to nature and climate. We strongly support this bill. Please add per annum, quote unquote, at the end of line five, so the 10 million per year limit is clear. That was an issue last year as well. Next, we support 6484 regarding hand harvesting of horseshoe crabs. In addition to being intrinsically valuable, horseshoe crabs play a role in food webs and other ecological processes in Long Island Sound. The, that role has been greatly diminished in modern times by the serious decline of those species. It is important that we sustain horseshoe crabs, which means we need to limit human harvest. Connecticut's annual quota for harvest of nearly 50,000 crabs doesn't make sense when the goal is to restore the species and there are alternative alternatives to the use of the, as, as bait. So we strongly support the, the horseshoe crab bill. Finally, we offer qualified support for HB 6479 concerning climate resiliency funds. We are pleased that the legislature and governor have taken steps to advance funding and support for climate resiliency. That cause is furthered by the federal infrastructure bills, I'm sure you know. HB 6479 helps assure Connecticut is proactive with these federal funding opportunities, and that is good. It is also important to make sure deep staff have the necessary staffing to carry out the bill um, and so our support is qualified only in that point that we want to make sure deep has the staff to do it thanks well done any questions from mr froling uh, representative baumgartner uh yes thank you mr chair and uh just want to thank you taking aside to thank you and your organization for your work um a few years ago um, identifying Esker Point in my district um, yes. in Groton. Um, today, obviously, eelgrass is uh, on our agenda, and um, it's a very uh, Esker Point and Palmer Cove are home to a very successful um, area for for eelgrass um, to the extent that it, it is even problematic uh, for folks who are trying to fish. So, um, you know, it, as you know, that grant will be um, really showcase the importance of. Um, creating living shorelines um, as opposed to hardening our shoreline as a, a tool to combat, combat uh, rising sea levels. 
and uh, manage our, our um, stormwater issues. So I want to thank you, and uh, hopefully we can incorporate uh, some of those ideas that uh, your organization has presented in the past on those issues um, uh, to this uh, working group. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. No other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Don't run too quick. I can't see that far. Representative Rader. Thank you. I simply wanted to express my thanks to Nathan for being here today. Um, while he represents the Nature Conservancy, he's also a neighbor of mine and someone um, I have a great respect for in terms of the work he does and the advocacy he does. Um, and just wanted to reiterate my um, appreciation for the work you do, but also just to remember also that we are um, a shoreline community, many of us um, where Nathan lives and I live. And so I just had a quick question regarding um, the horseshoe crabs. I know that for many years we've had a uh, an effort around, and I know in our own community of seeing the, um, the horseshoe crabs show up on the shore with a tagging system of some sort. Can you speak to that at all? Is that anything that you're familiar with or um, has that had any benefit for that population? Um, I, I can speak briefly to that and thank you for your, your comments. Um, the Nature Conservancy staff were involved in that voluntary tagging effort and would be out at, at nighttime or the, the right time to be tagging. Um, and uh, I, I heard it was certainly enthusiastic socially because people had a good time doing it, but uh, it certainly helped in the surveying and the and the ability to track these animals and and gain good science that I'm sure Dr. Mate was was relying on. So that's a very cursory response, but all I know is very it was a very positive program. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank Hopefully. you. Um, Bruce Donald. It's hopefully not Donald Bruce. No, you got it right. It's Bruce Donald. Thank you. Good. Uh, I am the Southern New England manager for the East Coast Greenway Alliance, uh, and I've been advocating for multi-use trails in this state for uh, 22 years. My thanks uh, for the continued support of this committee for the Connecticut Recreational Trails Grant Program. The East Coast Greenway strongly supports HB 6482. The most recently completed grant round for the Connecticut Recreational Trails Program was in fall of 21 for award uh, last year in 22. There was $3 million available. We received 65 applications requesting a little over $22 million. Uh, the $3 million was granted to 20 uh, very worthy projects in amounts ra ranging from $2,000 to $457,000. Uh, but another $11 million in, in proposals were unable to be funded, showing huge oversubscription and pent-up demand for this program. Additionally, many of the grants that we gave were only partial commitments. Uh, many, of, many of those municipalities uh, or organizations asked for substantially more than we were able to give them. Currently, there's an RFP open for grants available for projects statewide. This 2023 bonding is available uh, up till uh, I believe applications are due March 1st, uh, utilizes all of the remaining bond authorization and 6482 is critical uh, to authorizing additional bonds needed to continue this important program for 2024 and beyond. As chairman of the Connecticut Greenways Council for the last eight years, I can state that the council reviews all applications and vets these projects, ranks them, and submits our proposals for funding to DEEPS Commission. As you can imagine, it has been extremely difficult for us to deny funding to projects uh, that may not qualify for other funding sources. The program is unique uh, as we are the only state that has its own recreational trails program. Uh, it's modeled on the federal one, but it's better funded and has a lot less red tape. Importantly, these 80-20 matching grants are available for planning, design, construction, and maintenance of all different sorts of trails. Uh, as well as educational programs critical to various state trails networks. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from members in the room? Any questions, if you could check online? None that I see. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. And next, I see Ivelisse Correa.
should supposed to be in here. No. All right. We'll pass on that. Robin Zilla Canamella. Madam Clerk, there's anyone Canamella in the waiting room online? Yes, she's in the room. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Let me see if I can. Uh... Okay. Um, sorry for the uh, technical glitch. Um, Co chairs, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, Vice Chairs, Honorable Members of the Joint Committee on Environment. I am Robin Zilla Canamella, president of Desmond's Army Animal Law Advocates, um, a boots and on the ground grassroots organization here in Connecticut. Uh, I'm testifying in support of SB 53, an act requiring veterinarians to report cases of suspected animal cruelty and authorizing the reporting of suspected animal cruelty. I, as well as other members of Desmond's Army are in the courts throughout Connecticut nearly every day reporting on animal cruelty cases in the court system. Um, we also educate on the connection between domestic violence and um, animal cruelty, which is very well documented. We see many egregious cases of animal abuse resulting in death that may have been prevented had mandatory reporting been in place. One case in point is the case in 2018, Raymond Newberger purposely poured boiling water onto King Charles Cavalier. His girlfriend at the time reported him for domestic violence. Due to dogs in the home, animal control was called in. The dogs with evidence of burns were then taken to the vet and x-rayed. It was shown the dogs also had broken bones upon investigation and other vet records were found within that investigation um, where the dogs had suffered second and third degree burns. Forward to 2022, the same person has now allegedly killed a cat by pouring bleach down its throat. During the investigation, it was found another cat from his household was previously brought to the vet with a broken tail. The cat was relinquished by the current girlfriend to the vet and the vet had not reported the first incident because it was not mandated. Perhaps if reporting animal cruelty had been mandatory, another innocent life would have been saved in agonizing death. This is just one example of a violent offender, offender with multiple offenses, which may have been prevented if mandated reporting was in place. This all occurred in Fairfield, Connecticut. Sometimes the vet is the first line of defense for an animal, especially when domestic violence is a contributing factor. The first line in the veterinary oath reads, being admitted Robin, to the profession. Robin, yes, yes. Uh, the buzzer's gone off, if you could oh. please summarize. May I, may I answer or attempt to answer Senator Dubinsky's question that he had for Eva? I, 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 will ask, I will ask Representative Dubinsky if he wants to re-ask the question. Okay. He's no, not at this time, no. Okay. All right. uh, any other questions from members of the committee? Online, seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Canamella. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Janine Bear Getz. We don't see her. All right, moving on to Sean Moore. He's got to, um, he's got to accept the, the Sean, if you can hear me, you have to accept the promotion from the clerk on a Zoom. I tell you what promotion is, but I have no idea what it means. <laughs> The big thing. Okay, we'll skip over for now. If you can, if you can, if he accepts the promotion, just flag me and let me know.
we'll just take a brief break while we batten down the tech issues. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Awesome. Uh, Senator Lopes, uh, Representative Gresco, uh, Distinguished Environment Committee members, uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify um, regarding HB 6486, an act concerning extended producer responsibility for tires. Uh, I'm a program assistant testifying on behalf of Conservation Law Foundation, or CLF. CLF opposes HB 6486. Uh, CLF is a member-supported nonprofit organization working to conserve natural resources, protect public health, and build healthy communities throughout New England. Through its Zero Waste Project, CLF aims to improve waste diversion and recycling programs. Done right, extended producer responsibility laws are highly effective tools to boost material recovery rates and reduce unlawful dumping. The benefits of EPR for tires have been proven in countries across Europe, and Connecticut has already successfully implemented EPR for other materials like mattresses and mer mercury thermostats. However, this bill would not build off proven EPR laws or protect Connecticut residents and the environment. First, a business that burns scrap tires for energy should not be considered a recycler. When burned, tires release heavy particulates and dangerous chemicals into the air, including the known carcinogen dioxin. Compounding the problem is the fact that tire burning facilities are often located in communities of color and low-income neighborhoods that already experience higher levels of pollution and public health impacts. Tire-derived fuels also emit greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. Simply put, burning is not recycling, and a responsible EPR program should not direct funding toward companies that convert tires to energy at the expense of the health of Connecticut's residents. Second, HB 6486 lacks specific measurable recycling targets, which are necessary to achieve waste reduction goals, increase recycling rates, and drive up the value of recycled materials. It also does not stipulate penalties for failure to comply. So together, these emissions dramatically weaken the effectiveness of the proposed program. Third, strong and effective EPR laws require the creation of an independent nonprofit stewardship organization to oversee the program, and this bill lacks such a provision. Finally, there's no provision in this bill prohibiting discarded tire rubber from being used in playgrounds and sports fields. CLF opposes the use of crumb rubber or other products derived from tires for playgrounds and recreational facilities because exposure to such materials puts children at risk of, uh, at risk of exposure to toxins like polycycl polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, toluene, and lead. Uh, so for those reasons, uh, CLF opposes HB 6486. Thanks very much for the opportunity to comment. No problem, thank you. Uh, Representative Mishinsky. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I have a question uh, talking with one of the lobbyists about use of the material in adult sports venues. What would you think about adult sports venues? Uh, well, the there's kind of continued research uh, regarding kind of what to what extent uh, recycled tires are safe uh, in uh, in these places like playgrounds and uh, fields. I think uh, as as long as the there's still an open question, uh, we should err on the side of, of being cautious, uh, especially in places uh, where, you know, like kind of, for instance, outside where fields can get extremely hot uh, in the summer and, and, and leach uh, dangerous pollutants. Uh, I think it's better to err on the side of caution. Okay, that uh, we are we are very limited in what we can do with it. And if you, if your group can uh, work with uh, Connecticut DOT yeah. on rubberized asphalt, that would certainly help. I I've tried for years to get them to use it, and they say it doesn't meet their standards, and they just don't want to use it. So someone needs to work with them. Otherwise, we we really don't have any other places to recycle the stuff. You know, if we can't use fuel, we can't use adult playing fields. And we can't use rubberized asphalt. I don't know where we go next. 
Yeah, I yeah, I appreciate uh that comment and I, I also appreciate kind of the the, the care uh by which like you, you know you're approaching uh, the issue because it's a tricky issue what to do with these things. Um there are um you know there are uses for uh recycled tires, you know, from stuff like you know sealants to you know being used in, in leachate systems. Uh but I, I I take your point, I agree with it that uh, that's something that that merits further further research and discussion. Thank you. Any questions? Any online? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for your testimony, we're going to try to loop back to uh, both Janine Bear Getz and, if not, Sean Moore. No luck with Sean Moore. Sean's here. Oh, I see him. Sean, try to unmute. We see you. Can you hear me? Yes. There you go. Go ahead. All right. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, <clears throat> so good afternoon, Chair Lopes, Chair Gresco, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Sean Moore, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association in support of House Bill 6486. You do have my written testimony and you heard earlier from my colleague, John Sheeran. I just wanna start by noting that more than 1600 Connecticut jobs are directly supported by tire manufacturing and our industry generates nearly $64 million per year in state and local tax revenue for Connecticut. And then I'll just quickly address some of the discussion that we've heard throughout today. First is EPR is wholly unnecessary for managing scrap tires. There's already a well-established system for collecting and managing tires and it's convenient. You simply leave them at the tire retailer for disposal. Tires are not like mattresses. When you go to get new tires installed, you have your old tires with you. The disposal fee is already charged at the point of sale when you purchase your new tires. It's because you have your old tires with you. It may be because you have your old tires with you that contributes to the confusion of when the fee is actually charged. But because the state does not currently mandate a fee, the consumer may try to negotiate not having to pay the fee by taking their old tires away. So USC may recognize that there is room to improve that system and we wanna be a partner in finding the solution. Our members share a vision that 100% of scrap tires will, will enter circular and sustainable and use markets. That's why our industry committed to Representative Gresco last year to better understand the state's tire disposal issue and to provide this committee with a policy proposal to address that issue. The proposal is HB 6486 as it appears before you today. And it's based on successful laws enacted in other states that have confronted similar challenges. It's unfortunate that this discussion has been taking place in Connecticut for several years now without any meaningful steps towards solving the issue. In addition to developing the proposal before you today, our industry has shown up and supported legislation sponsored by Representative Gresco in 2021 to more effectively regulate scrap tire haulers and to develop sustainable markets for recycling tires. Again, these are policies that have proven effective in other states. I wanna be clear, no other state in the country has EPR for tires. No other state has given serious consideration to EPR for tires in the previous five years. And while I'd love to take credit for that, as a previous speaker suggested, it's not because of any lobbying effort on our part. It's because, because other states have enacted laws aimed at addressing the root cause of tires being a difficult to manage waste. Other states have better regulated their scrap tire haulers, enhanced illegal dumping statutes, and other states have prioritized the promotion of local markets for recycled tire rubber. And markets are really the key here. The root cause for mismanaged tires is the lack of markets to consume those tires, and EPR does nothing to address that. Old tires cannot be melted down and turned into new tires, so tire manufacturers are not best positioned to generate those markets for recycled tire rubber. The government, through procurement policy and through infrastructure investments, is much better positioned to help grow those markets. The ECD has expertise in supporting existing businesses and attracting new businesses and jobs to the state through local economic development projects. Sean, this the timer went off. If you can wrap up, please. Okay, of course, yes. This proposal takes a portion of the disposal fee that's already collected by tire retailers at the point of sale and dedicates it to funding a program at the ECD to develop local markets for recycled tire rubber. I uh, appreciate your time today and respectfully urge your favorable re report for HB 6046 and look forward to working with the committee if there are suggestions to improve the bill. Thank you. No problem. Representative Callahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sean, good to see you. Uh, Sean, are you familiar at all with the Canadian model? I am not. Um, I apologize. My uh, colleague, John Sheeran, who testified before the committee earlier, is uh, our resident expert on the Canadian model, but I have very limited knowledge about it. Uh, not, not your fault. I missed my shot. All right. Thanks, Sean. Uh, uh, good to see you. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Representative O'Day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And sorry, uh, just real quick, sir, thank you for your testimony. Um, I know, it, I mean, your written testimony is what, six pages or more. Uh, I have not been able to read all of it, but real quick, um, we, we've talked about how no other state has an EPR program for tires and, and the reasons why, at least from your perspective. Um, do any other states have uh, legislation similar to 6486? Yes, Representative, that's a great question. The uh, HB 6046 is based on existing laws that were, have been adopted in uh, specifically in, in Utah and Tennessee. So those two states specifically uh, have money devoted to developing new markets uh, similar to HB 6486. And um, as many other states have broader fees that, um, that fund a lot more uh, activity and also go towards market development. But so, so there are several states that spend money on this um, in this manner. Yes. And with, without me continuing to ask more questions, in going through your six pages, is there anything uh, in a sentence or two that uh, you would emphasize in your testimony that you get, didn't get a chance to uh, speak to during your opening remarks? Sure. I, I think as we've discussed this the past several years, you know, um, rubber modified asphalt has come up several times today. It's come up several times in the past. I just wanted to go back to a, um, a question that had been asked before about the status of rubber modified asphalt in the state of Connecticut. We know that Connecticut DOT has been using um, uh, rubber modified chip seal and some pilot projects the past couple of years. Um, my colleague, John Sheeran, again, who testified earlier, hosted a rubber modified asphalt workshop in February 2020. Uh, Connecticut DOT about opportunities to expand the use of rubber modified asphalt uh, in the state, um, much along the lines of your, your neighbors in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and, and Massachusetts. Um, and then had a Northeast regional workshop on rubber modified asphalt in December of last year. And it uh, was clear that there had been no uh, further development since the February 2021 workshop. So we'd certainly support additional um, efforts to increase the use of rubber modified asphalt in Connecticut and look forward to working with you to do that. Thank you. And fine, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, just one uh, last point. Um, I see in your testimony, I forgot to ask this, there's a 25% allocation to municipalities to reimburse them for costs incurred in managing tires. Um, and I'd ask, you know, I, I agree, we've got to do something for our towns um, in, in addressing this crisis. Um, what, what amount, uh, generally speaking, does that uh, total to? And, um, um, you know, I, I don't think the EPR program has a similar reimbursement towards municipalities, but I could be wrong. If you could answer those two. Sure. So um, I know the, the the question had come up before about how much money would be anticipated to go into the scrap tire management fund uh, envisioned by this um, proposal. I, generally speaking, Connecticut um, probably has about 3.6 million new tires uh, sold each year. So um, the proposed uh, bill has, I think, a $2 fee on tires under 24 and a half inches and $3 over. So you're looking at at least $7 million um, in the fund, perhaps seven to $10 million when all is said and done. So um, uh, if you take 25% of those net proceeds, it's $2 million, give or take. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, that's it for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, Representative Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Um, just a quick question. Is the tire industry um, investing any capital into creating secondary markets for used rubber? Um, that's a great question, Representative. Yes, I mean, my our time and energy in terms of um, promoting policies within the federal infrastructure bill that uh, would help um, provide additional resources into um, states looking to expand their use of rubber modified asphalt, our time and energy looking to uh, share resources. I mentioned that our um, my colleague has hosted rubber modified asphalt workshops uh, for various states, um, including in specifically in Connecticut, and then also for um, the entire Northeast region. We've done some work with uh, Ashto to promote the, uh, the 
specific provisions within the federal infrastructure bill that that created additional opportunities for states to expand their use of rubber modified asphalt. So those are, I think, a, a couple of great examples of uh, how we've invested capital into that. So would this additional fee just be redundant then? Uh, what exactly are we trying to get at? What, what type of investment are you looking for the state to do on your behalf? Well, I, I think that what the this fee would do is to help develop local markets within the state of Connecticut. As, as we've talked through this issue um, in the past, um, you know, the vast majority of tires are currently sent up to Maine uh, to be burned in pulp and paper mills as, as um, uh, tire derived fuel. I think um, if I were to just pull uh, an example of a, a successful policy in the state of California, they have a preference for rubber modified asphalt and they utilize a portion of the fee that's charged on the sale of tires to offset the costs for local governments in using rubber modified asphalt if it's more expensive on the front end. We know that rubber modified asphalt has a lower life cycle cost because it produces more durable infrastructure that lasts longer and, um, and has to be maintained less than traditional asphalt. But because it, um, you know, the rubber may not be uh, available in the specs necessary for use in rubber modified asphalt locally. Sometimes it can have a higher cost on the front end. So what California does is they offset that added cost so that it becomes a cost neutral um, material for the local governments to be able to use rubber modified asphalt and then um, uh, derive the benefits associated with it throughout the life of the pavement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. No problem. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. I'm going to give one last tryout to uh, Janine Bear Getz. Call once, twice, thrice. All right. Next is uh, Jude Malone. You're on mute. There you go. Good afternoon. Hi there. Um, Chairman Lopes. Representative Gresco, distinguished members of the Environment Committee. My name is Jude Malone. I'm with the Connecticut Beer Wholesalers Association, and we're here today to support Senate Bill 895 um, and our concerning deposit initiator accounts and carbonated beverages. Um, we so appreciate this committee's willingness to work with us as we establish a mechanism, <clears throat> excuse me, available for deposit initiators to prepare for a transition from five to 10 cents coming January 1st. And we also appreciate the clarification in section one on carbonated beverages. And in section two, um, I would like to uh, surround my remarks with uh, Tom Scalin from Pepsi-Cola in that in, in addition to a dealer's inventory, it'd be so helpful to have a distributor's warehouse covered under this section as well. And I think he made such a valid point. So um, we look forward to working with the Environment Committee. We really appreciate um, your assistance and um, thank you for your time. No problem, your efforts are appreciated. Any questions mm, thank from you. the committee? Seeing none, thank you and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Senator. No problem. Um, I think I have Nicole Paquette. Good afternoon, Senator Lopes, Representative Gresco, Representative Palm, Senator Harding, Representative Callahan, and the distinguished members of the Environment Committee. My name is Nicole Paquette. I'm a licensed funeral director, embalmer, and the legislative chair of the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association, CFDA. We are one of the oldest and nationally recognized associations of funeral homes in the country with over 220 member funeral homes. Thank you for raising House Bill 6485, an act concerning natural organic reduction and green burials. CFDA submits this testimony in support of this bill, which in plain terms seeks land for the use of green burials and the composting of dead human remains as a type of disposition. Human composting was first performed in Seattle, Washington in December of 2020. The process has become legal in five additional states, just recently, New York. 
The process includes placement of unembalmed remains in a vessel with organic matter to speed the decomposition process, resulting in a soil or mulch of about one cubic yard. CFDA member firms strive to continue to provide a range of funeral service options to our client families, particularly as their needs evolve. We are encouraged by the regulatory provisions included within section two of the bill, but we view them as incomplete. Our organization recommends that a natural organic reduction facility be licensed as such, subject to annual renewals and inspections by the Department of Public Health. Furthermore, we would see the use of and definition of cemetery corporation redacted and include cemeteries, crematories, and funeral homes as entities that may own and operate a natural organic reduction facility. We understand that the functioning natural organic reduction facilities in Washington state are operated by funeral homes and that the governor of New York has moved to include funeral homes in their new legislation that passed recently. CFDA also recommends that an inquiry into the cause and manner of death should be conducted by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. A natural organic reduction certificate should be completed by such office and a waiting period of 48 hours after death should be mandated. We will defer to the Department of Public Health for the suitability of composting the human remains of those with a reportable disease found on the annual list of the state epidemiologist. With additional regulatory and language provisions that will permit this bill to be more appropriate for Connecticut and in line with existing statutes, including disposition, CFDA kindly requests to work with the Environment Committee as you continue to draft this legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I make myself available to answer any questions. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Did you submit um, testimony? electronically or written yes okay uh representative palm uh thank you very much for being here um is there a discussion among your members currently about the possible addition of this as an option for families um there is much discussion among our members and um certainly th there's not a lot of consumer demand for human composting at this time, but certainly we as funeral directors are charged with the, you know, with the necessity to serve our members. Um, so this is, you know, based on that discussion that we have that if it's not now, it would likely be in the future of Connecticut and that we certainly have to address this issue. Yes, as a disposition twice. Thank you. And would you just clarify as, uh, something you said, I didn't quite catch it. It was about, uh, I. I believe the death certificate or some paperwork that the person should uh, submit upon requesting this process. Right. So we would we would uh, like to have these deaths that for people who will be selecting human composting referred to the state medical examiner's office uh, that an investigation be conducted. This is similar to the process when a person is cremated. The deaths are referred uh, to the medical examiner's office. A certificate is issued um, for permission to proceed like with cremation and there's a mandatory 48 hour waiting period. So we would seek that same process for people who would be uh, selecting human composting. So it's, a, it's not a stricter process. It's the same as what we currently uh, require for cremation. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I'm going to try for a Doug Bedard. Good afternoon. Okay, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, co-chairs Lopes and Cresco and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Doug Bedard, and I'm a lifelong Connecticut resident, and I lead our Coca-Cola operations here in Connecticut. We operate four facilities in Connecticut, Naugatuck, East Hartford, South Windsor and Waterford. We provide around 740 jobs to Connecticut residents. These are good paying jobs, the majority of them union with excellent benefits for hardworking people and families. Additionally, in the past several years, we have invested approximately $70 million in facility upgrades, including upgrading our manufacturing in East Hartford, 
and building a brand new sales and distribution center in South Windsor. We are local. We've been here producing since 1912 in Connecticut. We're proud to be part of the communities that we serve and support here in our great state. I'm here today along with my industry colleague, Tom Straley from Pepsi, who testified earlier to talk about raised bill 895, which seeks to clarify some labeling definitions and requirements for the state's bottle bill. The beverage industry is currently working hard to implement the broad-based changes implemented in the bottle bill passage in Public Act 2158, which as we know, expanded the scope of containers subject to deposit implemented for the soda industry, a 75% increase in the handling fee, and will increase the deposit to 10 cents about 11 months from now. One important way we are managing the anticipated 300% increase in costs is the former stewardship organization on behalf of the industry, centralizing and coordinating the management of our redemption system to improve its overall effectiveness. I would add that I have volunteered to serve as treasurer of that organization and look forward to its approval by DEEP. The key amendments we would like to recommend are in section two of the bill, and we propose the effective passage immediately. And our industry would like to codify the bottle bill issue that was the bottle bill order that was issued by DEEP in August of last year that would allow the refund value on the container to read abbreviation of CTRV, as well as the words redemption value. This would simplify the compliance and consolidates labeling options for all the manufacturers in the statute. We would also like to clarify the labeling exemptions in the language as spoken earlier by previous folks. And we would uh, like to make sure that the distributors inventory is included along with the retailers inventory as there is no risk to the consumer the way the reverse vending machines operate via UPC code. So therefore we are asking for the distributor inventory to be added to the language upon change over from five cents to 10 cents and also currently um, with the expansion of items. And finally, the unprecedented increase in the cost of the system, we are supportive of any measure to give us more of the unclaimed deposits. So in addition to what's shown in 895, that would literally just cover a fraction of those incremental expenses that we have. So we would ask to support additional language for a comprehensive solution to advocate for an accelerated and complete transfer of the unclaimed deposits to offset the system costs. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you for your time. And I have also submitted written testimony as well. Thank you very much. Um, and I assume you've submitted written testimony, right? Because I get yes, late. Yes, we have. tend to forget I... some things. No problem. Um, Representative Mishinsky. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask you, uh, what happens to the independent redemption centers that we in the legislature have fought so hard to keep going, even when the redemption fee was not high enough for them to survive. They hung in there. They played an important role. And um, does DEEP Correct. plan to include them in your system of redemption? That is absolutely the intent, contrary to what might have heard earlier today. And, and quite frankly, we are trying to model a system similar to the state of Oregon and include all current independent redemption centers in the PRO or the supplier run organization. Okay, well, they're, they don't think that. And so maybe there has to be some kind of um, contract or something that we can see to see who's telling the truth here. I would agree. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, concerns? No, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, last person on page two, uh, Joanne uh, Basile. I know I see here, you have to unmute. That's it. Thank you. Um, Co-chairs and honorable members of the Environment Committee, I am Joanne Basile, Executive Director of Connecticut Votes for Animals, a Connecticut-based grassroots animal advocacy organization. I'm here today to testify in support of SB 53, requiring veterinarians to report cases of animal abuse. Mandatory reporting of suspected animal cruelty is an important component to Connecticut's effort to address animal cruelty. For years, science has been clear about the well-established link between animal cruelty and other forms of violence. Connecticut has already taken a major step 
aimed at protecting children and combating cruelty to animals in its cross-reporting law. In a 2020 report to the legislature, DCF reported an increase in animal abuse cases from 69 in 2019 to 120 in 2020. CBA believes it's crucial that the law empower veterinarians to report suspected animal cruelty when they encounter signs of abuse in their practice. Not only are veterinarians often the only witness to animal abuse, but they are uniquely qualified to identify the signs of cruelty. Presently, Connecticut is one of only 13 states throughout the country which has no reporting requirement. In contrast, more and more states have added laws on mandatory reporting, not only for the sake of the animals, but also because of the link between animal cruelty and other forms of violence. Because veterinarians are a critical partner in identifying cruelty, they must have protection or civil and criminal immu excuse me, immunity for veterinarians reporting in good faith. While CVA strongly supports SB 53, we asked the committee to make the reporting mandatory regardless of the nature of the cruelty. Establishing two tiers for reporting is cumbersome, requires too much speculation and may result in no reporting taking place. In closing, let me share a few points from the National Link Coalition that illustrate the need for mandatory veterinary reporting. One survey of veterinarians estimate that practitioners receive 5.6 cases of animal abuse per thousand patients. In another survey of all North American veterinary schools, 97% of the school administrators reported that they believe practitioners will encounter serious animal abuse during their careers. Tufts University, their School of, Med of Veterinary Medicine reported over 93% of respondents in the study believed they um, believed they had an ethical responsibility to report suspected animal abuse. There are laws in every state that require mandatory reporting of child abuse by teachers, physicians, social workers, and sometimes even veterinarians. Given the link between child abuse and cruelty to animals, we should expect nothing less than a similar requirement for animals by those best qualified to see and recognize the signs of abuse. Uh, thank you. And just as a side note, I would like you to know that CVA supports the Veterinarians Association regarding uh, recommendation regarding anonymity for aggregated cruelty reporting. Those cases may include animal fighting, which is frequently associated with other violent crimes, and safety for the reporter should be paramount. Thank you, Joe. Joanne. Um, any questions? Seeing none in the room, seeing none on... Oh, I do. Uh, Representative Michelle, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I was having problems. Um, thank you for testifying, uh, Ms. Bezil. Uh, I was just wanted to know, um, would um, the reporting diminish people taking animals to the vet? Just We obviously are always concerned about that as, as a possibility, but I will tell you, there are 37 states in this country that require reporting. Uh, Connecticut is one of only 13 that do not. 37 states have figured out how to do this correctly. They find there to be a, um, a good correlation between the reporting and the betterment of both uh, the animal and also in the instances of other abuse in, in, the, in the household. Uh, so we believe that Connecticut's smart enough to be able to do this right. Thank you, uh, Joanne. Thank you for testifying uh, as, as always. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Um, Haley Morris, followed by Karina Adams-Zabo. Co-chair Gresco, co-chair Lopez, vice chairs, ranking members, and distinguished members of the Joint Environmental Committee, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of HB 6485. My name is Haley Morris, and I'm with Earth Funeral Group, a provider of natural organic reduction in Washington state. Natural organic reduction is the most environmentally friendly death care option. It is less resource intensive than any other option. It reduces carb CO2 emissions by nearly 90% relative to traditional options. And natural organic reduction enables our last act to be one of ecological connection and beauty. Earth is a licensed funeral home in Washington state, but our model is one of partnership. In addition to offering the service ourselves, we also collaborate with existing funeral homes, and that's our vision for Connecticut as well. 
We do not support any language or regulation that would be anti-competitive. We want to see this industry succeed and scale so it can become a mainstream option as a sustainable alternative to traditional burial and cremation. Our only ask is that the legislation allow a path for new providers like Earth to be able to operate in Connecticut. Ultimately, we believe that this is a question of consumer choice. It won't be the right choice for everyone, but I believe it should be available to everyone who wants it. In a time of climate anxiety, consumers are looking for greener death care options. In a recent survey by the National Funeral Directors Alliance, they found that more than 60% of Americans are looking for a green death care option. For many people, the sense of environmental and spiritual connection brings a bit of solace and peace into what can be a very difficult time. Earth Funeral works with families and individuals from all kinds of backgrounds and religious traditions who are navigating loss and grief at some of the most challenging points in their life. The one common refrain we hear from people who choose natural organic reduction is gratitude for this option. For some, it's about returning to nature. For others, it's about minimizing their impact on the planet or continuing a circle of life and giving back to the planet through their last act. And I just want to read a, a few words from some of our clients. I think others have testified to the environmental uh, benefits of, of natural organic reduction, but I wanted to offer um, direct from, from some of the families that we've worked with. Um, one client said, I love this decision. It will be in the interest of those I leave behind and taking care of our earth for future generations. Someone else said, when I heard that earth was a totally different alternative and one that is the best choice for our environment, I knew immediately it was what I was searching for. I felt nothing but peace knowing that I have chosen the right path for myself and at the same time, helping our earth continue sur to survive for future generations. Someone else who made pre-arrangements with us said- Haley, this, yes, uh, your time, the timer was up. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll, uh, I'll no, leave it at that and, and just say that, you know, this, this option brings uh, people a lot of solace. So happy to answer any questions. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, <laughs> Representative Davinsky, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try to make it brief. Uh, thank you for coming in. I just have some logistical questions that I have not yet heard the answers to. Um, when you, when somebody brings a body, uh, you, you, you actually do this composting, right? We are a natural organic reduction provider. That's right. And I'm happy to set up a meeting with you to go over exactly what our process is, if that's helpful. Okay. Well, I, so when somebody when somebody brings a body to you, um, when it's, when it's fully composted, like if I brought somebody to you, what would I get back? Uh, so you have a couple options. What you're, once the, once the body has, has naturally decomposed into soil, um, families, the way our, our model works, families receive a portion of the soil in sort of a, in what looks like an urn, the same that would kind of hold cremains and that's sent back to them and they can choose to, you know, honor their loved one in whatever way or tradition that feels right to them. Um, we often see people planting memorial gardens or scattering on private land on their land. Earth also has bought private land on the Olympic Peninsula and we've created that uh, conservation easement there. And so okay, what many getting, families do getting, is uh, you're getting away from my question. I just want to know what do I physically what what is returned? You get back soil. And so families donate a portion of that soil How back much? to us. It depends on what you're that's what I was trying to get at. So, so fam, you can get out a small amount or you can get a large amount. Most well, if families I want the whole body back. What what is it? It's a cubic yard. A cubic yard. So that's three feet by three feet by three feet. How much does it weigh? It's about 200 to 300 pounds of soil. Okay. So I get back a lot more than I brought to you. Uh, depending on the body type of the person. Yes. Okay. Um, and what, what in, in your state, what can I legally do with that? 250 pounds of soil. So what most people are doing is scattering it or donating it back to earth. And we use it for uh, forest restoration projects, soil restoration projects, 
we have this conservation land where people have rededicated this soil to be used, or they're using it for memorial gardens, they're using it on their own, they're scattering on their own private land. Um, wildfires are a big problem in Washington state, and we have families who are using the soil to have uh, ecological restoration projects post wildfire on their private land. Is it tested for contaminants? Yes, of course. So the way that this has been working in other states is that, uh, you know, the Department of Public Health sets a number of standards for um, for the soil, and we test it with using third-party labs and then provide reports on that testing to make sure that we're meeting the appropriate standards. What do you test it for? Um, there's a whole list that, you know, I, I could go over. Um, I can send it, you know, I can follow up or put it in my testimony after this. Give, give me a, a summary. Medicines, lead, mercury, what? What do you yeah, test that's for? yes. All of those? Yes. Okay. And what happens if one of the one of the uh the 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 piles of soil turns up to have some type of contaminant in it? We haven't run into that that issue at Earth. Okay, but you test each one? Um we test, it depends on the nature of the regulation. Sometimes it's, but we're capable of testing every single one. Okay. So which ones do you test? Um, again, it depends on the regulation, but we're, you know, we can test a sample from whatever is regulated. Sometimes it's the first 20, sometimes it is beyond that, but we've developed, I mean, the earth has invested a lot in the in developing proprietary technology to do this in a way that is um, highly technically engineered. Okay, engineered to get rid of contaminants. Um, to to break down the body through a natural process and ensure that the soil is a uh, healthy, nutrient dense soil that is not going to be any kind of pollutant. Okay. Uh, I I mean, I don't know not, if you're familiar, like you're, but you're the trying pH to dance of around my question. My question is specifically about contaminants in a body. And I'm just asking you if you test for it and if your process removes the contaminants. And uh, the answer is yes, we test for it. We have third party labs that can that validate that testing. Okay. And and but you're saying you can test for it, but do you test for it? Yes, we do. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Palm. Thank you. Uh, you said you're from Oregon, correct? Uh, no, we're, we're based in Washington State. Washington, I'm sorry. Um, do you have any idea how long it took the legislature out there to get this uh, legislation through? I... I actually don't off the top of my head. I know that they were incredibly conscientious about the process and did a lot of due diligence with soil experts at the University of Washington. Um, and we've been operating as an industry there quite successfully without problems since it since it was legalized. Um, and that bill has become the model and precedent in other states. Yes, thanks. I mean, I, I am very favorably um, looking favorably on this bill. I'm just trying to get a sense of I know that six states have have legalized it. I'm wondering how long it has taken uh, that to happen. But if you don't know, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming before us. Sure. Sorry, trying to wrap up my extension cord. Any other questions? Oh, yes, uh, Representative Dencho. Hi, thank you uh, for coming tonight. I just have a quick question to follow up on uh, Representative Dubitsky's. Uh, question. Have you ever had a client come to you to go through the uh, decomposition process and perhaps you've declined their request? Which would be a case where you would say no to someone that this isn't going to be for you? There are a couple cases where we would um, potentially decline. Um, one would be if uh, someone was embalmed. Um, we can't accept any bodies that were embalmed. 
Um, we also can't accept anybody who has a radioactive implant or who died as a result of a radio uh, radiological incident or accident. Um, and then there are a few diseases, um, prion disease infection, uh, tuberculosis, and Ebola are, are some of the examples we wouldn't be able to accept. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Sure. Thank you very much. No problem. I think we're going to go to someone who is, help me out, um, uh, Jonah Lepar. Yeah, that's uh, that's me. All righty, please proceed. You have three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Jonah Lepar, and I'm a high school student in Simsbury, Connecticut. Today, I would like to testify in favor of two bills. First, I'd like to speak in support of HB 6482, an act authorizing bonding for bikeways, greenways, and recreational trails. The creation and expansion of new trail systems that would result from this bill being passed would have many benefits, including for public health and the environment. In terms of health, a study from the National Library of Medicine reports that countries with higher rates of cycling and walking, which would be made more accessible with an increase in available trails, lower obesity rates and better cardiovascular health, resulting in lower cancer and diabetes rates and better health in general. A different study from the National Library of Medicine reports that cycling or walking regularly has positive benefits on the mental health of those studied because both of the natural mood boosts that come with exercise and the opportunity for social interaction along trails. In terms of the environment, there's the obvious benefit that there are no greenhouse gas emissions from walking or biking. Bike trails also take up much less space than roads and are much quieter resulting in a greatly reduced amount of ecological disturbance. Next, I'd like to speak in support of raised bill number 6483, an act concerning the open space and watershed land acquisition program. This would provide funding for the use of state bonds for the program, which allows municipalities and land trusts to apply for grants to fund land acquisition. According to the Department of Environmental Protection website, there are 115 land trusts in Connecticut with more than 39,000 members, which preserve over 62,000 of acres of land. Municipalities also conserve many acres of land in the state, and the town I live in has many of these parks. These preserves provide opportunities for outdoor recreation, which has the benefits that I described before, as well as protecting valuable habitat, cultural and historic resources, and public health and security through their pure purification of air and water. I volunteer at the Simsbury Land Trust in the summer, and I regularly hike the trails, which has given me many opportunities to enjoy nature. Simsbury has many preserves, but could still benefit from this bill, along with many towns that have smaller land trusts through amounts of municipal open space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for our high school member from Simsbury, Mr. Gresco? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jonah, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. That was Thank it. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Short, maybe sweet. Um, no other questions. Yes, See? Oh, yes. Representative Paul. Quickly. Um, Jonah, thank you. I just want to thank you very much for, for testifying on this bill. I would love to have you get some of your friends to testify. We need to hear from more young people. And the Greenway bill would raise it by $3 million. Do you think that's enough? Would you like to see it be more? I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know too much about the specifics of how much the okay. certain projects would cost. That's all right. Okay. Thanks again for being with us. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, we are going to move on to Eileen Grant, according to Joe. I don't see her on the, oh, I do see her, but not moved in. Ms. Grant? All right, I'll skip over her for now. Susan Messino? Yes, good afternoon. Um, unless I hear someone yelling, I'm going to assume you can hear me. We can uh, hear you. Is, thank you. Uh, thank you to the committee and the chair for being here. Um, I'm a professor at Trinity College, and I'm also a member of the Science and Technology Working Group for the GC3. I was the co-chair of the Phase 1 report, and I'm also a legislative liaison for the Connecticut State Grange. I have some other hats I won't mention. 
Um, I don't want to forget to say that I didn't submit written testimony yet, but I assume I still can. Um, I wanted to mention that hydrogen is explosive, so it's not a good solution for helium. And um, I wanted to appreciate the comment about the ancient mariners for horseshoe crabs. I'm here today to talk about um, kind of open space and forest bills. Forests are also ancient ecosystems that evolved before dinosaurs and like the crabs, horseshoe crabs, they've survived ice ages, et cetera. Um, the bills that I'm in support of that'll be in my testimony um, are really practical and beneficial for ecology and health. They reflect interdisciplinary science and they really promote community-based solutions, which were, were really some of the fundamental pillars of the Science and Technology Working Group report based on translating international science to what we need to do in Connecticut while recognizing that Connecticut is really special and different parts of the state are different and have different needs. Um, and this kind of real kind of uh, approach for common solutions to problems um, is reflected in the term multi-solving, which is finding um, solutions that help us now and also protect the climate long-term. Um, so I want to mention um, SB 122, the replanting of trees, and just echo the points that replanting is needed in some areas, and some areas are very bereft of trees and suffer the consequences of a lack of trees, but we really need to try and protect the trees that we have wherever possible, particularly healthy native trees. Um, burying wires and stopping this wholesale clearing is really imperative because the ecosystem services of our um, large and native trees in particular and groups of trees can't be replaced by replanting trees for multiple reasons. Um, I'm going to submit links to an information sheet on roadside trees and also on old forests that um, reflect some of the science related to this. Um, and in addition to the points that others made on climate, biodiversity, health, etc., cetera, um, this kind of strafing, clear-cutting vegetative management is spreading invasives throughout our state. And invasives are a scourge that are damaging the ecological integrity of the ecology that we all need to survive. And there's really no plan to deal with this. And um, this is a real problem, um, is this spreading of invasives. There's also evidence that spreading of these invasive plants um, increases Susan? tick habitat. So sorry, that's uh, issue. The, the buzzer went off, if you could uh, summarize. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, I also want to support SB 896, and um, I'll provide additional rationale in my written comments. And um, thank you very much for your attention. No problem. Any questions? Uh, Representative Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very quick. I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Susan Messino for uh, testifying today and for her um, advocacy on uh, all things linked to uh, nature and as well biodiversity. Thank you very much for coming to testify today. I also saw um, the clear cutting of some, uh, some, some native species uh, that uh, really did bring um, invasive species instead. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, next. Uh, Scott Smith. Good afternoon, uh, co-chairs Lopes and Gresco and members of the Environment Committee. I'm Scott Smith, the Communications Director for Friends of Animals, and I'm speaking today in support of HB 6481. Although helium-filled balloons, uh, balloon launches have long been used for celebrations, they lose their innocence when their hazardous remnants litter Long Island Sound, killing sea turtles, whales, and other animals who mistake them for food. Young seabirds suffer too when entangled in the curling ribbons attached to the balloons. Friends of Animals, an advocacy organization based in Darien, wholeheartedly supports the effort to protect sea turtles, birds, and other wildlife by tightening Connecticut's state law to prohibit the release of helium balloons into the air. Current law allows the release of up to 10 helium filled balloons per person within a 24 hour period. Almost a dozen other states have either banned balloon releases or imposed limits. I should note that HB 6481 would not stop any Connecticut resident 
or visitor from celebrating important occasions with lighter than air balloons. It would just require them to do so indoors or to take steps to prevent their release out of doors. Connecticut, Connecticut's waters are home to four species of sea turtles who often mistake deflated latex balloons for jellyfish, one of their favorite foods. When sea turtles washed up dead on shore were sent to a Connecticut aquarium for autopsies, their intestines were found to be clogged with latex balloons. And you've heard earlier today, helium balloons also harm other marine uh, life, such as whales whose intestines have been found fatally blocked by mylar. Besides antagonizing boat owners on Long Island Sound when deflated balloons get caught in their engine intakes, all release balloons, including mylar and those erroneously marked as, quote, biodegradable latex, unquote, end quote, eventually return to Earth. They're found stuck in trees, polluting waterways, or lying on the ground as litter. And that's when they become party poopers, uh, lethally so. Latex balloons may also uh, may, may, uh, represent only a, a fraction of the plastic debris floating in our waterways, but they're an easily controlled source of pollution. We know that removing them from the skies and resulting waterways will go a long way toward protecting sea turtles, seals, whales, birds, and other marine animals. We urge you to pass legislation to prohibit the intentional release of helium balloons. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your patience and sticking it out with us and appreciate your testimony. And as always, I applaud your patience and stamina. So hey, good evening. I think practice makes perfect. I do see, um, um, I lost her. Eileen Grant, you're in the room now, if you could get on. I think you're still muted. I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, you can hear me now, yes? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Eileen Grant. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding Bill number 5009 on behalf of the Friends of Connecticut State Parks. The bill concerns an establishment of public safety capacities in each Connecticut State Park and Forest. Public capacity limits already exist for the majority of state parks, including those parks with for and forests with water bodies. Capacity limits periodically updated are tied to the number of cars which will fill predetermined designated parking lots. The rule of thumb for estimating the number of probable patrons is to assume a generous four persons per car. In my written testimony, I will outline parks efficient system in place to notify the public immediately of closures once these capacity limits are reached. Capacity guidelines are followed by all individual park staffs within facilities, but activities outside the gates on local and state roadways and on municipal or private properties are not under their control, nor should they be. The tiny statewide fill staff of 70 full-time workers, assisted by young seasonals present at most three to four months per year, is already overwhelmed by the responsibilities of care for 17.4 million annual visitors, 255,000 acres and over 400 buildings. That's a ratio of one full-time worker to every 248,000 visitors. Any rational person could understand that ratio was totally unreasonable. Despite persistent and very loud public pleas year after year to executive and legislative budget makers for desperately needed personnel, numbers of workers in the field have declined precipitously. Parks have a third of the personnel that they had 40 years ago and almost triple the visitors. If the push for enhanced public safety in this legislation is sincere, the focus should be on substantive recruitment and funding of park staff, not on traffic problems local authorities can certainly address reluctant as they may be to do so. Many new visitors in large number have flowed to parks and forests as respite from pandemic isolation and as consequence too of the Passport to Parks program's elimination of entrance fees for all Connecticut citizens. Free park entry has been a boon to citizens of every generation. Millions have discovered and rediscovered the stunning landscapes proximate to their own backyards and will continue to visit in droves in all seasons. The Friends of Connecticut State Parks are happy for the universal appreciation and utilization of state recreational opportunities. That is what was meant to happen when these public places I mean, were- 
buzzer went off, here, please summarize. Okay. Timer's over. Um, it's challenging to be pop this popular, but a quarter of a million acres is a lot of place to roam. It's not the number of patrons present in the parks that is the true problem. It is the number of workers who are not. Uh, thank you, for, um, and I'll entertain any questions that you'd like to ask. No problem. Representative Callahan, please proceed. <clears throat> thank you, ma'am, for testifying. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, ma'am, I read your written testimony thoroughly, and I appreciate you actually taking the time uh, to uh, state your opinion. And the bill itself, uh, as, as written, is to deal with the overflow of walk-ins that, that are coming to the state parks after the parking capacity is full, which is causing a public safety issue for the towns, not DEP, outside of the park. So it wouldn't be asking... It wouldn't be asking DEP staff to handle handle issues outside of the park. It's only asking DEP to recognize that there are issues that take place on our on the state roads outside of the parks when they've reached their parking capacity but have done nothing to handle the uh, people that are parking in the vicinity of of the state parks. Sorry to say the word park so many times, but uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I appreciate your testimony. But in your testimony, you do you 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 actually. Uh, uh, state several, several of the reasons that uh, the bill was actually uh, proposed because of uh, DEP not being able to limit walk-ins because uh, it had to be done legislatively. So uh, anyway, just, I, I wanted to uh, ask you if you had anything to add after I've, uh, after my soliloquy. Oh, well, I, you know, I, I certainly understand um, how troublesome it is to have a uh, traffic uh, issues outside of a park. I uh, live a mile from the entranceway of, of Hammond Asset State Park, and I've lived in Madison for 30 years. Uh, as I'm sure everybody knows, Hammond Asset is the most visited park in the state. There are 3 million visitors per annum, and uh, the town of Madison um, is pretty close to you in population. There are um, 18,000 people in Madison, and I think you said that you had 14,000. So this is a problem that, you know, Madison has to uh, had has had to deal with for many, many years. Hammond Asset um, came online in 1920. And I have to say that our town has done a really great job, um, particularly in this last year in dealing with um, the increased pandemic numbers to um, address these problems on the road, on the road. You know, there's, not only are there lighted signs on the highway, but there are lighted signs in um, the in our neighborhoods, and uh, you know, warning pe people um, that the park's closed, and you know, to go on to other other parks. And our local patrolmen um, uh, patrol all the all the streets, and you know, they actually I have been tossed off uh, the street in front of my own home because, you know, they said, you know, there's no, there's no, no parking in the neighborhood and that's in, in the neighborhoods and that sort of thing. So it takes a lot of effort uh, right. and a little bit of creativity to do it, but a town, um, uh, a town can do it. Uh, thank you. Yeah. We, we've been trying for uh, two decades and it's, it's, it hasn't been very successful, but I do appreciate uh, you, taking the time to address the committee today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. You're welcome. Uh, getting, getting close, Laura Copeland, I think. Hi, yes. Thank you, please uh, My name is Laura Copeland. Uh, that's for the record, it's C-O-P-L-A-N-D. There's no E in Copeland. I live in Ivoryton and I wanna thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to uh, to testify in support of the Organic Reduction Bill 6485. We all know ashes to ashes and dust to dust, but not embalming fluid to embalming fluid. This is a sensible bill that allows for a less expensive alternative for grieving families and certified funeral directors to honor the dead without spewing toxic fumes in the air or spreading toxic chemicals in the ground. This is a reasonable bill. It does not require green burial, but it makes it legal for families 
to choose organic reduction above ground. It will free acres and acres of otherwise usable land for housing and gardens and for businesses. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust, but not formaldehyde to formaldehyde. This choice helps keep the earth greener and cleaner. I ask you to please support the Organic Reduction Bill 6485. And I want to thank you for your hard work in helping to make Connecticut a really great place to live. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a private citizen, by the way. I don't speak for any um, organization. All is welcome. Any questions? Quick comment. Uh, Representative Paul. Ms. Copeland, thank you very much for joining us and for your thoughtful uh, testimony. Um, if you were able to take part of this program, of this facility, um, if you thought that far ahead, what would you do with um, the compost or the, or the soil? What do, you, what do you think people might be inclined to do with it? Well, people might be inclined to make a memorial burial in their ground, in their, in their property. Um, I, I think that this bill actually honors the dead by making it their legacy to help sustain and support the earth. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I would scatter it. Um, we scatter uh, the remains from the cremation into the ocean and into parkways and, and, and um, uh, gardens. Um, and that's what I would do personally. I would scatter it um, to support my my um, my natural um, pollinator garden. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? See, not seeing anything. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. My pleasure. Last person on our list, Barry um, Takalu. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Yes. Good afternoon, Senator Lopez, Representative Grasco. Uh, Senator Harding, Representative Callahan, and other distinguished members of the Environmental Committee. I'm here today to say that while I support EPR for tires, I'm opposed uh, to House Bill 6486. My name is Barry Takalu, and I am the president and CEO of CRM, com CRM Company. We have six tire recycling operations in the United States, including Plainfield, Connecticut, and two tire recycling facilities in Canada. We recycle over 30 million tires into value-added products, such as rubber-modified asphalt and rubber-molded products. I established CRM company 25 years ago after I finished my PhD in rubber-modified asphalt. While we support EPR for tires, we think this legislation as currently written needs to be revised substantially. One major concern we have is that the system that is proposed in House Bill 6486 is not an EPR program. We believe the legislation from last year is a model that more accurately reflects an extended producer responsibility program for tires. CRM company supports a sustainable and circular closed loop recycling system for Connecticut to manage its scrap tires. And this bill will not achieve that goal. Another reason that we do not support this legislation is because this does not address the problem of illegal dumping of tires in communities across Connecticut. We believe a better program would, uh, would be an incentive-based system of promoting the use of recycled scrap tires into value-added products such as rubber-modified asphalt and rubber-molded products. CRM company wants to work with legislature, deep municipalities, industry, and, and other parties to help ensure an EPR program for tires is properly set up, implemented, and implemented to ensure that all participants in the program are part of the solution. We have over 10 years of experience as a tire recycler in Canada. And our, we find out as long as an, 
entire EPR program is properly set up, it can achieve your goals and achieve scrap tire problems in, in the state of Connecticut. Hi, Barry. Yes. Okay, the uh, the timer went off. Yeah. Thank I, you again but, for your opportunity to provide uh, testimony at this proposed legislation. Any questions? Thank you very much. I remember when you when you met with us earlier, it feels like 100 years ago, but I think it was last month. <laughs> but uh, we have a question from Representative Gresco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Barry, you recycle your end of life tires now at your facility in Plainfield into what specifically? We right, we took over took over this facility in in May of 2022, and right now the tires are being recycled and is being. Uh, is, is, is being, once it's shredded, is being transferred to our New York facility and is being recycled to value added products like chrome rubber going to rubber as asphalt and rubber molded products. And some of them also go for a, a chrome rubber infill for artificial turf. So there are, in your opinion, obviously, because it's your business model, end of life uses for these tires um, right now. So the, the market exists right now may, the market may not exist exist uh, right now in connecticut but in northeast yes so um can you can you help the state of connecticut figure this out please uh because um um i don't want to be the bad guy here uh as we move forward as far as crafting uh legislation so um, if I if I volunteered you, uh, voluntold you uh, to uh, to participate in in crafting some sort of um, legislation going forward, would that be something you'd be interested in? Definitely, definitely. I'll be I'll be happy to help out, and that's that's really my passion to find a solution for scrap tires. Well, I mean, uh, obviously, you're 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 accomplishing that goal now. I wish you could. Um, um, share that passion and 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 uh, point us in the right direction. So thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, Representative Dubinsky? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for coming in. Um, where is your facility? Plainfield, Plainfield, Connecticut. But uh, where in Plainfield? On uh, 1414 Norwich Norwich Road. On Route 12. Yes. Okay, so your your facility is in my district, um, and I, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure I know where it is. Let me ask you this: Where, what market do you sell to now? If you said that there is no market in the state, where do you sell your your uh, products? We're selling to. We do some rubber's asphalt in Massachusetts. Uh, New Hampshire. I think we did some work also in Rhode Island and uh, rubber molded products, uh, which is not in the state of Connecticut. Okay, so and, your your facility takes the tires, shreds them, takes the metal and polyester belts out of them, and uh, and then takes the rubber and shreds it. Is that what it does? Uh, yeah, well, the goal is to bring the rubber uh, tires to to the powder the size of one or two millimeter size, which that's the size it goes to rubber's asphalt. And uh, I'm a civil engineer myself, and I worked for DOTs before. Uh, I don't think Connecticut DOT, I cannot speak on their behalf, but I don't think DOTs are against asphalt rubber. Uh, um, I'm joining you from the state of California right now. The state of California has been using rubber as asphalt since 2006. And because it's most, more cost effective, uh, now a state, all of the top layers of the asphalt in, in state roads are rubber modified asphalt. So I, I think what it requires, what I mentioned, um, uh, first of all, we need to define recycling correctly. I heard a bunch of testimonies. TDF is not recycled. You know, I respect the hierarchy of the use, reuse, recycling, incineration, and landfill. 
and we cannot mix TDF and recycling together. And uh, and it, I think your best bet would be rubber is asphalt. The amount of asphalt in the state of Connecticut is is being used by by modifying about 30 to 35 percent of your asphalt consumption in Connecticut, you can pretty much recycle all of your three million tires into uh, asphalt. Again, I'm not saying that that's a major market and that's a local sustainable closed loop and it helps your roadway system as well as can recycle rubber as asphalt. Uh, now, so um, I, I obviously am not asking for any proprietary information, but do you pay people for their tires or you no. or do they pay you to take them away? They, they pay us. They pay you. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, all right. Well, I, I, I'd be glad, I, I would love to sit down offline and, and yeah, talk fine. about it because it, it sounds like you may have some information that could actually help uh, open this log jam that seems to, we seem to have had for many years. Um, thank you very much. I, I appreciate thank it. Thank you. And as a disclosure, uh, I do not own any patent on rubber modified asphalt. Everything I talk is on public domain. So I'm not pro promoting certain products. I'm just think this is a large market. It can help roadway system while we're recycling uh, our tires. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it looks like we need a scouting mission into your district. And we, we met with uh, Mr. Takalu. Yeah, we, we met with him earlier last month, and he's very not very knowledgeable in the industry. So you got to promote your local business and your district business. So let's get cracking. Any other questions? Any last people we're missing? I great. I just want to thank everyone who stuck it out, and uh, uh, you know, all this all last year, everyone kept saying we can't wait till we get back in the building. Why? I don't understand. <laughs> but uh, we got out in time early enough for me to get my 